can please, if I can please have you take your seats. Members? Well, sounds okay. Members of Council, I will now call this meeting to order. The clerk has advised that we do have quorum. Members of Council, please rise if you're able for the national anthem. Oh, Canada. Members, please remain standing and observe a moment of silence in memory of She Shadat, a First Nation with the announcement of 17 unmarked graves at the site of a former school, Amanda Bankier, Arlene Gould, Peter Harndorf, Evelyn Ken Kendall, Tony La Regina, Gordon Spooner, Margaret Meehan, Angela Panozzo, and Joe Vigona. Thank you. I would like to make uh, to take a moment on behalf of council to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to de uh, depending our own understanding of the indigenous peoples and their cultures. It is a moment to reflect on the importance of this land, which we each call home. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. For the benefit of those who are connected to the internet, the city clerk has posted all of the agenda materials for today's meeting at toronto.ca slash council. 
This meeting is being held as a hybrid meeting. Members of council, staff, and the public are participating in today's meeting remotely and in person, and the meeting is being streamed live on YouTube. I'd like to welcome the public who are with us here today and who are watching the meeting online. Members, I want to acknowledge the new anthem recording and video that started our meeting today. The anthem was performed by artist Ni Bish N. Trudeau of the Wickham He Kong unceded territory in Brunswick House First Nation near Sudbury, Ontario. The anthem is sung in English, French, and Ab Abidjewe. The anthem video features images identified as part of the Places and Spaces project and represents significant locations in every ward across the city. Members, we have a presentation this morning to place the water vessel gifted to council at the first meeting of council in November. Joining us for this presentation is our honored guest from the Mrs. August of the Credit First Nation, Elder Gary Sue. I would like to call upon Deputy Mayor McKelvey to come forward for the presentation. Good morning, everyone. It was so moving to hear this beautiful new version of National Anthem, which recognizes the International Decade for Indigenous Languages and National Indigenous Languages Day coming up this Friday. Today, I'm so pleased to share one more way we are moving forward on our path to truth, justice, and reconciliation. At our first meeting of council in November, we welcomed our elders Gary and Tina Sue who led a welcoming ceremony to start this council term off in a way that aligned with our reconciliation efforts. Afterwards, we were invited to drink the water that had been blessed during the ceremony. Thank you, Elder Gary and Firekeeper Jeff for joining us today as we mark this next step forward. The water vessel used during that welcoming ceremony is full of meaning. At first look, the vessel looks like a tarnished silver teapot in the words of Elder Gary and Tina represented the black and tarnished words given to the indigenous community. They instructed council to keep the vessel, shine it and take the blackness off so that our words in the future shine in a beautiful way. We are very grateful for this gift and we took your words to heart. Now, as you can see, this water vessel shines like new. We will place this newly polished water vessel on permanent display in council chambers. This symbolic gesture will be a constant reminder that we must fulfill the promises we make here in this chamber. It also reminds us of the actions we must take to improve the lives of Indigenous people living in what is now Toronto, as well as the ongoing work we must do to restore relationships with First Nations Inuit and Métis people. This commitment is also very personal to me. Many years ago, my great grandmother was dropped off at an orphanage in Toronto. She was an indigenous orphan and she was dropped off by a white man. We don't know where she came from and we don't have connection to her people, but I'm so very delighted that you're joining us today and that you've given us this opportunity to connect. The city, also acknowledges the importance of this work with the adoption of its reconciliation action plan last year, which will guide us through 2020 through to 2032. We know we cannot erase the tarnished words of the past, but on behalf of city council, I look forward to working together with the indigenous communities as we continue to make progress towards truth, justice and reconciliation. It's something that I'm deeply committed to, and I know that all of council is deeply committed to also. I now would like to invite Alder Gary to come forward and thank you once again for your gift.
Me no gi ji gat. Hwasa ka binj baam. Kwe nish ki baabi gum. So, it's uh, at this time that uh, uh, I welcome you uh, because it's been a long time. Uh, for it took you a long time to get here. Uh, I don't know whether uh, your car broke down or, or what, but I, as I sat here and uh, the uh, council members uh, came in and uh, started to, to, they greeted me. And uh, uh, I know in your language you say, you say, good morning. But you know, a long time ago, uh, it wasn't good morning, it was godly morning. So uh, when I heard that, every time I hear uh, uh, good morning, I, I feel that uh, spirit uh, of friendship that comes with it, that you're recognizing the Creator. And if uh, we can't do that, then we can't uh, do a lot of things. So uh, we think different, I think, sometimes. It's like uh, if you uh, put your feet upon the ground, one, two, then uh, you can find gallant, balance. If you see the way the wind blows, then you know what direction to go. If you watch a fire, dance, then, and you learn how to dance, you can dance your way through life. When you see the uh, water flowing and you put your hand inside there, then you know, and you'll always know uh, to go with the flow. There's simple teachings of the earth and they've always been there, uh, but we forgot to give a ceremony to uh, thanking uh, it as in our morning routine. And so uh, if you don't have ceremony, then you, don't, you miss out on a lot of things that uh, need to take place in your life so you can see how the Aboriginal people <coughs> actually live in a good way. So I give thanks that uh, it's because uh, when you look at the uh, the uh, the words that they said to us when uh, they gave us the uh, the silver covenant chain that uh, they said uh, we're giving you this because these links are silver and any time that you want to uh, come to us and uh, speak to us shine uh, the uh, chain so that uh, we'll remember what our ancestors said to each other. And they forgot that ceremony. They, they forgot uh, that uh, we listened to their words, but uh, they don't, uh, after a time, we can't even see the goodness of their words because they're so black. So we have to, uh, like the old treaty said, we have to shine that so that we'll remember uh, what you said to uh, our ancestors. I hope we have ancestors. It's uh, the way the world is going, it, uh, it looks like a terrible thing, but uh, we knew that it was coming. And so we always know that one thing they say, that if the world uh, can't start uh, to give thanks, then uh, there's going to be no world. And if the world that is left, the people are going to have a terrible time surviving. So let's all start to pray in a good way so that uh, all we don't care uh, what nationality and what a religion you uh, you belong to, but just to uh, pray so that uh, when we pray together, then uh, we can find solutions 
that we couldn't find before because we're not that we're thinking of solutions, we're not thinking of war. So I'm really happy to see that this uh, teapot is so shiny. <laughs> I never believed it could look so good, but uh, I'm happy that uh, you took the time to uh, shine it up and give it its glory. It's from uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, Silver Jubilee. It's a momentum of it. I guess uh, people would order them and uh, it was ordered. So it, it came to me as a purpose and I just didn't see it until one day. So uh, the thought was put inside my mind of how to use it in a good way and to do uh, the reconciliation that is badly and sorely needed in this place we call Canada. Miigwech. Thank you again, Elder Gary, for your beautiful gift and your kind words. We will honor this gift and all that it represents so that our words here in council may shine brightly for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher? Uh, I wouldn't normally do this, but I just, because it's such an important place and it was recognized as the home of the young woman who is singing the national anthem, I just have to stand to say it's Wikwemakong is the name of the unceded territory from which she comes. And I think it's very important that for these incredible places and unceded territory that we have the correct pronunciation here in city council. Thank you, speaker. Thank you. May I have a motion to confirm the minutes? Councillor Thompson. It's on, can, can you hold on please, Councillor Cole? We're just in the middle of the motion. Councillor Thompson, it's on the screen. There you go. Your mic is on. I understand. Thank yeah. you. That uh, City Council confirmed the minutes from meeting uh, three held on February 7th and 8th, uh, 2023, and special meeting four held on February 15, 2023, in the form supplied by the members. Thank you. All those in favor, show of hands. Opposed, if any, carried. <clears throat> Councillor Cole, did you have a point of order? I'd like to move that we have a uh, minute silence uh, in uh, respect of the passing of the tragic death of Gabrielle Magalhães in this council. Okay, so maybe we can do that when we come back and we'll put a... Uh, I think we'll, we should do it now. Yeah, we'll put a member's motion through. Um, so we can, we can draft up a member's motion and bring it forward. Yeah. Can't we just stand up and have a moment silence? Yes. Yeah. Okay, just a sec, Councillor Cole. I'm sorry, um, to the clerk. 
Okay. So we, Councillor Cole, we can prepare a condolence motion for two o'clock and we can do that. Moment of silence. Okay, the clerk will prepare a, a member's motion. Councillor Cole? Uh, I, given the uh, incredible impact of that uh, tragic death, I think we should at that same time invite uh, the Toronto Police Chief, the head of the TTC, and Denise Campbell to uh, make a presentation to Council to let Council know and the City know what is being done to protect the citizens of Toronto on the Toronto Transit Commission for two o'clock. Okay, we'll put that under advisement. Thank you. Members, we have a, an administrative inquiry 5.1 from Councillor Pasternak regarding an update on enforcement and implementation of the City of Toronto hate sponsored rallies policy. The city's man, uh, city manager's answer to this inquiry has been posted on the city's website. Under Council's procedure, City Council can receive or refer an administrative inquiry. May I have a motion to receive the inquiry and, and answer for information? Councillor Pasternak? Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. I will uh, move receipt with the comment that uh, problems of hate in the city are not going away. Uh, they're getting worse. And I'm going to have a private meeting with the uh, city manager to discuss his response further. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pasternak has moved receipt. All in favor, show of hands. Opposed to Benny Carey. Thank you. I will now call upon the committee chairs to introduce the reports. The chairs can speak about the reports for up to five minutes. Deputy Mayor McKelvey, you have a motion to introduce the executive committee report. Um, there you go. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, motion to that the report from meeting three of the executive committee listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Uh, I will say that on this agenda before us, the, the first two key items, the first is uh, the long-term financial outlook and the second is smart track. Uh, both of them are calling on other levels of government for their support, and I'm hopeful that Council uh, will hear that call for support and endorse it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, you have a motion to introduce the Audit Committee report. I do, and good morning, and thank you, Speaker, that the report from meeting one of the audit committee listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. I will uh, take a moment to thank the Auditor General of the committee uh, for their consideration of the agenda. Members, um, there are a number of reports on this agenda with similar structure to what we've seen before. The important theme of the audit committee is diligence in keeping track of much of the work that the Auditor General has done over the years and also looking forward to the Auditor General's work plan. But members, I will draw your attention to one particular report, which is a subject matter report, and that is Building Better Outcomes, Audit of Toronto Buildings Inspection Function. And uh, while we may or may not debate it at this council meeting, I would recommend that members take a look at it. In this time of uh, incredible construction volume in the City of Toronto, this report looks at improving the process around Toronto Building but most important, it looks at, among its aspects, of improving uh, safety and consumer protection. And so this really is a good news audit, and I thank uh, Toronto Building and all of the staff that contributed to the changes that will be going forward. I think that this report is a catalyst for better service for citizens. With that, I will thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, for allowing me the floor, and uh, the motion uh, on the agenda has been presented. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crawford, you have a motion to introduce the Civic Appointments Committee report. 
I do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting four of the Civic Appointments Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, you have a motion to introduce the Economic and Community Development Committee report. I do, Madam Chair. There it is. That the report from meeting number two of the Economic Commun and Community Development Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. And Madam Speaker, I just want to take a moment to uh, 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 ask people to have a look at, uh, at the agenda. It's nice work if you can get it. It was a quiet agenda with two items. <laughs> one of them being a rather large one that uh, uh, Councillor Fletcher has held that is the BIA budgets, which I know is, uh, is uh, uh, represents a significant amount of work for any of the councillors who have several BIA boards to sit on. But we also appointed the City of Toronto Photo Laureate. And uh, uh, if you have not already, I, I really, especially on this day when, when uh, Deputy Mayor McKelvey did her ceremony, I, I invite you to have a look at the work of uh, uh, Nadia Kwandabins, our, our new photo laureate. She is Anishinaabe and uh, a very respected photographer. And uh, we had a very enjoyable meeting, having a look at her work and meeting her. And uh, you'll have several opportunities throughout the year of, uh, of her uh, sitting as our photo laureate, a couple of years actually. But uh, do get online and have a look at Nadia's work. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the General Government Committee report. Yes, I do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting two of General Government Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Uh, I'd just like to bring your attention to two items. On the morning of our meeting, I was alerted that a major media outlet uh, in our city referred to our committee as boring. <laughs> I, I want to assure you. I, I want to assure all my colleagues that this is not because of the personnel, but because of an item that came up, emergency non-competitive contract in Clareway construction to rescue a micro tunneling boring machine. Now, I'm sure this is not the making of a blockbuster film, but I appreciate staff bringing this to our attention. Uh, this was a, a workplace mishap in which a piece of equipment uh, was, um, was damaged and unrecoverable and uh, it created a safety and health hazard to the local community. Uh, our city staff um, took over the rescue operation and the bill is, is approaching around $9 million. Now we moved a motion at committee for our legal department to do everything possible to recover these funds. Now what puzzled me is we have all of our vendors and subcontractors carry an enormous amount of insurance and that's why small vendors usually cannot bid on our, our, our city projects. This is... This... Thank Please. Councillor, Councillor Perks, you do not have the floor. Councillor and I would, I appreciate you putting a lid on it. Okay, uh, just, just one moment. Point of order, Councillor Perks. Just to continue the rousing and exciting debate we had at government management, I want to caution that if we're talking about the legal implications of liability here, we should be doing it in camera. I should, I should point out that just count, hold on, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Perks. Okay, Councillor Pastor, can you just present your report? Please? Yes, and I'm only referring to things that are in the public domain, yeah. but yeah. thank you. The Thank second you. item I'll refer councillors to is uh, item number uh, 2.11. Uh, this was the awarding of an, an engineering uh, contract for phase five of the basement flooding protection program. Uh, for uh, reasons I'm really not quite sure of, I did not have the votes at committee uh, to, to support this crucial uh, infrastructure project. Uh, Councillor Perks uh, voted against it. I canceled the vote when it looked like it was gonna fail. We've sent it here without recommendation. I bring to your attention the city's policy regarding Toronto's first resilience strategy. It references on numerous occasions the vital part of basement flooding protection as part of our Transform TO resiliency pra uh, practice. So this is uh, a crucial 
a piece of infrastructure upgrade uh, that we should be supporting at council. It's not cheap. Uh, these measures never are. And I should point out that there's a number of wards that are affected. Okay, Lose. Councillor Pasternak, just present your, your I, report. I thought I had five minutes, Madam yes, Speaker. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, go ahead. And I should point out that the loss of this contract would uh, result in 6,300 homes being susceptible to basement flooding. It hurts the wards 1, 2, 3, 8, 12, 15, 20. I hope we don't have to get into a protracted debate about it, but I hope we can release it quickly when the votes are there. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Deputy Mayor uh, McKelvey, you have a motion to introduce the Infrastructure and Environment Committee report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is that the report from meeting two of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration? And I'd just like to thank the committee works, uh, uh, the committee members for their hard work on these items uh, when it came before us, that committee. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradford, you have a motion to introduce a Planning and Housing Committee report. Thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, and good morning. I have a motion here that the report from meeting two of the Planning and Housing Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, you have a motion to introduce the Etobicoke York Committee Council report. Thank you, Speaker, that the report from meeting three of the Etobicoke York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the North York Community Council report. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The, the report from meeting three of the North York Community Council listed on the agenda for is presented for uh, consideration. I bring to your attention uh, item uh, item uh, NY thirty one thirty three point three one. This was a motion uh, passed by uh, members of North York Community Council to express our objection to the change in the ward and riding boundaries across the city of Toronto, not just North York, uh, whereby a certain, certain series of actions taken uh, by the federal electoral district's redistribution process uh, is likely to remove one ward from Toronto if there's harmonization between the ward system and of course uh, the federal government, we decide to follow suit. I just wanted to point out that this is not a Scarborough North York debate, but a citywide debate and once again, we're. We're in a discussion of losing political representation uh, in the city of Toronto, fastest growing city in the country, perhaps in North America, whereby the ability to have political representation to service our constituents is at risk. Uh, so I've held the item and I hope for uh, uh, unanimous uh, council uh, vote to make sure that Ottawa understands uh, that cutting representation in the city of Toronto hurts our residents, hurts democracy, and hurts our ability to service our residents. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Ainsley, you have a motion to introduce the Scarborough Community Council report. Good morning, everybody. I would like to move the report, the report from meeting number three of the Scarborough Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks, you have a motion to introduce the Toronto and East York Community Council report. Good morning, Speaker. I move that. The report from meeting three of the Toronto East York Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. May I have a motion to introduce a new business from uh, city officials moved by Councillor Morley. It's on the screen. Just one moment. There you go. 
Thank you, Madam Thanks. Speaker. Um, I move that new business from city officials listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. All in favor, show of hands, opposed if any, carried. Are there any uh, petitions at this time? Flipping. Yeah. Are there any declarations of interest at this time? Please indicate the item number and the nature of the interest. Remember that you must also file a written declaration of your interest with the city clerk. Uh, Councillor Cole. I declare an interest uh, in this agenda item uh, dealing with the uh, financial update and outlook. Uh, my son Josh is employed by Ernst & Young and his uh, firm uh, uh, was responsible for this report. So I declare an interest on this. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Oh, that's because there's no health items. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Um, nine, ten, okay. Uh, I will now call for petitions. Are there any petitions at this time? Okay. Members, I will now review the order paper. Once the order paper has been approved by council, any change will need a two-thirds vote. We have three deferred items before us today. Item DM 5.1 CC 2.19 from December 14, 2022. DM 5.2 CC 3.1 from February 7, 2023. DM 5.3 CC 3.4 from February 7, 2023. The mayor, the deputy mayor has designated item EX 3.2 on 2023 financial update and outlook as, is, uh, as the first key matter. And this will be our first item of business today. The deputy mayor has also designated item EX 3.9 on smart track stations program as the second key matter in our second item of business. The notice of motion run through is scheduled for 2 p.m. 2 p.m. tomorrow only if the key matters are completed. Members, I propose the following related matters be considered together. Item DM 5.2 and CC 5.6 related to housing rights. The city clerk has noted the items that members wish to hold and I will now go through the items to take addition, additional member holds. I will review the order paper one section at a time. The clerk will open the speakers list in CMP and you can place your name on the list. When I recognize you, state the item or items you wish to hold and I will go through the agenda one section at a time. Okay, on the deferred items. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Mantis. Madam Chair, I have it for the for uh, IE 2.4, but I can wait until we reach that. Uh, yeah, we're session. just going through the deferred items at this point. Mm -hmm. Councillor Fletcher, defer. Uh, the, Yeah, he's, it's, it's not before us. He says you'll wait until we get to that section. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fletcher. 
Right, thank you. So we'll, the staff will reach out to them. Okay, just one sec, please. Councillor Fletcher. Thank you so much, Speaker. I am holding both DM5 and the CC, I think it's 0.5, which is the Housing Commissioner. I was going to move that they be done together, but I'm going to ask that we do them together when we get to the report from the City Manager on the Housing Commissioner, please. Thank okay. you. And Thank secondly, you. Um, I'll just alert you that on DM5.3, which was deferred from the last meeting, which is the claim to recover damages from the Toronto Police Service Data Centre. We didn't have time to go in camera last time, so whenever we're going to go in camera on any items, I would like to have that done in camera, please, Speaker. DM 5.3. Thank you. Are we good? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, Councillor Fletcher, um, I did indicate that we were going to um, deal with um, DM 5.2 and CC 5.6 together. I, I did say that. With, when we get to CC 5.6, they're combined for that item. Right. Yes. Okay, thank you. Not the other way around. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Executive Committee. Oh, Councillor Pastern. Okay. Councillor Crisanti, did you have which? We're on executive. Okay, on executive committee. Councillor Holiday. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Really, it's only an advisory. Um, further to Councillor Cole's comments regarding security, um, EX 3.13 considers transit and transit safety. I wondered if we could have TTC and Toronto Police available, as well as other staff that Councillor Cole mentioned, uh, available for questions on that matter. I just wanted to give the heads up because they are um, extended city staff. Yeah, they're related, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Fletcher? I am holding EX 3.13, and I would agree with my colleague, Councillor Holliday, and perhaps Councillor Cole would want that dealt with immediately after lunch, as he'd asked for the, uh, the staff to be here. Okay, the timing comes later, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Yes. Any Anything else on Executive Committee, please put your name on the list. Okay, Audit Committee. Councillor Matlow. Uh, good morning, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold AU 1.7 getting to the root of the issues. Councillor Cole, Audit Committee. No, I'm on uh, Economic uh, Community. Okay, we're at audit right now. Okay, we'll now go to civic appointments. Economic and Community Development. Councillor Cole. To hold uh, EC 2.2 Business Improvement Areas BIA's operating budgets 2023. Uh, Councillor Fletcher has already held the item down. Oh, good. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Okay. General Government. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I can uh, I can release uh, GG two point one four, and as a point of order, uh, everything I mentioned uh, in my presentation of that report is in the public domain and on public reports that are viewable by all members of the public. And I'd like to hold GG two point two zero. Okay, just one sec. Uh, two point two zero. There's a 
there's a technical amendment, I can release it right away. Staff have asked oh, for a technical. Okay, just one sec, please, please. So you're you're holding G, uh, GG 2.20. Uh, can you please name the item, please? Uh, sure. It's proposed governance change in respect to retirement compensation arrangement for certain members of the uh, Metropolitan Toronto Police Benefit Fund. And I have been asked by staff to move a technical amendment. If the if the motion is ready, I could I could move it right now. Uh, do we have that motion? Uh, technical. If not, amendment? we'll hold it. Technical amendment. We do. Okay. So we can. It's on the screen, uh, Councillor Pasternak. Well, there it is. Okay. Can you read it? Okay, the, the men, amendment is on the screen by Councillor Pasternak. All in favor, show of hands, opposed if any, carried. Item is amended, all in favor, carried. And, and, and Madam. Yeah, J just one sec, just one sec. So you're releasing item number GG 2.14. Can you please read the item, please? Sure, that would be the emergency non-competitive contract with, uh, with Clearway Construction Limited to Rescue a micro tunneling boring machine on Old Mill Drive for assignment under the basement flooding protection program phase four, it can be released. Okay, uh, I'm I'll sorry. Continue to hold it. Perks, I'll continue to hold it then. Okay, Councillor Pasternak will continue to hold it. Infrastructure and Environment Committee. Oh, okay, sorry. Councillor Perks. That's Council right. I think we should rename it the Exciting <laughs> Committee. Um, I would like to hold uh, the exciting item, uh, GG 2.16, non-competitive contract with mid -Dome Construction Services Limited for the new streetcar tracks on Adelaide Street, wards 10 and 13. Okay, thank you. GG. We're still on GG, yes. Councillor Sachs. Okay, just one moment, Councillor Sachs. There you go. Sent in a motion yesterday on EX 3.3, and I thought that was being held. Um, can I go back there and put a hold on that, please? So 3.3, this is the amended and restated master agreement with the Canadian National Exhibition Association. Okay, so you would like to hold that item down? Y yes, please. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, and when we get to IEC, I have one there as well. Okay, um, we're still at uh, government management. Councillor Mantis. Madam Chair, I'm for, I'll wait for IEC. Okay, we're having difficulty hearing you, Councillor. Madam Chair, I'll like, I'll, I will wait until we reach IE. The items for environment for the Environment Committee. Okay. Okay, so because your name's on the... Councillor Crisanti, are you, did you have general government? You have your name on the list. Is it general government that you... Yes, uh, Speaker. Um, now I don't know if this has been held. I'd like to hold GG 2.18, non-competitive contract with Traffic Log uh, Logics Corporation. Okay, you, okay. Can, you can hold Thank that you. down. Thank you. We'll go to Infrastructure and Environment Committee at this time. Councillor Mantis. Madam Chair, I'd like to hold uh, item IE 2.4, Southwest uh, Agent Court Transportation Connection Study. I have uh, an amendment that I've already submitted to the clerk. OK. 
Okay. Councillor Holliday. Speaker, I wish to hold IE 2.7, which is College Street Bikeways Extension. Thank you. Councillor Sachs. Yes, I've submitted an amendment to IE 2.6 of the bike share rate uh, structure. Okay, I'll ask staff if they have it. Do you have the amendment for well, um, it? Sh I it should be held. So, so you will hold it? Yes, and I submitted a motion yesterday. Yeah, but you don't want to release the motion now. You want, to, when you get to the item, you want Correct. to. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Councillor Morley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I understand IE 2.6 will be held by Councillor Sachs. I also have an amendment. Um, so just wanted to flag for my colleagues to, to review before the item comes up. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Planning and housing. Councillor Perks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I would like to hold uh, PH 2.10, City Solicitor Opinion, Bill 23, More Homes Built Faster Act 2022, and Section 111 of the City of Toronto Act 2006. Thank you. Okay. Any further? Okay, we'll now go to Etobicoke York Me Council. Oh, Councillor Fletcher, did you want planning? Pardon? On the Etobicoke York Me oh, Council. Oh, okay. Thank you. So we're at Etobicoke now. Yes, I'd like to have a recorded vote on EY 3.8, Islington Avenue and Prince George Drive, Ridgeway Crescent, pedestrian crossing protection, and uh, adding uh, traffic signals, please. So you want a recorded vote on EY 3.8? Correct. Okay, uh, Count Councillor Fletcher is asking for a recorded vote. Can you? Councillor Chang, are you present in the meeting? Yes, I am. Councillor Chang, may we have your vote, please? Oh, I'm on CMP. Okay, yeah. Councillor Peruzza, in favor. Councillor Prutz, are you you are present in the meeting? Are you able to turn your camera on, Councillor Prutz, when voting, please? Speaker, the item carries. The vote is 23 to 1.
North York Community Council. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Um, Councillor Morley, sorry. Um, no problem, Madam Speaker. I had some questions of staff for item EY 3.1. Can I hold that, please? Okay, just one sec. So you would like to hold the item down? Yes, please. Can you read the item? Uh, EY 3.1. It's 20 Brow Drive, Long Branch Go Station, City Initiated Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Decision Report. Thank you. Thank you. North York Community Council. Yeah. yeah. Just want to give staff a. Scarborough Community Council. Councilor Holiday. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. Uh, you know, Councillor Fletcher pointed out we need to be examining uh, these signals. So SC 3.20, I'd just like a recorded vote. I'd like to re record myself against it. Correct. Oh, oh, yes. oh. It's okay to put traffic lights in Ward 2. Hey, hey, hey. Oh. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Oh, hold on, hold on, please. Councillor Holliday, Councillor Holliday is asking that we have a recorded vote for SC three point twenty. Recorded vote. Let's see. So traffic uh, control signals. A morning side. Yes. Councillor Crisanti, please. Councillor Bradford, Councillor Chang. <laughs> Councillor Chang, please. Are you able to use the system to vote, please? Thank you. Councillor Perks, it appears to us you have not received the vote. Could you state your vote, please? In the affirmative? Count. Councillor Perks, I'm, I'm addressing Councillor Perks, Madam Speaker. Uh, he not, has not received the vote. Could you state, state the vote, please? Thank you, in the affirmative. Councillor Perutza, are you present in the meeting? I am indeed, and I'm in, in the affirmative. Councillor Perutza, you need to turn on your video if you're gonna be voting. Councillor Perutza. My, weak, no, my, my, my signal is rather weak, and well, uh, you're going to have to trust my voice on this one. Well, so your video has to be on. The protocol is that it, you need to have your video on during a council meeting and when you're voting. I'm sorry. Okay, so that's it. Just take the vote. Does this vote count? No. The item carries, Madam Speaker, the vote is 22 to 2.
Thank you. Toronto and East York Community Council. Councillor Holliday, you want Toronto and East York as well? Thank you. Thank you, because your name is still there. Okay. Um, okay, now we'll go under, we'll go to new business. I just said that. Tor Toronto needs, Toronto needs York. Yeah, I, I did go through that. Councillor Fletcher, do you have Toronto and East York? Okay, so we went through Toronto and East York. So we'll no, now go to new business. Councillor Fletcher. Yeah, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you very much. Uh, speaker, I would like to release CC 5.3 Ombudsman Toronto report. I'll release that. Speaker, Councillor like Bravo's holding that. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Fletcher is releasing CC 5.3. Speaker? I'd no, like Councillor Bravo said yeah, she's thanks. holding that. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So, Councillor Bravo, uh, you'll be holding the item then, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cole. Yeah, like uh, okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, go ahead. Yes, Madam Speaker, I'd like to hold the CC 5.34, 500 Duplex Avenue Zoning Bylaw Amendment uh, request for direction report, Ward 8. Okay, CC 5.34, Councillor Cole, you're holding. Okay. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold CC 5.33, 1891 Eglinton Avenue East, the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment, uh, OLT hearing uh, request for direction 420. Okay, Councillor Crawford is hold, holding CC 5.33. Councillor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I have a few. Uh, CC 5.4, report on Councillor Josh Matlow's tweets criticizing city staff. CC 5.5, intergovernmental advocacy efforts on Toronto's refugee claim shelter response. CC 5.11, legal advice. Okay, and just, just one sec. I have to flip the page here. Uh, CC 511, yes? Yep, legal advice in response to provincial order requiring individual environmental assessment for new multi-use trail. Uh, CC 5.16, which is 4340 Bloor Street West, Ontario Land Tribunal Hearing, request for directions, Ward 2. And CC 5.38, 580 D, small zoning bylaw amendment application, request for direction, Ward 2. Okay, just one sec. I have to flip the page here. The 30. Um, CC 5.38. Um, excuse me, Madam Speaker, I'll just flip the page. CC 5 38. Right. 580 okay. to East Mall. Thank you. I, and finally, I just want to uh, have a recorded vote on CC 5. CC 5.38. Uh, CC 5.22, 399 to 405 Young Street Zoning Bylaw Amendment. I just want an opportunity to uh, vote on that item recorded. Okay, so CC yep. 5.22, 399, 405 Young Street. You want a recorded vote? Record, I do. Recorded Thank you. vote.
Councillor Bravo, please. Thank you. Speaker, the item carries. It, the vote is 23 to 1. Thank you. Councillor Bravo. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to hold CC 5.31 in case I have questions of staff. Okay, just a sec. I'll flip the page. Um, and can you read the item, please? 1405, 1407, 1409, and 1409A Bloor Street West and 229, and 23A Sterling Road, Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw Amendment Applications Request for Direction Report, Ward 9. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I'd like to hold CC 5.21, Golden Mile Secondary Plan, City Initiated Official Plan Amendment, request for direction. Okay, CC 5.21, Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Okay. That's it that I have on the list. All those in favor of, of adopting the balance of the order paper? Yes, just one moment, please. I will now consider request to make items urgent and time specific. The clerk will open the speaker's list and CMP and you can place your name on the list. Councillor Carroll. Yes, the items I want to request, I submitted uh, a motion on them in writing, which I'm well, hoping you have because I've forgotten one of them. Okay, it's on the screen, Councillor Carroll. There we are. Uh, item CC 5.3, headed Ombudsman Toronto Report and Investigation into the City's Processes for Clearing Encampments. Um, I'm suggesting that we make it the first item immediately after the Deputy Mayor's key items. And uh, item CC 5.5, headed Intergovernmental Advocacy Efforts on Toronto's Refugee Claimant Shelter Response as the second key item, or as the second item after the Deputy Mayor's key items. So I'm asking that those two items come after we're done, our, our two key items. Okay, we do have the motion by Councillor Carroll. On favor, show of hands, carry, thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Speaker. I'm going to suggest that we time item CC 5.4, um, report on Councillor Josh Matlow's treats, criti tweets, criticizing city staff, Understanding is that the uh, integrity commissioner has um, a presentation for council, and so this would allow it to be um, timed and, and coordinated with the integrity commissioner. So when would you like to time it? Um, that would be the first item of business on the third day of council. Okay. Third item of business on the third day of council. Uh, no, the first item of business on the third day of council. Yeah, that's, I thought that's what I said. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Bradford. Just one moment. There sure. you go. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I would like to request that we time uh, the combined items of DM 5.2, which is review and consideration for a housing commissioner role or function at the Ombudsman Toronto, uh, and CC 5.6, terms of reference for the Housing Rights Advisory Committee uh, for the 2022 to 2026 City Council term. I'd like to request we time those for the first item on the second day of council tomorrow. Yeah, only if the, if the, the mayor's deputy items mayor's are, items has been dealt with. Yep. Um, Thank you. Councillor, yeah, just a Councillor Fletcher. No, I had asked earlier about timing that, and you told me I couldn't. And now Councillor Bradford's jumped up and timed it, because I'm holding both of them, yeah. including the deferred one. Yeah. So that those were my rights you abrogated. Yeah, speaker. so I, I'm sorry, Councillor Fletcher, you rec... Well, when I perhaps you should have asked me about that now just, that we're in this just time. a sec Councillor Fletcher calm down thank you okay. I'm, not, I'm not excited no. speaker so, I'm very calm okay very thank, cool thank you very I'm much I appreciate that Councillor Bradford Councillor Fletcher is correct she did ask for that item to be timed so Councillor Fletcher when when would you like that I item like that to be the timed? third day after the second uh, the, the motion we just decided to have first I can't remember the one it's Friday morning <coughs> okay so the clerk has advised me that we can... Uh, Can't Councilor hear you, Fletcher, sorry. Uh, the clerk has advised me that uh, Councillor Fletcher, your motion would be an amendment to Councillor Bradford's motion. Okay, so we'll vote on your motion first. Thank you. Okay. On Councillor Fletcher's motion... To have to it be, this third be, morning, third uh, day after that item. After the... Yeah, no. There, there is a time. There is a timed item that we just voted on for the first item on, we didn't vote on, on the it third yet. day. So, Councillor Fletcher is recommending that this item be dealt with following that first item. And because okay. you didn't recognize me. For no, my I understand, Councillor Fletcher. You. I understand. Thank, Thank you. So, on Councillor Fletcher's motion, on favor, carry. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Councillor Burnside. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, item 3.13, requesting that for uh, the second item tomorrow. The uh, community safety issues in response so that we can get uh, the necessary parties to attend. So, Councillor uh, Burnside, yes. so are you recommending that that item be dealt with with the first item on the second day of council? Second item. Well, I don't, no, I don't because know what, sorry, I don't know what the first item is. Th there was, there was no first item. Councillor Bradford's motion didn't go through. Councillor Fletcher. Okay, so then the first. So item. your your yours would be your first item only if the deputy mayor's items has been dealt with. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay, on favor? I made a motion earlier today that you said you had to make later. And as long as that's okay with him, because he was trying to have that today. Yeah. I, I think we did discuss it with Councillor Colt, uh, Councillor Fletcher. On the item, on favor? Carried. We're going to, Councillor Cole, we're going to be dealing with the item first thing tomorrow morning. And we're going to get all staff that are here. That's what the motion is. We want to get TTC, we want to get the police here, and we will deal with that item, the first item. Right, right, yes. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Thank you. Councillors would like key staff here for that discussion. Should they tell that to the city manager? 
that be the proper way to do that? Yes, Thank you. we okay. are. Okay. Yes. And then I, I do have to go back because I missed holding something. So whenever okay. you give can me you that chance. Thank yeah, you. can you just hold on so we I can I can take, hold. Yes. Okay, so we can take the vote on the item? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought, okay. yes, I thought you said we had. So no. that's fine. Yes, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, the timing of the item. On Councillor Burnside's motion on favour, show of pants, carried. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, yeah, just like my colleague, we must have something going on over here that we didn't, uh, we have to go back. And I have to go back to CC 5.1, declaring the office of mayor vacant and filling the vacancy. All wards, please. Thank you. And that will have to be dealt with at this council. So for tomorrow I'll probably put a time time because it can't go, can't go past. My mic, thank you. Um, it's near the end, and I'd like you to rule or a request from this someone as to when we would have to deal with that because we're declaring that vacant. And if there's anything with the report, we can't let this slide into the next meeting or it won't be declared vacant. I think the clerk has an urgency to this motion. Well, we do. We do, and it will be dealt with in this council. I have the clerk comment, Councillor Fifth. Lecture. Speaker, uh, it would be, there would be some advantage in making sure that that item is dealt with tomorrow, if possible, so that a bylaw can be passed and uh, enacted in time for nominations to open on Monday. Okay, we'll have the we'll have the paper uh, we'll have it ready for tomorrow morning. Okay. Okay, Councillor Fletcher. Okay. Okay. Councillor Fletcher, would you like to move it as a timed item, the second item tomorrow morning? I'm just looking for uh, direction and, from... And that's, uh, and that's the clerk is recommending that. So. You know, Speaker, it's really hard for me to hear you. Yeah. But it's not hard for me to hear everybody else. So if you don't mind... The second item tomorrow, would you like to move that? Yes, I would. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. On Councillor Fletcher's motion, on favour, carry. I know. Councillor Pasternak. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. I, I hope there's something available maybe between 3 and 4 in the morning next week sometime. Um, now, I must admit, I was, I was going to ask for a second item uh, on the second day, but I, I think that's just been taken. That's so right. So I'll try for third item. Which, what, what item are you <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, NY 31.31, Federal Election uh, District's Redistribution. Okay, just just one sec. Immediately, immediately after um, Councillor Fletcher's item. I don't know. So, so Councillor Pasternak, which uh, oh NY three point thirty one. So you want to move that it would be the third item uh, tomorrow. The third item tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. On favor. Show of hands carried. Councillor Fletcher, your your name is up there. Is this another item? But I also just want to let everyone know that there's some fantastic Spana Capita there for your eating pleasure uh, in behind the uh, speaker. Thanks. If, if I can please have members of council take their seats, we're, we're, we haven't even gone through the agenda yet. 
Councillor Fletcher, please. We, 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 okay, we still haven't got, we haven't completed the agenda yet. We haven't even started the agenda. Okay, Councillor Malik. Councillor Malik, understand that you have a motion that you want to move to um, take out a committee and bring it forward. Can you please, uh, can you please advise what the item is? Um, yes, the clerks have the uh, language for the motion. Um, it is, uh, I can read it out in accordance with section 27.7.1. Uh, council procedure, City Council remove item TM 1.2, headed update on Metrolinx's Ontario line construction within the Toronto and East York District from the Toronto and East York Community Council and bring the item forward to City Council for consideration. Um, do I need to say more about it at this point? No, so we, we do have the motion on the, on the screen by Councillor Malik. Um, okay, um, Councillor Cole. Councillor Myers, Councillor Burnside, please take your seats. We're trying to get through the, the items. You can't hear me, Councillor Fletcher? Well, I'm, I am screaming. Okay. Well, my mic is on, please. Okay, so we have... Councillor Bradford, please take your seat. We have a motion by Councillor Malik. It's on the screen. Okay, I want everyone to look at the motion and then we're going to take a vote. Okay, motion by Councillor Malik. On favor, show of hands, carry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, all those in favor of adopting the balance of the order paper and all items not held, please. Okay, um, okay, there has been a request for recorded vote. Recorded vote. Members, just stand by while we prepare a motion to put on the screen. Voting panel is now open, members. Councillor Carroll, thank you. Speaker, the order paper is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. Thank you. Members, I want to remind you that regardless of whether you are attending today's meeting by video conference or in person, you will continue uh, to submit and approve your motions by email. The clerk staff are available by email to help you with motions. If you do not have your motion ready, I will not recognize you. I'm also reminding members that you must state your motion first before you speak to it. Members, if you have an urgent motion without notice you wish to bring forward at this meeting, and uh, uh, you and your seconder must submit it by email to the clerk staff. Your motion must clearly state the reason for urgency and staff will prepare the necessary procedure motion for my review along with your motion. 
I will review all motions without notice carefully. I may ask you to provide more information on, about the urgency of your motion and why it can't be rooted through normal committee channels. This will inform my decision on whether to consent to your motion and in turn council's decision about whether to add your motion to the agenda. The purpose of your motion and your reason for urgency must be clear. I will advise council after each recess which motions I have agreed on that are urgent and that need a motion to add to the agenda. It will require 18 votes to add a motion without notice to the agenda during the meeting. Motions added to the agenda in this way are not subject to a vote to waive referral to a committee or agency. We will now go to the first key item which is EX 3.2. Yes, I know. Just one sec, please. Just one sec. Councillor Fletcher. Oh, I just wanted to clarify because Councillor Thompson, who was the former chair of Ed Devon, who ate everywhere across the city, asked me to let everyone know that all of that food is from Greek restaurant on the Danforth. So that was my turn this week, month, and there it is out there. Okay, we'll go to the first item of business, which is the X 3.2 2023 financial update and outlook, which is our first key item. If uh, members of council have questions, if they can put their name on the list, please. Councillor Robinson. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I guess my first um, notation is there's a report coming back on the revenue tolls. Um, so, I, you know, we all understand that. But in the meantime, given the, the dire situation, um, is there going to be an effort made to look for efficiencies and cost savings at this time? So through the speaker, okay, at, this, um, at this time if, we're uh, hold, hold we're on, working if, at bringing hold forward. On, can you hold down? Uh, hold on. We don't even have quorum on members of council sitting down. Like, are we not interested in the item, Councillor? Councillor Burnside. Can you please take your seats? We need to have quorum. I, okay, sorry, Councillor Robinson. I Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I, I asked my question and I was just waiting for the answer. Yeah, through the speaker, uh, we're always looking at, at ways uh, to be more efficient in operation. So that's an ongoing piece. But I think to more your question is, will there be a concerted effort to look at, at other options? That would be part of the suite of, of, of potential solutions that would come forward in the second report, uh, which is earmarked to come in July. Uh, so we'll be looking at a variety of things. I think it's important to recognize that we're not just looking at, at intergovernmental work, we're looking at all of the options that are available uh, to, to find ways of closing that uh, financial gap. Okay, thank you. Um, also, you know, we've had to step in and step up in the cases where other orders of government have not, where they should be. So we're kind of, you know, treading on each other's uh, jurisdictions. Um, I guess my question to you is there is there some type of full accounting of the value of the services the city is providing that really should be the responsibility of other orders of government? Um, I guess that's my, my next question. 
Uh, so through the speaker, uh, each year actually as part of the budget process, we do estimate the services that uh, we deliver that uh, really are augmenting or supporting other orders of government, in particular around social services and healthcare. Uh, the exact numbers, I'm, uh, I'm just, uh, I'll actually look, it's on page 15 of the report, and um, I'll just ask uh, my colleagues to provide it to me. So when you look at housing, Speaker, on a point of order, uh, under our rules, you're not allowed to use city resources as part of a campaign. Uh, you're not allowed to use city resources and facilities as part of an election campaign. I am concerned that a member of council is currently doing that up in the media gallery, and uh, I would ask you to uh, ask him to stop. So I'm sorry, Councillor Perks, I can't even see who's up there. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Bradford, I'm sorry that during council meetings, we, we can't have political uh, comments made. Yeah, can't campaign comments during the scrum okay i you know we're in the middle of asking questions um uh, councillor holiday point of order we uh, speaker i i appreciate uh the the concerns raised but i think we should get to an answer on this um there was a mention of a campaign however i don't think the seat has been declared vacant so i'm not really sure if that's if that's correct. I just wondered if you could uh, rule on that. Okay, Councillor Holliday, I'll, I'll rule later. Thank you. Councillor Robinson, are you still there? Yes, I am. I've never left. Um, this is a really important, this is a really important issue the city's facing and it's a key item. Yes, so I, I, um, I asked a question. Yeah, um, I've asked a question to the city manager. He was just about to respond to me, and uh, that's where we were. So, through the speaker, just to give you some examples, uh, you know, we estimate that on the operating side in housing, it's over six hundred million dollars in social services, close to two hundred and fifty million, and in health services, just just over two hundred and fifty million. Uh, where we're really leveraging our resources to continue to provide services that uh, are largely in the jurisdiction of, uh, of other orders of government. So it's a significant piece that we either step into the breach on or we're required to use our own resources because the funding we receive from other orders of government does not cover the full costs. And an example of that would be in long-term care, for instance. Okay, that's a very helpful can, can answer. You call, can you call? Um, uh, Go okay, ahead. my last question is, okay, thank you. My last question is, um, you've just cited some big numbers. Uh, have we ever shared these total numbers with the province or the federal government? So through the speaker, uh, yes, uh, we do. They're in presentations we make, um, and we've highlighted it to both the provincial and, and federal governments uh, with their respective jurisdictions on a, on a regular basis, and we update them on a yearly basis as to what those change in those numbers are. Okay, thank you very much. That's it, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. 
Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, a question probably to the city manager, the CFO. Uh, can you just uh, go over very quickly and explain how we came to the $46.5 billion, how it impacts not only operating, but capital, and, and just as sort of a, and how we got to that number and some of the uh, larger numbers that are a part of it? Through you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Councillor, there's three components of the $46.5 billion. Um, they stem from operating pressures that are projected over the next 10 years, starting at uh, $550 million in year one, uh, growing, growing to an annual $1 billion uh, by the end of the 10-year period. In addition to that, we've got increased debt expenditures uh, to cover the servicing of our debt, servicing including the debt repayments as well as the interest costs on our expanded capital plan as well as the unfunded capital program, um, which starts out at $880 million on an annual basis and it grows to $3.4 billion on an annual basis. So those three buckets, the current operating pressure is $7.5 billion of the $46.5. The increased debt is $9.5 billion of the $46.5. And the unfunded capital is twenty nine and a half billion of the forty six and a half billion. So the just let me I just want to unpack that a little bit. So on the unfunded capital, that would be what we would consider when we go through our budget process. Everything below the line uh, that hasn't been accounted for. That'd be correct. That's correct. And then when you're looking at um, all the rest, so these are all the decisions, all the strategies, all the priorities that City Council has determined. Uh, or made decisions on over the next 10 years. That would be uh, a, a correct assumption. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, Councillor, I just want to say that the, the, the input into the projections that were done uh, started off with the 2023 budget. So the policies yep. and the programs that were committed, the commitments that were made on a long-term basis reflected in the 10-year capital plan, that was the starting point for this 10-year capital projection, or sorry, total operating and capital projection. So this is a, uh, understandably a large amount, uh, probably something we can't uh, use property taxes for efficiency, service reductions um, to solve this on our own. Um, can you talk about, and I think the city manager had mentioned that when you're looking at uh, you know, our role and we need to do what we need to do, uh, but we also need the support of the other two levels of government. Um, more so, I think, than we ever have had in the past. So can you comment on the importance of the intergovernmental and what we need to be doing and working with the other two levels to make them understand our challenges? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, Councillor, I think when you reflect back to the budget process, we were very clear uh, in the advocacy at that time that we did need uh, a, a revised framework for municipalities, specifically the City of Toronto. Uh, in addition to that, when you start looking at the magnitude, when you look at the solutions that we're going, or consider solutions that are going to be coming forward in July, they're going to have to entertain revenue tools, they are going to have to entertain service impacts, they are going to have to entertain um, a revised framework with other orders of government to address the magnitude of this problem. So again, this is, uh, it's not necessarily our problem as a city. It's, it's really uh, uh, work that has to be done with all the other, other levels of, of government to, uh, now question, but just when you're looking at uh, the federal provincial budgets that just happened, um, we didn't get the funding we needed um, from the provincial or federal government. Does this uh, exasperate or make it more challenging as we start to move forward? It's not only the 46.5 billion, but in fact, it's, it's the other billion. So this just sort of adds on to the challenges that we're going to be facing? Through you, uh, Madam Speaker, Councillor, uh, the concern is that what we've been flagging is that we had a sufficient provision to deal with the pressures of 2023, um, as well as the 2022 outstanding amount. As we continue to draw down the reserves, of which the two uh, recent budgets have indicated that 2022's pressures will not be addressed, those reserves are being drawn down. They are a one-time solution. So in the, in the result that we go forward to 2024, um, 
and having to impact those reserves, we don't have a backstop provision to keep ourselves balanced. So we will have to come forward with uh, suggestions and recommendations on how we'll be in balance for 2024 uh, without reserves available to us. Okay, thank you. That was your last question. Thank you. Councillor Perks, question. Thank you, Speaker. I'm not sure if who this goes to. It could be the city solicitor or the city manager. So, uh, well, no, first to the CFO. So the City of Toronto budget preparation period is quite extensive. We actually start doing some work now. Is that correct? Through you, Madam Speaker. Correct, Councillor. Uh, the, the technical preparation uh, is being done. We typically do joke about the budget starting the day after the budget pro, uh, is approved. Um, and there are, there are technical pieces that have to be done, compilation of information, et cetera, so you are correct. Okay. At some point in that process, uh, every year since amalgamation, council or the mayor or city staff send a direction to the general managers with some parameters about what should and shouldn't be, uh, how they should con conduct their budget. Often in that, for example, it will say, uh, bring us a budget uh, with a 0% increase. When does that instruction typically get given? Through you, Madam Speaker. Councillor, you are correct. Um, I would say that the budget process is an iterative process where there are a series of directions that are provided to staff. Uh, typically, we do look later in the summer. Last year, in 2022, uh, it was in August. So later in the summer is typically when a more specific direction is provided to staff. Okay. To the city solicitor. Um, between now and July whatever, when we swear in a new mayor, um, who has the authority to issue budget instructions? So council does not assume the role of the mayor during this time. Does Do the public service assume the role of the mayor at this time? No. However, no. what I've just heard the CFO describe does sound like the typical work that is done every year and was done every year prior to the strong mayor powers coming into place. It's more of the preparation work before something would be presented to the mayor for guidance. Okay, so it would be uh, illegal for city staff to issue directions to general managers or agencies putting parameters on what their budget development should look like until we have a new mayor. I wouldn't say that communication from the CFO to division heads or agencies would be illegal at this point in time, provided that it was a request um, framed as guidance that would be subject to modification when a mayor came into office. So they can issue a request that gives some parameters on what kind of budget preparation general managers and agencies should be doing. That would be a request for input from the CFO to assist the CFO in working in the future with the mayor on a budget. Uh, however, what I've just heard the CFO describe is a process that wouldn't require that sort of direction prior to a new mayor assuming office. Okay, but I, I want to be very, very precise. Um, would it be appropriate for the chief financial officer to issue a request to a general manager or an agency saying, uh, what steps would you have to take to uh, keep your budget below a certain amount? Would that be appropriate? So, given the magnitude of the city budget and the number of factors that come into play in arriving at a proposed budget, I don't think there's anything illegal about the CFO seeking information from division heads or agency heads would prior to a new mayor assuming office. Okay. Would it be, a, would it be uh, within the bounds of the law if council were to ask that the CFO prior to issuing 
uh, request to general managers or agencies and commissions uh, that would have anything to do with service levels that it come here to council for our review. Now, the, the tricky piece of that, and there are two, two pieces to my response. One is that what I've just heard the CFO describe is a process that wouldn't require political guidance until a new mayor is in office. Uh, second, council doesn't actually assume the authority of the mayor during this interim period. I understand that. You know, the point at which council would assume authority for the budget would be February 1st of next year should the mayor who's currently in office not introduce a proposed budget at that point in time. Thank, thank you. That was your last question, Councillor Kurtz. <laughs> Councillor Matlow, questions? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, can staff confirm the the dollar amount? in the shortfall that um, council or the mayor um, approved a budget for 2020 based on assumptions that the provincial and federal governments would bail it out. What, what is that number? Through you, Madam Speaker. Councillor, if you're asking for uh, the 2020 budget. 2023. 2022. It was 933 million for COVID. It was 48 million for supportive housing. And it was 97 for refugees. Well, the balance no. never came. So <clears throat> given that, the, that this year's budget was based on assumptions that, was that the provincial and federal governments would bail out hundreds of millions of dollars. I, I, I recall the $1.5 billion number. Um, what, you know, what is the status of the city's budget? Is it truly balanced? Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, the, the budget is balanced. We made that very, very clear during the budget process because we had a provision in our backstop. Is it not, though, is it not balanced based on the assumption that there would be promised monies from the provincial and federal governments that would be delivered that did not materialize. So through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, the way that we determined it to be, to be balanced was because the assumption actually had a backstop. In the event that the other governments did not come forward, we had a backstop that we could draw on. If that backstop gets eliminated, which is what I was alluding to, in prior questions in 2024, then we aren't in a balanced scenario. So we will have to plan differently. So but the backstop for 20 or the reserves? 2023, we are balanced. So the reserves are assuming, well, not assuming, knowing that the, the bailouts didn't materialize, that, was, that, it, that didn't happen, that wasn't real, that the reserves are now being rated to cover that, and we're not going to have any really any more room in those reserves in the coming years to be able to do this again? Through you, Madam Speaker. Councillor, I think what we can confidently say is our 2022 outstanding pressure is not going to be met and our reserves have to be drawn down. We're too early in the fiscal year of 2023 to make that assumption. The, um, the promised um, making right of Toronto's budget by the provincial government due to bills 23 and 109 did those promises ever come true? Did that materialize? Through you, Madam Speaker, we're currently working with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing on the audit terms of reference that references the Bill 23 work. So we don't know yet. That is still outstanding. Have we been, in your opinion, uh, do we have a tax rate and have we had a tax rate for the past several years that has been addressing our reality, or has it been artificially suppressed? Through you, Madam Speaker, I'm sorry, I can't comment on that. Well, I, I seek your opinion, your advice. Do we need a higher tax rate, or has the tax rate that we've been 
um, uh, implementing as, as, as a council and now through the strong mayor budget, has it been reasonable? Has it been meeting our needs or do we need to reconsider our approach? Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, as I had just commented before, I think the solution on a go-forward basis is going to be a combination of taxes, probably um, amendments to policies and programs, as well as a new fiscal framework with other orders of government. And how is that new fiscal framework going with respect to um, upload or downloaded services that uh, you know we've been dealt over the past several years, whether it be courts, whether it be uh, the highways, whether it be uh, you know so many different services that once were provincial uh, purview uh, alone, along with um, you know regaining uh, a sustainable investment into the operating of the TTC, so that it's not reliant on 75 percent of the revenue coming through the fare box. Where are we at? Are you optimistic? Have you received any commitments? Are we starting from a blank slate? Where are we at? Through you, Madam Speaker. Actually, Councillor, I think this, this report that we've brought forward in actual fact has validated some of the concerns that we have been raising over the last few years. The fact is now we have data. We have evidence to take to those other orders of the government to inform conversations. And I think we've escalated the concern around needing a new fiscal framework. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff. Um, yesterday's federal budget, um, just wondering uh, what was in it uh, for the City of Toronto or other municipalities? Thank you. So through the speaker, you will receive a, a broad uh, a note that goes through a number of things, some of which do touch on, on issues that, that confront uh, municipalities. Some of our very specific asks were not met. And uh, if there was only one little uh, glimmer, we do believe that there's going to be some continued investment for refugee uh, temporary housing uh, within the budget. Uh, but in terms of the specific asks of the City of Toronto, you uh, saw comments by our Deputy Mayor and we would concur that the specific pieces that Toronto was asking for uh, were not addressed in this budget. So um, do they understand the seriousness of the situation or, or is there a disconnect between the City of Toronto and, I don't know, the Prime Minister's office or the Minister of Finance? So through the speaker, I, I, I do know from intergovernmental work, both at the staff level and, and political level, that they're certainly aware of the challenges, particularly in this last two to three years as we've gone through the pandemic. And we must recognize that there have been investments in uh, the city of Toronto, as with all municipalities across the country during this time. I think what's changed and what isn't quite landing yet is the discussion that some of this is not changing because we've been through the crisis part of the pandemic. The issues confronting uh, housing, homelessness, some of the health care services, um, and our transit system in general are, require a different looking at it. It's not a year after year asking and hoping to get some resources. It is a new way of looking at the operations of these programs alongside the capital. So based on what you've said, if we, if we get a check for $1.4 billion tomorrow morning, a year from now we'll need another check for probably 1.4 billion plus the rate of inflation uh, through the through the speaker in, in certain cases we don't see a tremendous reduction in the needs of that and you're quite right right now we're talking about one-time investments we need actual structural changes to programs and ongoing sustainable funding so we're not in the same position year after year so i guess I, i've been here 12 years and um, although <laughs> there are tastes it seems a little longer uh, we have tried every possible ad uh, addressing or suggesting every possible uh, revenue tool for, for our city. 
Uh, some other municipalities may adopt them as well. Uh, and I'm just wondering what more, what more can we do on that file? We continually uh, uh, make suggestions, whether it's a, a regional sales tax, whether it, the, the tolls were promised and then they reneged on them, uh, whether it's an income tax, uh, whether it's transfers, interprovincial, inter intergovernmental transfers. What is left? And I realize this is not an easy question to answer, but we've we've tried everything over the last ten years. Um, is there is there anything you can suggest that we really haven't? Uh, we haven't uh, uh, moved forward on. I, so through the speaker, you, you've covered the big ones. We need tools that grow with the economy. That's the tools that, uh, that cities like Toronto need. And that's not a new ask and that's not a new conversation. I think where we are at the moment is um, trying to demonstrate with some very clear evidence the size and scope of the issue. This is not tinkering around the edges. These are not things that we can solve uh, in, in easy ways. Our report that's coming forward in, a, in just a few months uh, will refresh all of those numbers, will refresh the opportunities that are available for that conversation with other orders of government. Uh, but to say to you today, you know, we've uncovered uh, some brand new things that are, that are surprising, new and easy to implement. No, it's going to be coming back to some of those same things that you just mentioned. So last question, uh, w when we talk to them, um, do they ever say, well, if we give to Toronto, then we have to give to Hamilton, we have to give to uh, Windsor, we have to give to Ottawa, we have to give to Kingston. Is, is there that kind of a, a res response that you're, you're just a city like just the, the others, and uh, if we give to you, we gotta give to everybody. Does that, does that come up in the conversations? So through the speaker, it, it certainly does. And in some cases, that's probably a truthful statement. There are things that are experienced by uh, most, and I would say most larger municipalities for sure. But the piece we've been very specific to talk about are some of the unique challenges and the unique opportunities, quite frankly, that exist in Toronto because of its size and scope, the impact it has on Canadians and the economy of Canada and of Ontario are things that we continue to talk about. And with that come some unique features to this community. And some of those are in the services that we need to provide to the community. Uh, we are not like other cities in terms of our response around refugees. Uh, and then it's other pieces like our infrastructure. We have the largest, most complex transit system in this country that drives an economy and drives the largest city in this country. That is unique, and it's not the same when you travel to other cities, not only in Ontario, but across the country. So the conversation we need to have, and be very specific about, is that there are some unique needs in Toronto. And then I know, talking to my colleagues in other uh, cities across this country, particularly the large cities, that there is a common agenda of needing to uh, have a new fiscal framework for cities across this country and we need both our, local, our, um, our provincial uh, uh, colleagues to come to the table, but we also need the federal government to play, play ball on that front too. Thank you. Councillor Myers. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through the Chair, uh, just a quick, a uh, few quick questions. Um, I noticed that the property tax rate is relatively constant. Uh, can you just provide a bit more color as to what figures were used to get from 2023 to 2032? So through the speaker, in terms of that piece, it was simply an inflationary calculation. Uh, added there, so that's why it's relatively constant. Do we have a sense as to what our fiscal situation uh, would be if we were increasing property taxes at the rate of other municipalities in the GTA? To you, Madam Speaker. Councillor, on an annual basis, we do compare ourselves to other municipalities in the GTHA, as well as the rest of the province. Um, we typically find ourselves in the middle of the pack in the sense of, of the, the increases. 
Um, however, most, I will say that most municipalities do in actual fact take a similar approach historically that the city has from an inflationary perspective as well as adding on a capital levy. Thank you. Um, and I'm just looking at uh, the funded capital projects. Um, can you confirm that the largest funded capital project in the city of Toronto is going to be the Gardner Rehabilitation Program at 1.89 billion? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, we're, we're just talking, we don't have that level of detail in front of us. Are you looking I'm at I'm just looking at it, yeah. I'm just looking at page um, 32. So page 33 is the unfunded. I'm sorry, perhaps I misunderstood I'm for your- I'm funded. Right, so, so I, page 33 that you oh. referenced is unfunded. Oh, sorry, so I'm talking about the funded uh, figure A 2.2. So the reason this is coming up is because it's one particular project. Mm -hmm. If we look at transit, let's say, those, those get broken out, but I'd say that on, a, on a, a consolidated basis, we have larger projects, um, but the, the granular detail about calling that out was, was not that it's the largest project in, it, in its entirety, but it's, it's um, I think we could call out transit projects that would actually surpass the, that amount. Thank you. And just so I'm clear, does that figure include the entire Gardner Expressway or just the section down, the elevated section downtown? Entire kilometer, 20 kilometer stretch. Through you, Madam Speaker, it's the entire 20 kilometer stretch. Do we have the figure of the particular um, section downtown? Or could I, I can get that offline. Happy to share with okay, you offline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why is she not here? Okay. Councillor Chen, questions? Thank you, Speaker, through the chair. Um, the, the Liberals of the government's budget uh, announced $202 million uh, to help with homelessness prevention over three years and $425 million Oh, sorry, 202 million for homelessness prevention and 425 million over three years for mental health. And I'm just wondering, uh, would much of that be coming to Toronto and would that address some of the 1.4 billion that we're waiting for? Through the speaker, can and can I just confirm whether you were talking about the provincial budget or the federal budget? Sorry, you broke, you broke up just the a federal. Little. The federal budget. Oh, sorry, sorry, the provincial budget. Yes. So, uh, um, good, just uh, so I can give the right answer and give the credit where credit's due. So, yeah, within the, um, the 202 million for homelessness, uh, that did include an increase for the City of Toronto, which uh, was equivalent to the ask of our supportive housing of $48 million. So, yes, that's confirmed, and we actually received a letter confirming the uh, precise amount for the City of Toronto out of that 202 million. In terms of mental health, a little less clear exactly where those investments will happen, uh, but we expect that, uh, that some will be invested within the City of Toronto, whether it comes to the big C City of Toronto or whether that's through other partners, organizations, uh, we'll, we'll need to continue to follow. And I think that's an important piece to raise is that we have some specific needs when it comes to supports uh, for individuals um, working with mental health uh, uh, issues and I, our hope is that we can have those conversations to ensure that that investment uh, supports some of the endeavors that, uh, that we want to see move forward here at the City of Toronto. Um, in the absence of a sitting mayor, uh, I know that Deputy Mayor advocating on our behalf, but I'm wondering um, who else is tasked with advocating for, at both levels of government and what does this advocacy look like? Uh, 
So through the speaker, from a staff perspective, advocacy uh, looks, uh, there's various levels of it. So we do some direct work uh, with our staff colleagues at the provincial and federal level. We have conversations about specific issues and, uh, and broad uh, challenges facing this community. We also do this through a number of networks. Uh, one of those networks is, um, uh, is a, a group of GTHA folks that are getting together and advocating on behalf of the region and are often are convened. The mayors and chairs of that group are convened uh, by the mayor or deputy mayor of the city of Toronto as well. Uh, we also work through provincial organizations and federal connections as well, including FCM, um, which uh, obviously we have political representation, but we are engaged as staff as well. And what I would say just in conclusion to that is there are so many commonalities happening in these conversations that while Toronto does have some unique uh, scenarios and in terms of the size and scope of some of the issues may be a bit unique, Many are shared by colleagues across the province and across the country. So uh, in, in uh, looking at our gap, what would the increase of property taxes need to be to fill in the gap for this year? Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, if you recall during the budget process, a 1% tax increase was approximately 39 million. So on average, we would be talking about a 39% a increase. And so what is the recommendation if we don't want to burn through our reserves this year? What should we, what can we do to uh, make sure that we can actually be balanced without burning through our reserve? Through you, Madam Speaker, um, Councillor, for 2023, uh, we will have to look at, we would, if, if there was a, a direction from Council, uh, we would have to look at uh, adjusting program commitments that we could respond to in a timely fashion. Um, there is an opportunity to continue to advocate with other orders of government, um, but beyond that, uh, I think for now we are restricted into what tools we have available to us. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, questions. Oh, I thought there was another speaker. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Um, yeah, I thought oh, Councillor Sachs was there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Caught me off guard there. Yeah. I apologize, <laughs> Councillor Sachs. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I apologize. It's okay. Councillor Sachs. Yes, thank you. Um, to Ms. Taylor. Um, we had uh, extensive discussions during the budget process that we need a commercial parking levy, uh, given that the budget that uh, the mayor adopted was based on an assumption we would get money that we have not received. What can we do to bring forward the adoption of the commercial parking levy? What can we do to start it this year? Through you, Madam Speaker. Councillor, you, you're correct in the sense of we did discuss uh, different revenue tools, parking levy being one of them. Uh, there is a commitment to bring back a revenue tools report in uh, I think it was Q3, we're going to accelerate that to bring it back in July. Um, so we will be presenting options to Council for tools that might be available to them as well as the timeframes associated with them. Uh, so you'll be bringing that to the July Council meeting? There'll, it will be included in amongst a revenue tools report, yes. Coming to Council? Yes. Right. Is there any way we can, we, we're in desperate need of the money, uh, is there any way we can do it faster? Through you, Madam Speaker, um, that particular piece is being currently worked on. And when you look at the time frame, it needs to be um, the information that needs to be gathered, the assessments that need to be done, the impact analysis to be completed thoroughly and confidently, July would be the quickest. We were originally committed to coming back in, in Q3. Well, uh, thank you. So let's talk about road tools. Um, we haven't 
road tolls are one of the only other options they could bring in hundreds of millions of dollars to the city and uh, would also help make the 40% of drivers who use the Don Valley and the Gardner pay their share of it, because right now they don't pay anything to the city. Um, is there any reason why we couldn't write today to the provincial government and ask for permission to adopt the road tolls that the city proposed, um, what was it, six years ago? Through you, Madam Speaker, uh, Councillor, there wouldn't be anything preventing us from asking permission, no. Okay. Um, now, the, the, once we have a new mayor elected, that person will have the strong mayor powers again. Is that person then uh, authorized to amend the budget that our last mayor adopted? Through you, Madam Speaker, I'm going to ask our Thank city you. solicitor to respond to that. Through you, Madam Speaker, the mayor would be authorized to amend the budget in a way that would increase the levy. That is um, an authority that is exclusively held by the mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, now, there have been other cities around the world who have faced this kind of financial brink and pivoted significantly, and one of the examples being the city of Copenhagen, so Ms. Taylor. Um, Copenhagen, when faced with bankruptcy, pivoted dramatically away from travel by car to travel by bicycle because they couldn't afford a car travel anymore. Have we studied what Copenhagen did to see what the City of Toronto could do now given our current circumstances? Through you, Madam Speaker. Councillor, not specifically Copenhagen, but as I mentioned, with the report that is coming back in July, which will be phase two of our financial outlook, our long-term financial plan, uh, we are working on coming up with a menu of options for Council to consider. And that will encompass looking at other jurisdictions, not only in Ontario, Canada, but globally. All right, can I ask specifically that you include Copenhagen in that review? I can commit to doing that, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, finally, we had some conversation in December about options to make obvious to the electors of um, the, the governments who are refusing to, to help the City of Toronto, and in fact, in, the provincial government in particular is their knee on our neck. Uh, what the consequences of that intransigence are to the city, we talked about including something in property tax bills or possibly having signs relating to infrastructure that people aren't getting. Um, will there be any consideration of those options in your report in July? Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, um, there was a direction by Council to include in the uh, the mailing the April, the May tax bill um, an update on whether or not the city has received COVID specific funding from other orders of government, and that is underway given the fact that both the provincial and the federal government uh, government budgets have now been disclosed. Uh, well, can I ask also that you consider what else the city can do to bring home to the people who elect those governments? what they're doing to the City of Toronto, what the consequences are going to be for their daily life. That was your last question. So through you, Madam Speaker, Council, we're responding to the direction that has already been received um, through, I, I can't remember, it was November, December? Yeah. I think in December's Council meeting, uh, specific on the COVID piece and specific to the federal government's uh, funding. So that is the piece that's currently being worked on uh, to meet the, the, the May tax bill. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff. On page 12 of the report, a summary. And by the way, just before I ask my question, can I just say that this is an amazing report? Thank you very much. It's excellent. So thank you. But on page 12, it talks in summary, it says the financial update report is based on the best information and the most reasonable assumptions and so on available as of February. It's important to observe that uh, future policies, decisions can and will impact the forecasted presented. So what policies would we be looking at that could affect either negatively or positively? Uh, with respect to this, uh, the report. Through 
Do you, Madam Speaker? Councillor, thank you for the, the comment. The policies that are being referenced here are what drives our program decisions that we currently deliver. And so you think of the, the scope of our programs, housing, shelters, um, service on transit, would be significant components of the budget that we currently deliver on. Uh, uh, just want, Councillor Peruzza, please. Please, Councillor Thompson is speaking. Councillor Peruzza. I'm trying to hear firstly. <laughs> Councillor Peruzza. Can somebody tap him? <laughs> please. Councillor Thompson is trying to ask questions. Go ahead, Councillor Thompson. No, I'm waiting for the staff. She's responding. Okay. So when you look at the, the, the larger components of our budget, housing and transit, those would be... Right, right. Uh, really important uh, decisions, really important um, matters for the residents of Toronto. Correct. Can you tell us, with respect to funds that we receive from the provincial government as it applies to this year's budget, what is that amount and what it, what is it being utilized for? Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, the, the amount that the city manager referenced, the $48 million in yep. support of housing, so that's an ongoing commitment. I think this is our third year that we will be receiving that. Receiving so that's that. the wraparound. Okay. All right. So we are impacted by Bill 23 significantly. Would you agree? I'm sorry, Councillor, I, I didn't hear you. Can you just repeat that, yes. please? Uh, I was stating that we are impacted greatly by Bill 23. Yes. Would you agree? Yes. Right. And it speaks to the impact on Section 37. And in this report, you talk about um, the reduction of funding that's available on the 10-year capital uh, program, that it has an implication, about, I believe it's about $2.3 billion, right? So if I may, yes. if I just can rewind a second, you asked about Bill 23. I need That's to correct. clarify that. For the purposes of this report, right. we have made an assumption similar to what we did in our budget, that from a Bill 23 perspective, we are not yet forecasting any negative impacts because there was a commitment from the province to do an audit, and that is still to... to I, I was going to get to that. Okay. So, you, so the commitment to do the audit assumption that they're going to find uh, resources that we should apply to uh, to cushion the impact. Is that the case? That's correct. But that's so an assumption as we make other assumptions about our budgets in general. So all of these assumptions are being made predicated on the supposition that we'll find resources that are there that we can't find now, correct? Right. And if correct. we don't, will the province respond and make us whole to a degree, for example, in this case, the shortfall of $2.3 billion on the impact. Is this a understanding or is this an assumption that in fact they will make us whole? Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, we do have a letter from the Minister okay. uh, of Municipal Affairs and Housing that confirmed that, there that they would make us whole for any direct impacts, but that audit to prove right. that is still outstanding. Fair enough. Um, may I then ask you, with respect to the tools that you've spoken about, in terms of line of questions from other members of council, those tools, does the provincial government have the authority to say whether or not we can use those tools should you bring a report forward to suggest these are the tools or the options that are available to help the city with respect to its financial issues. And Speaker, I should have at least 30 seconds left. Yes, you do. Through you, Madam Speaker. Councillor, there are a series of tools that are within the City of Toronto Act. Right. There are a series of tools where we need the cooperation of the province, and there are some tools that we will need the permission of the province. And just on a final point, because of the creation of the province and, be, uh, and, and the federal government, cities are not we're not incorporated as part of the BNA Act, is that correct? On that is correct. Right, and so with respect to our authority to make decisions without the provincial government's input, do we have that ability that would perhaps in, be in conflict with the provincial government, maybe it's political, maybe it's other rationale, uh, could we impose through our own authority, or do we have the authority to impose an element, let's say, to generate revenues 
other, uh, that, that are not consistent with the tools that we have available now? Should we come up with some unique tools? Could we do that? So because of the constitutional limitation that's just been referenced, municipalities... I'm just, yeah, I know it's my last... But, are, Speaker, I can't limited, hear the, I can't hear the solicitor. Can do... Madam Solicitor, I can, we can't hear you. I don't know oh, why. Sorry. Because of hear. the constitutional framework that's just been referenced, municipalities derive all of their authority from provincial legislation. So anything that council does must be authorized through provincial legislation. That Thank is you very a limitation. much. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Speaker. That that's your last question. Councillor Malik, five minutes. Questions. Um, thank you. Um, my first question is pretty straightforward. Um, when will we get the long-term financial plan? Uh, through the speaker, that report is coming uh, to the July uh, cycle of council. Okay, so just to be clear, will we get the long-term financial plan before budget in instructions go um, to the various divisions? Uh, so th through the speaker, uh, given how you're stating it, I, I'm going to say the answer to that is yes. That I understand what you're asking is decisions around uh, items that would be impacted by the long-term financial plan, those instructions will not happen until after that report comes to council. What the CFO has shared with you, and I need to reiterate, is there is technical work that goes in every year and has already started to help build the budget. But I, I, I know from the tone of the questions that this is really about major strategic differences in this year's budget, and that would happen um, after this report is landed and also after we have a new mayor. So I guess it's, it's yes and no, but a little bit more no. Um, so I guess my question is just, is there, is there any opportunity council, uh, council could take to make sure um, that the long-term financial plan is finalized before um, those budget instructions are sent out? So our intention through the speaker is not to, to send our staff off to do one set of things, have the plan come and then do another set of things. The final difference in this is it is not staff direction on the, uh, uh, when it comes to the budget direction. That will come from the mayor. So the other piece that is here is once that mayor is elected and there are conversations there, the mayor may choose to provide some direction uh, to us as staff, which we would then pass on. Uh, but to your specific question, uh, we are not going to provide direction to those general managers today that would then be uh, uh, you know, undone and taken in a different direction once the long-term financial plan uh, comes forward. Okay, thank you, that's clear, um, appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, five minutes. Speaker, thank you. To the CFO, this report paints a bleak picture, $46 billion. I think it's a compound annual growth rate of 2%. Do I understand that means that government is growing at a rate of 2% faster than we can provide revenues to meet those demands? Through you, Madam Speaker, um, yes, I'm going to speak to the assumptions that EY has built in and their economic forecast. So a 10-year, yep. if, if it's averaging it out to be two years, but there are ebbs and flows over that 10-year period. So this, this report tells me that we're short on operating, we're short on capital, and there's no plan to get it. So we are going to crash. It's a simple term. But we are headed for a severe situation where we can't pay the bills. Is that right? Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, the piece that I know that you're very well aware of is that a big chunk of that 46 and a half is the unfunded capital. Right. Those are decisions that are made and we can dial up or dial back capital sure. on an annual basis. Rot so, the roads out, don't fix that. But some of this says there's operating. You're correct, there is operating. So we can't pay those bills, so we will be out of balance. I think is what I heard you say very soon when we run out of reserves. Through you, Madam Speaker, if we don't do anything differently, that is correct. Right. So why does this report say to receive? I need to know 
and I, I ask for your advice, respectfully, what do I need to do right now as a member of council to put us on a course of stability? So through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, the important piece is that this is the quantitative aspect of the report. Understood. There is a next phase that the city manager has discussed that is coming back in July that we're currently working on. So that is going to have a list of options for council to consider to address the pressure that you just, just uh, mentioned. I think you use the words, adjust our response to commitments. And I, writing's a little messy. Did I get that right? Is that another way to look at what our service offerings are? Three our service months. levels. Through you, Madam Speaker, I think the report has said that we are going to have to consider a hybrid option, set of options. It's not going to be only one thing that's going to solve the magnitude of this problem. Do you have adequate council direction to bring that back before us? Yes. Do you need any other council direction to look at the different pieces on how to solve this? Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, I think it's been quite clear in the long-term financial plan that we are going to come back with a list of options for council to consider. Uh, when I had a chance to ask questions about this in the executive committee, um, you gave me part, a part of an answer. We didn't explore it further. And you talked about prioritizing the services, starting with things like health and safety, legislated services, things where we're contractually bound and so on. Could you elaborate on what those, those buckets are or those tiers or layers and how do we get that before council? And I mean, we should be looking at that every time we make a decision as to which bucket it falls into. Can you help me with that? I'd like to correct that today. Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, that conversation at exec was referring back to the budget process that we've just been through. The decision-making process for staff uh, in evaluating and prioritizing their programs, their program needs, health and safety was the first priority. Legislative requirements were a second priority. A third priority were council directions and council commitments. Based on those three buckets, we assessed what had to be done and assessed what funds were available. So we did a prioritization exercise. Going forward, that may or may not change with a new mayor. We will wait for direction on that. Uh, the budget documents and this report cites $1.1 billion or 22% of property tax that goes to extensions of federal and provincial responsibilities. How much of that $1.1 billion falls into the council directed layer? So through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, I think you're referencing what's on page 15 of the report. Um, and so that is under the buckets of housing, uh, social services, and health services. So Council has choices to make, and we are free to make those choices because I think, I'm going to jump here, that this is Council-directed service levels. They don't fall into the other buckets. So we have choices. That, that was your last question. Through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor, you're correct. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, questions? Uh, yes, just a couple of quick ones, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I actually applaud the, the, the two phases to this because I know that many times we've had a report that gives us this outlook, but it, it also provides the options in the same report. and. As councillors are want to do, we go straight to the options and then you realize in the room, maybe everyone hasn't read this document. So I'm, I'm really glad that we're doing this thoughtful two-phase approach. Uh, but my question is around, uh, uh, it's awkward because it, uh, it, 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 it's also uh, driven by the uh, advanced circulated motion from the deputy mayor. We, we have, uh, in our intergovernmental strategy, we've always uh, uh, painted this picture as best we can. Even why gives us a really updated uh, version of it. But my question is around making them understand the financial model piece, the funding formula piece. We've had an uh, intergovernmental strategy that says, give us permission for revenue tools. Uh, here's our dire situation. I'm wondering if we, if we, can, we can recall or, or have we looked into the research, have we ever tried an intergovernmental strategy where rather than just say, we want revenue tools, 
please sit down with us and deeply understand our funding formula, our financial model. Um, have we ever framed it that way before? So through the speaker, just you know, conferring with the uh, chief financial officer, I'm not sure we've had that detailed a conversation. We, we have talked, uh, particularly to the provincial government, about the funding formulas that impact service delivery at a municipal level in the province of Ontario. So mm -hmm. you will recall the changes to public health funding and yeah. the percentages. They've been put on hold, but for hold for how long? Uh, maybe looking at the ways that the downloading and the uploading, did that actually net out um, in a way that it was intended to? There was the uploading of costs for the for Ontario Works, but a downloading of costs around social housing. Did those things, right. so those conversations do take place, but the holistic piece you talk about is, is again, another layer we should be looking at in all our conversations. Right, let's look at the whole model. I'm wondering if you experience what, what we experience when we individually try to help out with intergovernmental affairs. It seems that over time, I know there's, there's been a lot of change in government, and really if we go from 2015 on, a lot of change in both levels. When we make individual appeals, they don't seem to understand the, the funding model that is necessary or the, the current situation for a government that cannot run a deficit. They don't seem to understand that a government that cannot run a deficit, of course we have a reserve. We, we, we're not allowed to be in a deficit. The reserve is our backstop to make payroll. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, that's the conversation we have at you know banquet tables and, and the like. Is that same frustration happening at intergovernmental tables? I know you can't divulge the whole conversation. So through the speaker, uh, yes, some of those conversations and there does need to be a level setting of understanding around that, particularly when it comes to reserve. And I will say this has been a source where I would use the word frustration, because uh, as, as we know around this table, and it's quite, why quite frankly, uh, we've embraced this opportunity to work with the provincial government around this audit, to really understand yes. what happens with some of these reserves. Because what does look like, if you just look at a financial statement, large sums of money is not available today for a discretionary yeah. conversation, nor is it available for us on a regular basis to plug holes in programming. It is allocated, it is there, and even though those things may not come to fruition next month or next year, they're allocated in a way that they are still committed. And that's right. the conversation that we are finding it a bit challenging, and, and you'll see the public discourse that's happening around uh, whether, you know, how reserves are treated is something we need to get beyond. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Peruzza, five minutes. Uh, I just want to, you, you, you mentioned something that I'd, I'd like to uh, just uh, pursue for, for a bit. Uh, you mentioned the downloading of housing uh, to the city, um, I guess back in uh, 1997, I believe it was, right, more or less. Um, how has, how does the, uh, is, is the number, is the housing number here in your report, uh, and what is the impact of that uh, in the in the overall forecast in the in this in this uh, in sort of in this deficit forecast that you've uh, predicted ten years uh, forward? So through the speaker, housing is a significant portion of the pressure on a number of fronts. So yes, we have the, uh, the impact now, many years later, of, of uh, the responsibility for social housing. And that's an impact that municipalities are feeling across the province. Then we have the challenge of the increasing uh, cost to build new housing. And then the final piece is the operating cost to provide the type of housing that supports those who are vulnerable. And this, this constant need to go year by year and hope that we receive the money to provide the services is what's pushing that challenge. So left unchecked, it becomes a, a hundreds of millions of dollar conversation. And that's why housing is always part of the conversation as is transit and to a lesser degree, some of the health related services, because these are the ones that are material. Yeah. These are the ones that impact our budget but, but, the most. But, but specifically, I, I want to focus in on, on, on this one particular sort of very narrow 
uh, element of the housing. I remember when the, when, when the province uh, said in a, uh, what they believed or what they tried to articulate as a quid pro quo, uh, there, used to be, there used to exist what was called the Metro Toronto Housing Authority. And they, uh, uh, back in 97 in a, in a quid pro quo uh, maneuver, said we are going to download uh, these housing units and it represented at that time somewhere a, a little over 50,000 housing units. And, and why I ask this question is it, it's this. I recall, I remember um, in 1990 on my first day on the job as a legislator, the deputy minister walking into my office and saying, and saying, uh, Peruzza, uh, the thing that you folks need to do in this term of office is deal with the albatross around the provinces' neck, and that's MTHA, housing. Later, that was downloaded to the city, and it was welcomed by the city, because we uh, thought at the time that we could uh, deal with that issue better. So we accepted the albatross. So my question is this. What, is our, what has been our annual um, cost associated with that particular decision back in 1997? That, over time. Capital. So, so um, through the yeah. speaker, the, the number that we can be real clear right now on is on the capital side. The city of, of uh, Toronto has committed $1.6 billion over 10 years to match federal contributions, and that's all about state of good repair and these housing units. The operating cost, uh, we don't have at our fingertips. Uh, we can get that to you. But important to recognize, just on that capital alone, $160 million a year per year for 10 years. Right. So, so the capital number has been staggering. When you add the operating number to that, uh, I suspect that that staggering becomes somewhat breathless. Uh, and over time, over the, from 1997 to today, uh, what, would, what would have been the, and, and if you don't have it now, maybe you can give it to me later. Um, I, I followed this with some interest. Uh, it's, it's over a billion dollars a year, as I understand it. The past 20 something years, have, it has cost us some 20 plus billion dollars. I could be wrong on that, but it would be, it would be very good for these folks, for all of us, Councilor Peruzza, to have your, that number your before us because, because it, was, it was fundamental. It was absolutely fundamental to how the province of Ontario restructured its financial relationship with the city of Toronto back in 1997. We didn't cry foul then, Okay. But we needed to have cried foul. We need to cry foul today okay. and going forward, I believe. Thank so you, Councillor Prudza. Councillor Prudza. And through the speaker, just uh, we'll get the, the broader number over time. But just this year alone, uh, through you, speaker, to the councillor, 300 million in operating, 160 million in capital, 460 million for this year alone is the number. Okay. We'll get you the larger uh, number as well. Thank you. Okay, so we have time. We'll just go to speakers, Deputy Mayor uh, McKelvey, um, to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion. We can pull it up. It's been advanced circulated also. Uh, that city council requests federal and provincial government to recognize the serious financial risk faced by the city of Toronto in delivering the services and infrastructure needed by the residents of the city and region and begin discussions on a new fiscal framework to ensure long-term financial sustainability for the city. The second comes in no surprise. You've seen me move this before. City Council requests the provincial government to provide revenue tools for the city of Toronto that grow with the economy in a similar fashion to provincial sales and income taxes. Um, we, we need a new fiscal framework for the city of Toronto. This report is clear. Uh, we're facing huge budget pressures of $46 billion over the next 10 years. And uh, we need to have those important conversations with the other level government about a couple things. The one, the revenue tools available to us, 
and two, what are the services that we are providing and are those services that should be funded by the City of Toronto and in particularly paid for by property taxes. And I think we can all point to things where we've stepped up, we've filled a gap, we've done it because it's the right thing to do, but we need the federal government and the provincial government to support us on that. We know the way we're running the city right now is not sustainable. The report shows that. We're basically being told to take out our RRSPs, to pay for our groceries, to pay for our mortgage. We wouldn't run our households like that. We shouldn't run our city like that either. Uh, so my motion is really calling on the provincial and the federal governments to start to come together with and start those discussions. They're going to be very long discussions that will have city staff plus federal government staff and the provincial staff coming together they can do that now and start that conversation. And those conversations can then continue under our new mayor when he or she comes on June 26th. I also just want to point out to council that yesterday, the federal government shut out the city of Toronto in their budget. Uh, this is a budget where they wanted to focus on growth. I appreciate that. Growth of our country is important. But the City of Toronto is very much still in the mode of recovery. We have costs that we are still burdened by to operate transit despite the decreased ridership that's happening. We have costs to protect our most vulnerable and our homeless. These are costs that have not gone away. They are costs that they committed to funding for us in their campaign promises. And I reminded them that in December, City Council brought a motion forward that said that in the event that the Government of Canada failed to honour its election commitment, Council direct the Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer to include the impact of the lack of this funding in the 2023 property tax notices. Those tax notices are being prepared on Friday, and the federal government has been given notice that they will be going out. I think it's um, important that I also recognize we've had many favourable discussions with Toronto MPs. They do recognise this need. I'm hopeful that they'll be able to rally, they'll be able to call on the finance minister to help Toronto. Toronto is the economic engine of Canada. If they want a successful Canada and they want successful growth, they have to make sure that Toronto is not left behind. I hope you'll all support my motion to call on the federal government in particular, as well as the provincial government to support Toronto. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, we'll recess for lunch and come back at two.
Hi, I'm Steve Clark, Ontario's Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and I want to extend to Francis Nunziata my sincere congratulations on this milestone in municipal service. 34 incredible years of service, whether it be as a school trustee, as a councillor in the city of York or mayor of York, now a city councillor and speaker since 2010, you have represented your constituents in an exemplary manner. On behalf of Premier Ford and our government, I want to extend... Hi, I'm Steve Clark, Ontario's Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and I want to extend to Francis Nunziata my sincere congratulations on this milestone in municipal service. 34 incredible years of service, whether it be as a school trustee, as a councillor in the city of York or mayor of York, now a city councillor and speaker.
Hi, I'm Steve Clark.
Members of Council, can I please have you take your seats? Members of Council and staff, if you can please take your seats. Okay, th th thank you. This meeting is now resumed. Members, we have two presentations this afternoon, and I would like to call upon Deputy Mayor McKelvey to speak. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor as Deputy Mayor to make a very special presentation to the longest serving member of Toronto City Council, our beloved speaker, Francis Nunziata. Yeah. Yeah, how many years? Uh, but before I begin, I would like to introduce a congratulatory video from Ontario's Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Honourable Steve Clark. Hi, I'm Steve Clark, Ontario's Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And I want to extend to Francis Nunziata my Thanks, sincere Francis. congratulations <laughs> on this milestone in municipal service. 34 incredible years of service, whether it be as a school trustee, as a councillor in the city of York or mayor of York, now a city councillor and speaker since 2010, you have represented your constituents in an exemplary manner. On behalf of Premier Ford and our government, I want to extend to you all our sincere best wishes. This is an incredible milestone. Uh, you know, people said that I was a young mayor back uh, when I was first elected. Francis, you're a pretty young mayor too. All the best. Well, whatever he said, it was good. Yeah, you're right. Where's the money? Okay, let's do the other presentation. Well, while we're sorting out the technical difficulties, I'll move forward to the next one, which is also an exciting one. As co-champion of the Women for Climate Initiative, I am thrilled to be here to celebrate the exceptional impact of this program. Women for Climate demonstrates Toronto's commitment to both female entrepreneurship and taking action against climate change. I am so privileged to uh, co-champion this alongside our wonderful CFO, Heather Taylor. And when I went to Copen Copenhagen for the C40, summit, uh, Heather pointed out that this initiative was there and that Toronto needed to sign on and she certainly was right and is doing great things with this program. Uh, Women for Climate demonstrates Toronto's commitment to both female entrepreneurship and taking action against climate change. This program not only provides women with the mentoring and training to take their projects to the next level, it is also helping the city. It's helping the city too meet our Transform TO goals, support our resilience strategy, improve Toronto's long-term waste management, and advance our ravine strategy. Over the course of the program, women are matched with mentors who have strong expertise in a variety of fields. Many of these mentors are members of our exceptional public service here at City Hall. 2023 marks our third cohort of Women for Climate TO. Tonight, our mentees will have the opportunity to meet in person for the first time. And I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize them and share a bit more about their projects. Amy Castador, her project is Carbon Conversations, TO. Her workshops equip individuals to make lifestyle changes, build community, and take collective action to effectively cope with climate distress. Anna Kurasuno is Splash on Earth, a community building event and competition that engages participants in environmental action through art and games. Angie Buato, is building residents' capacity for textile waste reduction, and she engages local residents in reducing textile waste through educational workshops, training on clothing alteration and repair, and organizing clothing donation and swap events. Cara DeGrand is with CD Farm, and they encourage Ontarians to adopt sustainable gardening practices by selling non-invasive, organic, locally grown plants from a, lar from a low waste startup that uses environmentally friendly, low emission practices. Elise Gassner is with us here today. 
Where is Elise? There you go. Hello, Elise. And uh, her project hashtag Where Does Your Rain Go poster essay contest aimed is aimed at raising awareness among middle school and high school students about the benefits and applications of going green and about green infrastructure such as permeable surfaces and stormwater management. Julia Morgan, also here, hello Julia, is with Toronto Home Retrofits, a nonprofit organization providing community-based retrofit coordination services to homeowners in an effort to rapidly and equitably increase the pace of home retrofits across Toronto. Lisa Chen with Oceanic Impact, a social enterprise aimed at making a positive impact on waterways through projects such as the Marine Way platform for reporting lost fishing gear and aquatic animal entanglements and debris mine, a gamification geocaching platform for waterways that attaches monetary value to garbage, empowering communities to keep their shorelines clean. Natalie Duncan, also here with us today. Hello, Natalie. Is, uh, has an AI-enabled urban insect farms, precision agriculture for urban insect farms, uh, using AI-enabled technology to sustainably produce nutritious alternative protein foods while reducing food miles and reusing waste heat from facilities to offset GHG emissions. Nikki Sesta is with the Water Wastewater Plan Foundation. It's outdoor events, eco trips, and environmental campaigns foster waste education sorry, foster waste education, nature reconnection, and conservation-based solutions that generate measurable, positive, and equitable socio-environmental impacts. Priya Patel is with Earth Analytics, and they're using machine learning and satellite remote sensing data to develop models that can inform urban planning decisions and help build healthier communities. And Tina Safe is with PAC Solutions, a platform for personal carbon footprint management. I'd also like to take a minute to thank the mentors participating in the program, including Mary Cochran, Sunali Swamathan, Amber Nasrula, Omea Boteg, Giselle de Grandis, Susanna Voss, Shatha Quash Clavering, Selena Young, and Nancy Rasika. Thank you to them for sharing their knowledge and providing guidance to the mentees. I really look forward to seeing the mentees projects develop in advance of the final pitch competition that will be taking place in June. Please join me in thanking and recognizing all involved and I ask the ladies joining us to please stand up. Okay, do we have sound? We're ready? Okay, let's try this again. All right, it is my honor as Deputy Mayor to make a special presentation, longest serving member of Toronto City Council, our beloved speaker, Francis Nunziata. And before I begin, here is a congratulatory message from Ontario's Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Honorable Steve Clark. Hi, I'm Steve Clark, Ontario's Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and I want to extend to Francis Nunziata my... Hi, I'm Steve Clark, Ontario's Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and I want to extend to Francis Nunziata my sincere congratulations on this milestone in municipal service. 34 incredible years of service, whether it be as a school trustee, as a councillor in the city of York or mayor of York, now a city councillor and speaker since 2010, you have represented your constituents in an exemplary manner. On behalf of Premier Ford and our government, I want to extend to you all our sincere best wishes. This is an incredible milestone. Uh, you know, people said that I was a young mayor back uh, when I was first elected. Francis, you're a pretty young mayor too. All the best. Councillor Nunziata has a sorry. Councillor Nunziata has a long and storied political career marked by its distinction and professionalism. Councillor Nunziata was first elected as councillor for the city of York and later took on the role of mayor from 1994 to 1997. Frances has been serving her community for decades. She has been re-elected to Toronto City Council on consecutive terms dating back to 1998. I want to take a moment to recognize some of the highlights of Councillor Nunziata's political career, which include successfully advocating for a George Brown College campus in Ward 5, working with the province to negotiate a UP Express stop in Weston, uncovering corrup corruption in the former city of York, introducing and supporting new business in Ward 5, tirelessly working with local BIAs and residents organizations to advance the needs of the community, 
advocating for more affordable housing, spearheading the move towards bringing management of TCHC buildings in-house, as well as her service on many boards and commissions, including the Toronto Police Services Board and Board of Directors of Toronto Community Housing. Councillor Nunziata is a true political heavyweight. Her integrity, sensibility, compassion, and political instincts have earned her the deepest respect of her constituents and council colleagues alike. As Mayor of York, she demonstrated her ability to achieve the highest level of municipal success. And in the process has inspired women across the city, myself included, to run for office, reminding us that we too belong in political office. As Speaker of this Council, she has the unenviable job of establishing order, and for many of us here today, we know how challenging that job can be. Her steady and occasionally stern hand has always kept this Council focused. Her leadership as Speaker has enabled all of us to effectively push policies through and get things done for the City of Toronto. Councillor Francis Nunziata, thank you for all you do. Thank you for being an amazing person, an amazing counselor, and our friend. Your lifetime dedication to the public service has been nothing short of remarkable. Congratulations. This is truly a wonderful recognition of your dedication and service to our community. And I'd now like to present Councillor Nunziata with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing's Longstanding Service Recognition Certificate. As you know, I, I never speak for five minutes, right? Gosh. But I just wanted to just make a few comments and, and thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor McKelvey and to the minister. And um, I, I was um, first elected as a school board trustee in York in 1985, um, then was elected to city council in the York, uh, York City Council in 1988. Now in those days, we were called aldermen um, and so, I mean, that's really sexist. We were all aldermen. And, uh, and I was the only woman on council. Um, it was a boys club. And I was told over and over again by members of council that you don't belong here on council. You're a woman. It's just men. Um, and so for the period that I, that I represented as counselor, uh, then alderman, was I had a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties because it was uh, a total nightmare. Um, but in 1992, I was the whistleblower uh, for the city of York where there was municipal corruption in the former city of York where some councillors wanted to sell a park to build condos at Fairbank Park. And at that time, I did step up as the only woman on council and spoke up, I went to the police, I went to the Minister of Municipal Affairs that there was something wrong in the city of York, something dirty was happening in the city of York. After a two year investigation, it ended up that two councillors, two, one metro council and a developer went to jail. They were convicted for municipal corruption. Now, I proved them wrong. Women do have a place in politics because I stood up and that's, and, and you know, it just shows you that, um, you know, it was very difficult in those days as a woman to be in, in politics, but I proved my point that I was, um, I was very strong and I stood up against, against all of them. And they all ended up in jail. And then I ran for mayor in 1994. I became mayor, the first Italian mayor in the city of York. And, and then when we, then we amalgamated. And then what happened after we amalgamated, Mal Lastman was the first mayor of the new city of Toronto. And then we were called councillors at the time. And, 
But when we first amalgamated, we ended up having our council meetings at Metro Hall. Uh, because I, I believe at the time there was maybe 50 counselors at the time, short, close to 50 counselors. 58. Wow, 58 counselors. So we were Metro Hall, and in those days, um, we didn't have the appropriate equipment to vote. So I remember when Mal Lastman was the mayor, we had placards. If you were in support of a motion, yes. If you're against, no. That's how we had recorded votes. Can you imagine the challenges we had? Then we moved here to City Hall once all the renovations were done to accommodate all of us here. Um, then we all moved here to, to City Hall. Um, so I've, um, I've been through a lot in the last 35 years, 38 years as a school trustee, but I want to thank all my constituents in York Southwest and for their support that they have given me over the years. Uh, there's a lot of friendship, and we, I've been working with each individual, each of my constituents, and um, I know that with over the years and the number of elections that I have won, that they appreciate your support and they appreciate what you've done. But today I have here some um, residents from my ward that I'd like to acknowledge, Mary Constantino, Mary, and uh, the, uh, with the Western BIA, Surrey Wines, where are you, Weinberg? Uh, former MPP, Laura Albanese, uh, she's also a constituent of mine. Uh, former councillor, Cesar Palacio, he's also a constituent of mine. And uh, little Emma, she's the youngest voter, and, and Sue. And then also we have here, I'd like to acknowledge uh, former councillor, uh, Anna Bailau being here to support me. Thank you for that. But I just want to thank all members of council. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, how difficult it was, and it is still for women in politics, that I started at the very bottom. But, you know, common sense, women's intuition made me where I am today because it's women that are smart enough to figure out what's happening uh, behind and what's happening within the political scene. And I was able to do that. And I know Mike Cole was around there when I ran for mayor, and he was a tough, tough person when I ran for mayor. Um, he was also a Metro Council at the time, Mike Cole. Uh, so I want to thank all my constituents of York Southwest and Ward 5, and special thanks to all members of council that are here. This is really an honor for me to receive this award. Thank you. And I'm, a, yes, I ran bingos too, Mike. I ran a lot of bingos. So thank you very much, and thank you for everyone for attending. <coughs> Members, before, before the recess, I reviewed a number of urgent motions without notice to be added to the agenda. Uh, do we have 18 members that are present? Yeah. Okay, we'll be, we will put these motions on the screen. Councillor Bradford, do you have a motion? Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm looking to add this uh, add this to the agenda because it's time sensitive uh, these are dollars for uh, uh, parks parks project in Topham Park for the clubhouse improvements and they need to be allocated in order to meet the project bid timeline so this is from staff thank you on favor carry councillor Moyes Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. This is, uh, I won't call it an emergency motion, but uh, to add to the agenda here today, it's about a workplace health and safety issue in my office. As I mentioned to councillors, you know, there's 10 staff in my office, myself included is 11. 
and uh, we cannot accommodate everyone in the space as it is currently. So there are three touchdown spaces in the um, second floor, and currently my staff has been occupying that space for the last three plus months. And so I would like to hopefully make that permanent if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor, show of hands, carry. Councillor Carroll. Uh, th th this one actually is, oh, this is not the motion I wanted to introduce right now. I was going to introduce this later in the day. The motion that is urgent having to do with the uninsured in health care facilities is the one I wanted to, it's been submitted earlier. Do we have that motion? Okay, okay. then I have nothing to introduce at this time. Okay, thank you. Councillor Ainsley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe, if I can just see it on the screen. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is, uh, I'm introducing this. Uh, we, I'm receiving some money from Canadian Tires Jumpstart for a fully accessible uh, basketball courts in my ward. And uh, this needs to, the money needs to be spent, the work needs to be done um the spring so i'm introducing this motion thank you thank you on favor show of hands carry councillor malik um yes i believe there's a motion Um, this is an authorization to approve a development charge credit for the design and construction of the future park at 55 Lakeshore Boulevard East. And um, it's urgent because of the subdivision agreement with the developer that needs to be finalized before next council. Thank you. All in favor, show of hands, carried. Councillor Bravo, I understand uh, that you would like to reopen an item. Councillor Bravo. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, I'd like to move uh, to open the order paper to place a hold that I did not do earlier. Um, EX.8. Sorry. Um, amendment to delegation of authority for the endorsement of temporary liquor licenses. I have a motion I prepared with the help of staff. Okay, so first of all, we have to reopen the item. Thanks. So Councillor Bravo wants to open EX 3.8. On favor to reopen the item? Carrie. And you're going to hold the item? Councillor Bravo? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, at this, at this point, are there any release of holds? The clerk will open the speaker's list in CMP, and you can place your name on the list. Any release of holds? Okay. Um. Pasternak. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh Madam Speaker, I'd be prepared to release GG 2.11, and I believe staff have a motion. I understand that some councillors will not support this, so I'll ask for a recorded vote. Uh, GG 2.11. Award of a REBA document to CH2M Hill Canada Limited and Stantec Limited for the professional engineering services for phase five of the basement flooding protection program. Yes, yeah, so this. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, hold on, because this is here without a recommendation, right? So, Councillor Perks, you would like to hold it? Yeah. Okay, because it's here without a, a recommendation. I've shown this to the mayor's office. And staff okay, there. thank you. Councillor Bravo. Uh, yes, Speaker, I'd like to release CC 5.31. Um, it's a very long title. 
Okay, that's Bloor Street and Sterling Road, right? You want to yeah. just release it? Okay, CC 5.31, Councilor Bravo is releasing all in favor. Show of hands carried. Thank you. Councilor Sachs. Yes, sorry, I had to restart my computer. I was waving my arms. Um, I have another member's motion without notice. I've sent it, it was um, seconded by Councillor Perks. I've sent it to the center table. Um, it's the um, a preservation board item approved last week that I'd like to add to the end of the agenda. Yeah, okay, so once the staff gives it to us and then we'll go Thank through you. them. Okay, thanks. So members, before the recess, council was debating the deputy mayor's. No, it's not. Oh, okay. Sorry. Councillor Thompson. Um, thank you. One moment. Let me just go back to the item. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to release CC 5.21. It's the Golden Mile Secondary Plan. Okay. Councillor uh, Thompson is releasing CC 5.21. On favor, show of hands, carried. Now I see it on the computer. I guess uh, it, yeah, it was there before. I guess it's a little slow. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, members, before the recess, council was debating the deputy mayor's first key item, EX 3.2. We, we will return to that debate. We're going to speakers at the point, but before we get to that, uh, there was um, a point of order uh, prior to lunch and um, that uh, it, uh, on the a point of order from uh, Councillor Perks and Councillor Holidays um, and I agreed that I would rule on it uh, later in the day. So Councillor Perks questioned whether conducting campaign related scrums in the chamber is a violation of the use of corporate res resources policy. Councillor Holiday questioned whether the policy is currently in effect since the mayor's seat has not been declared vacant. My ruling is as follows. First, the use of corporate resources policy is not yet in effect since the seat has not been declared vacant. The nominations for office have not opened. The policy will be in effect once nominations open. Second, the policy does permit informal campaign related scrums in the public or common areas in City Hall and the civic centers. Having said that, scrums conducted in this chamber must not disturb the meeting. My advice to candidates for mayor and the media is to consider holding campaign related scrums in another public area of the building and not risk interfering with council's meeting here in the chambers. So that's my Hold ruling. On. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go back to speakers on the item. Councillor Matt Lowe to speak. Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm very concerned as I hope we all, all are, and I appreciate the Deputy uh, Mayor's candor earlier about the $46 billion pressure that we're facing over the next decade. But I must, remind, I must remind this chamber that this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who has sat in this chamber over the past few years. You know, we've had, um, I think it's fair to say, the last two mayors and their allies have been telling Torontonians that we've been on a pleasure cruise. But we've been on the Titanic. And we've had city managers tell us over and over and over again that we are facing an iceberg. And this council and the last two mayors have ignored that advice. I absolutely agree that we need a new deal with the other levels of government. Both the financial and the governance frameworks are not working for a mature 24th, 21st century city. And we need to renegotiate both the governance and financial arrangements so that Toronto can provide the services that Torontonians expect. But we also need to live in the real world. It's difficult, it is more difficult to go to the other levels of government and ask for bailouts when city council and its mayor doesn't take care of its own house. 
Meaning, ignoring advice to use revenue tools wisely. Ignoring advice to have a tax rate that recognizes the reality that we're facing, that roads are crumbling, that it's impossible to easily get your kid into a rec program without playing like the Olympic Games. Park bathrooms are broken and often closed. That the services and the infrastructure that we rely on are not doing well, and Trentonians know that. But they keep being told that things are fine and it's not real. So it's easier, I would submit, to go to the provincial and the federal governments and say, we need a better financial arrangement if we are seen to be taking care of our, home, our own house responsibly. Another example, when Toronto is spending billions of dollars on political projects, how do we be taken seriously by anybody? When Toronto chooses the more, more expensive choice for the gardener, rather than connecting the DVP and the rest of the gardener with the more fiscally responsible choice, the better urban planning choice, the choice that would provide more housing and bring in more revenue, it chooses the more expensive one. Hundreds of millions of dollars just going down the drain when we didn't need to do that. We could have made a better choice. Or spending $1.4 billion on the most expensive rebranding exercise in the history of the city, renaming a Go RER project Smart Track. It's true. What a ridiculous thing, just for a campaign ploy in 2014. You know, when we, when we want better revenue tools from the province, we also shouldn't allow ourselves to become the province's revenue tool for building their own transit projects. We can do better. I really believe we can do better. But we need to be honest and have an honest conversation with Trontonians about the revenue that we need we need to make wiser choices, not political projects, but best infrastructure projects based on evidence to make sure this city is moving and moving well. Then when we have housing projects that we actually get them done, there's not a single shovel in the ground on housing now. We've got to get real. We've just got to get real about the choices we make, like any household would. Like I think most of us, most Trontonians or anyone in this room, when you're struggling to figure out how to balance everything in your own household budget, you have to make difficult choices about what you don't really need, even if you'd like them. But also, when you do need to bring in more money, sometimes you just have to make choices about that too. And I know it's hard, and I know it's difficult, and I know it's not popular sometimes. Like Nobody wants to talk about taxes. Like, nobody wants to talk about uh, not rebuilding highways. But maybe we need to. Like, maybe that is the reality that we're facing. Ten seconds. And I would submit to you that we provide better representation and better leadership if we're honest with the people that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise in, in support of uh, the coming back to the present. Uh, I rise in support of the Deputy Mayor's motion. Um, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I applaud the one-two approach, the, uh, first making sure that the community deeply understands our financial situation. Um, I, I, I don't share my, my, my colleague's problem with us not being honest. I've been extremely honest in my ward. Uh, I, I'd hazard a guess there'd, there'd be no surprise in my ward to see a report like this. I've been very vocal about it been vocal about my favorite revenue tool, which one I think would solve the problem. Um, and I think the community is already coming there. I don't think they're completely in the dark, because I know this. I know that uh, um, when I just evoked the word sales tax in 2005, it made everybody go insane. Um, uh, I found myself being invited to, to come to national clubs and empire clubs and, and and, and explain what the hell I was talking about. Um, it doesn't happen anymore. We talk about it a lot. Uh, uh, the mayor talked about it in his campaign. Uh, we talked about it in this chamber in December. So I think the community is starting to realize 
This is, this is the real facts of the, of the matter in black and white. And the, um, the, the deputy mayor's motion, when I first looked at it, I, I was almost predisposed to see it as not going far enough. Because I have asked for a long time that we make it clear not just, today we're here for X number of dollars, for X purpose or Y purpose. Or today we are here because we'd like to have that icky old revenue tools conversation. That we deeply endeavor to make the, the other orders of government, particularly the provincial uh, right now because we're in, embroiled in a conversation with them, but really both understand that it's the funding model that is broken. That they're not understanding our model. By law, not being allowed to run a deficit on operating expenses, that's a matter of law. And they seem to forget it when we go one-on-one -on -one to, to MPs and MPPs. They go, well, you got, you got that stabilization reserve. What's that? They don't know what a stabilization reserve is because they don't need to have one. They have reserves for various matters. But a stabilization reserve that is designed for you to be able to make payroll, and if you're lucky to be able to eke out some savings in, in good times so that you can, you can cover off those paychecks because you're not allowed to overdraw your account to, in order to do so, that's what that's about. And they seem to have forgotten in recent years that that's what that's for. That we can't just blow it all this year because you don't feel like helping us cover the cost of COVID. We can't, and they don't seem to understand it anymore. They don't feel like covering the cost of 2022. They don't feel like it when, when we had Omicron for the first quarter. They don't feel like covering the, the, uh, the Delta variant in 2021 and what that did to our ridership. They haven't even covered off on all of the COVID expenses of 2020. And I believe it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what our books are telling you, what they mean. This report takes what the community is beginning to understand, which is why they were okay with that 7% property tax increase at a time when they too are struggling, but they understood what we need because they see it on the street. But we have to spell it out for these other orders of government. And we have to enter into that conversation about revenue tools again. Because if you want to talk to me about one that might earn us 10 million or 20 million, but costs us 12 million to implement, it's not going to get us really anywhere. That's certainly not going to buy us more than a year. And it'll take us two years to get to where it maybe buys us a year. What we need is a fundamental redesign of the formula. This all began with, with a, a report called Who Does What, resulting in all the downloading and the, the removal of operating. We need Who Does What Now and a redrawing of the formula, and a real big city ability to sustain ourselves. And we can't look to cities of two million fewer people than we have, and that's all we have to compare ourselves to in Canada. What sustains cities of three million or more? We need that now, but here in this document, deeply understand why we need it now. And I, I uh, applaud staff for drafting it. Thank you. Councillor Burnside. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, we can talk about tax rates and, and we can talk about revenue tools and we can talk about projects that some of us think are political and others don't. But as Councillor uh, Carroll mentioned, we need a new fiscal framework. Toronto is bearing the burden of so many responsibilities that are not only national, but provincial as well. And to, I have no problem going to my constituents and saying, I need to raise taxes, but it can't be an, a never-ending ask based on responsibilities that aren't municipal in nature. But Councillor Carroll made the best point in terms of the here and now of today, and it's our needs as a result of COVID and the serious problems we are facing in large part because the federal government will not step up to the plate. I want to re uh, read you a list of 25 names. Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, Judy Zerowich, Michael Koto, Han Dong, 
Rob Oliphant, Marco Mendicino, Yvonne Baker, Kirsty Duncan, James Maloney, Judy Segro, Arif Varani, Selma Zaid, Sean Chen, Bill Blair, Jean Yip, John McKay, Gary Anden Asangari, Kevin Vong, Marcy Len, Julie DeBruzen, Carolyn Bennett, Christian Freeland, Ali Asasi, Yara Sachs, and Ahmed Hussein. They all have one thing in common. They're all Liberal MPs. They all represent the City of Toronto. They represent every riding in the City of Toronto. I will say the exemptions are, exceptions are two independents who ran as Liberals, essentially. They're all sitting on their hands. It's time that our federal representatives, who are supposedly elected to represent Toronto, actually get off their hands and start fighting for the city they supposedly love. Thank you. Councillor Cheng to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to move a motion that City Council requests the City Manager to establish a program where members allegations to meet with members of parliament and members of provincial parliament to advocate for our budget issues. As a new city councillor, I have been shocked by the cliff, the iceberg, the sinking ship, whatever analogy you want to use. I can't believe that every year we have to go to the province and to our federal government begging to fill in holes. And I'm shocked that this is ongoing and there's no solution in sight. And so I think we need to do something different. Uh, and I fully support the message of our deputy mayor and I think we need to amplify it in a new and creative way. Lobbyists do it all the time. They go and they visit different levels of government. They visit them multiple times so that the, the message is clear of what they are trying to achieve. We really need a new fiscal framework. And so in order to achieve this, I, I we have to work together to educate our counterparts at the federal and provincial level. I completely agree with what Councillor Carroll said, that simply people don't understand what is happening in the City of Toronto. It is so easy to look from a distance with arms crossed and say, you guys need to cut this and cut that and find efficiencies, but we need to spell it out more clearly for them. Why are we having this gap? And we have complex needs. We are a very big city and we need to let them know that there is this huge growing $45 billion iceberg cliff sinking ship that is meeting us and we are going to sink. We are 20% of the GDP of Canada. Our economy in Toronto generates $364 billion. There is no reason why we should be in this situation. And if we are contributing so much money, our province and our federal government should recognize that a healthy, thriving Toronto means a healthy, thriving country and province. And so I look forward to the opportunity to go to Ottawa, to go to Queen's Park with a clear message with my fellow councillors. We need a new fiscal framework for a sustainable Toronto that will benefit both the province and the country. So I hope that you'll support this uh, motion and I believe that it will be the beginning of a concerted effort. This can't just be a one-time touch point, just like 
many of the lobbyists we encounter in our, uh, in our work, they come again and again and again, and we need to be persistent. This is not something we can just watch and wait. Uh, and I, I, I look forward to the report in July, but I'm, I'm worried because that's July. We're burning through our reserves with no plan and that is not okay. So this is one way that we can make a difference together. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cheng. I'm just going to Councillor Nunziata. Yes, thank you very much. And I will be supporting the report that we have before us. Thank you to staff. Thank you to the deputy mayor. Um, you know, the problem is, is that um, when um, we send out our property tax bill, um, complaints that we get from our constituents, even though it's provincial and federal, we get blamed for it because we send out the property tax, right? And constituents don't understand, you know, what's happening federally and provincially. And, you know, it's important that members of council, as uh, Councillor Burnside mentioned, the number of MPs that we do have in Toronto, that we reach out to them. The councillors reach out to them personally. I, one, my MP is a minister uh, in, in my, uh, in my uh, writing, and uh, that we express uh, the challenges and the concerns that we have. Now, it all started when we amalgamated in 1997. So the province, we amalgamated into one city and, and the province downloaded all the, um, uh, the services, downloaded TTC, downloaded housing, down. And at that time it was who, who does what? But what we were questioning who does who here because we, we were very confused on all the downloading, the province promised us that we would be, you know, that we would be compensated for the, uh, you know, for the services that are being downloaded to the municipality, but it never happened. And so since the amalgamation, we've been trying financially to get, uh, you know, compensated from uh, the two levels of government, but we haven't been able to do that. So it's really important and that we do speak to our MPs. And I think it's important as well that we sit down with the province and, and with the federal government. And we talk, we talk to them uh, about what our challenges are. And I'm sure they understand it because they do represent the city of Toronto, most of the MPs, they should understand that. And, and let's just make them understand how important it is for the city. If we have to increase property tax to make up the difference on the loss that we're getting from them, then we have to start blaming them for it and not taking the blame for it because we do get the blame from, uh, from our property tax. Constituents call us. They don't call their federal MP or the provincial MPP when the property tax goes out, right? So I think we need to do that. And um, I think we need to form um, some sort of uh, caucus and we speak directly um, to the, um, uh, the federal MPs and the provincial MPPs. But we've been talking about this since amalgamation and it was never, you know, we've never made whole. It's always been financially the province or the federal government on begging for financial support um, every year. And it's been going on since amalgamation. And we, we need to sit down and we need to talk on, we need, we need uh, permanent funding from them. And either that or we upload some of the services that they downloaded to us. They should take responsibility, TTC and housing. Maybe we should upload those services as well. So that's my, that's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Bravo. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. This is so real for us today in this chamber because I know that we're going to be talking about the tragic death of Gabriel Magaliais, um, the loss of a child, the death of a child is, is tragic and I hope it's the tipping point. Um, the TTC, it happened on TTC and it's just a microcosm of what's happening in the general society. Um, th there's random violence, but remember also that violence against women increased so dramatically during the pandemic and it's the one persistence kind of violence that never, never lessens. And so uh, for 30 years, 
30 years ago, the federal government got out of investing in affordable housing. We haven't had co-ops, affordable rental. That Paul Martin budget really hurt. It really hurt the city of Toronto. Today, we're talking about how the city of Toronto has to absorb the cost of sheltering uh, refugees. It's important to provide shelter for refugees, but that shouldn't be a municipal responsibility alone. Um, from housing all the way to the high cost of cell phone and internet, which has become a lifeline for so many people, these are areas of federal jurisdiction and responsibility, and have to, they have to be accountable. Every single member of parliament in the city of Toronto is a member of the governing party. They are in government, and they need to be responsive to the citizens of this city. The provincial government, of course, uh, passing on the responsibility and the download for social services and social housing. And when uh, the premier stands up and says how unacceptable uh, the murder of a child is, I hope he remembers that until 1995, half of the operational costs of the Toronto Transit Commission were borne by the province. So this is a city that does the best it can to grapple with the social and economic issues that are created by policy and funding decisions that are taken in other orders of government. And uh, I am going to support the report, and I do thank staff, and I think that we do have to work together looking ahead to make sure that as we grapple with this financial crisis that we're doing it in a way that thinks about equity, investing in the things that actually keep people safe, that prevent violence, and listen to the mother of Gabriel Magalhães, who said, please focus on supports, mental health supports, uh, attending to homelessness, um, and, and that we take that direction, because I've never heard so much moral fortitude and solidarity encompassed in one person as, a, as in that mother. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Sachs. Hello, Councillor Sachs, are you here? Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I have four motions. If I could ask the clerks to, I guess I present them to ask the clerks to put them up. Uh, they're wordy, so I won't go through them, but I wanted to offer a few comments. Um, to say uh, this is not an important debate is wrong. I mean, it's an understatement about how important it is. Uh, we're talking about $46 billion. That's with a B, not an M. A B. A thousand times that other number. The number that stands out to me, though, and many of the numbers in this report, is the CAGR, the growth rate. It's 2%. And what it's telling us is that council has been busy growing government at a rate 2% faster than we can ever take in revenue to try to feed the machinery. We're in a structural situation here where we are spending more than we have, more than we can get from debt, more than we can reasonably prospect from property taxes. How do you get out of that? I keep hearing lamenting, ah, oh, the federal government, uh, the provincial government, they need to give us more money. Somebody else has to do it. We need to raise taxes. We need to find other taxes. There's an old, there's an old saying. See the hands pointing over here? <laughs> the hands pointing to everyone else that is responsible for these issues. So you, just, you have to roll over the hand and you have to see there's three fingers pointing back back at council. So I ask council to look in the mirror before you go and point to others to say, bail us out. So there's four motions before you. The first is a very simple one. It asks that when we consider future council reports, just as the CFO talked about, there's different layers of priority. There's things that are related to health and safety. There's things that are legislative. And there's things that are service levels that council chooses. We should be clear about which of those are as we, as we cast a vote. Another motion asks us to take a look at the $1.1 billion that has come up several times 
in reports to council, including the budget and including this report. It's $1.1 billion in services that could be extensions of federal and provincial responsibilities, yet council is quick to go in and insert those service levels. Maybe that is the fabric of what it is that we need to talk to other orders of government about. Finally, there's a motion that asks us in this long-term plan that's coming back to us to take a good look at our service levels. Because there's more to this equation than just the incoming money. It's part of the outgoing money that we spend. And finally, the provincial auditor or the, or the province is sending a third party auditor to the City of Toronto to look at the finances with respect to Bill 23. My idea is quite simple. Let's ask the province if we are in this discussion with them about finances and financing us, send your auditor here. Take a look at what it is that we do and what our books say. If you've got ideas about how we can save money or do this differently, we should be there to listen. We should be willing partners in that exercise. And that's not a slight on our own Auditor General. Her and her team does fantastic work, but she only has so much bandwidth and resources to look at different things. Let's invite others in to have a look. We could use the help. I hope that Council will support this idea and that an Auditor would be welcome in here to take a look and give us ideas about what we can do better. As I said, this is an, as much an outward looking point, as part of the debate is, as an inward looking one. This report, troubling actually, says we should receive it for information. I don't believe that. I believe that Council should be taking action that we should have already started. We should be asking ourselves questions about everything we do. Why is it that we do it? Who are we serving? What is the service level that people are asking of us? And if we're doing the work of other orders of government, voluntarily, how could we possibly expect them to show up with the money if we're taking care of it ourselves? Ask yourself those questions as you go through all of the financial planning exercises. This is vital for the future of our city, and it is the core of what we do as council. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I thought there were questions, but I guess they took their no, names off. No, I decided off. I wouldn't learn anything. Okay. You didn't want to debate? Um, debate. Councillor Sachs, are you around? You had your name to, to speak. Sorry, it's okay. Okay, thank you. Councillor Peruzza to speak. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, speaker, as I sat here and I listened to the conversation, uh, and um, uh, I listened to the comments from Councillor Chang, I just thought to myself, you know what, for a new person, she gets it. It's amazing. I'd like to see where she, what she's going to get like 10 years from now, seriously, and I'm on a, a serious note, because I've seen a lot of this over the years. I've had an opportunity to have a number of years to see a lot of it. And, and, and quite frankly, she basically hit the nail on the head. What we are forced to do each and every year is beg the province and the federal government, lately, mostly earlier on, was always the province, for money. Every single year, that I have been around, that has always been the case. That's the problem. If you eliminated everything else, as, as Councillor Holliday just suggested, take away all of the stuff that you don't think you should be doing, yet still have to go begging because they chisel you on the asphalt on the roads. You'd be short. That's what they would do. Why? Because they can. Because they can. 
That's the problem. Because they can. You can raise the property taxes to the gazoo. Vacancy tax, hotel tax, parking tax, uh, fee and charges and permits and, and fines, all of it. And you'll still go begging. Why? Because they can. It's the nature of the relationship that we have with the provincial government. In 1997, they downloaded MTHA, the Metro Toronto Housing Authority portfolio, to the newly amalgamated city of Toronto. I remember the cry of exhilaration from the Toronto Council of the day. We welcome the housing because we are going to be able to do it better. Did we do it better? I think not. Why? Because we don't have the ability to do better in those areas. We have never had that ability to do better in those areas. I remember the first briefing I ever got from a fellow named Terry Russell, who was the Deputy Minister of Revenue at the provincial government, had delivered seven budgets, number with the Tories, number with the Liberals in government. First night on the job, he found me in my office, came in and wanted to get to know me, and he said to me, Anthony, you folks are in the perfect position to deal with the albatross around the provincial government's neck, and that's our housing problem. Not the conservatives, not the liberals have ever been able to deal with it, but you folks can. That's the stone that will sink the ship. Imagine at the provincial level saying that. What do you think it's done to the city of Toronto? It's not to say that we shouldn't do it. But it added some half a billion dollars, according to our staff, I think it's considerably more than that, to that every year, 26 years of that, that's like 15 billion plus that you couldn't afford, that you never had the ability or the revenues or the access ten, to monies ten, ten for. Seconds. And that list is repeat it over and over and over again. What we need, Madam Speaker, is a fundamental well, realignment th thank you. in relationship thank you. with the thank province. You. Thank you. Councillor Perks to speak. Members, every once in a while, Councillor Holliday moves a motion or two or three or four or 12 to help focus the mind. And he's done that for us again today. Let's just take a look at some of the suggestions he's made. He said, why don't we do a review of all of the services that we have at the City of Toronto to see which are legislated, which are health and safety, which are council mandated. This is what we call a core service review and we did it and we did it and not only did we do it we got advice back from a third party consultant that 95 percent of the things that we do are core services another thing that is always in my mind about councillor holiday's work here is is absolute insistence that we listen to the auditor general and the Auditor General reviewed the core service review and found that it was a tremendous waste of money. It's a tremendous waste of money. That, that the amount of money we paid out to consultants far exceeded any value to the public. That's always worth remembering. Also, he has a motion in front of us that we ask the provincial government to audit our work. And I, I find that quite interesting because one of the lively discussions that we've had in this council chamber is local democracy. 
And whether it's right for the provincial government to arbitrarily cut the size of council, whether it's right for the provincial government to make a private deal that gives special powers to the mayor, and now why not put them in charge of reviewing our finances? Not just on the promise that they made to make us whole for a cut they made to our revenue, but to look at everything. It's almost as if the answer seems to be that somebody named Ford has to find efficiencies. And the previous one couldn't do it, so why don't we get another one to do it? It failed before, but hey, why not try it again? And Councillor Holliday in, in his speeches on his motions also admonishes us, admonishes us for spending money on things we can't afford to do. Things, for example, like deciding against staff advice to bury a light rail line along Eglinton, or against staff advice to have city forces collect leaves from people's lawns in Etobicoke. I mean, my goodness, the profligate spending, the lack of respect for the taxpayer, the, the absolute abandon which public money has just shoveled out the door for the benefit of some constituents. It, it just boggles the mind. I would suggest to you, members, that instead of supporting these motions, we do everything in our power to do what Deputy Mayor McKelvey has recommended, what Councillor Chang has recommended, what the city manager has recommended, and we make it plain to people elected at other orders of government that we are actually the most responsible steward of public funds, that we have the most transparent budgeting process. And yes, and yes, we have too many times voted against advice from city staff to deal with the long-term financial plan. I remember an instance, for example, when I attempted to get the city manager's report on the long-term financial plan brought to the floor of council for debate. Unfortunately, the mayor of the day, the deputy mayor, Holiday, and others voted against doing that. Many of us have been saying for years, for years, that there is a structural problem in how the city of Toronto is funded compared to the responsibilities we have in law. And too often, too often, members of this council who want to pretend that we can deliver leaf pickup or underground subways or other things like that within our own resources have refused to have the debate. That conservative claim that the problem is always taxes, that the, the problem is always efficiencies, never understanding that the people of Toronto want to be able to get on a bus that isn't overcrowded, want to be able to go to a park that isn't overflowing with garbage, Ten want to make seconds. sure that their neighbours and their children have access to affordable housing. These are the things our constituents demand of us, not that we do silly exercises over and over and over again to prove a fraudulent claim that this problem is on the spending side. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak to speak. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. In the Supreme Court case of Toronto versus the Ontario General of Ontario, we took the province to court over the reduction of council by about 40%. And we all know what that was like and the consequences of it. But you know, when you look through the ruling and some of the comments by some of these judges, I think this is the sentence that puts us in the corner. And I quote, the text of our constitution makes clear that municipal institutions lack constitutional status, leaving no open question of constitutional interpretation to be addressed, and accordingly, no role to be played by the unwritten principles. And I think that was the telltale line that put cities uh, in their place. You know, during the time that uh, Ottawa was saying that the cupboard was bare, uh, they announced buying uh, F-35 fighter jets for $14.2 billion and did a bailout of the airlines of $75.9 million so that people can get their claims paid for lost luggage, for inconvenience, for sitting on a plane too long, for, for having their flight cancelled. 
And I think it's unfair to say that we haven't done our job here. I think it's important to remember that during the tolls debate, this council finally had a majority of councillors that were willing to put tolls on both the Don Valley Parkway and, and of course, uh, the Gardner. And you know what happened? It was our regional municipalities, Vaughan, Mississauga, Ajax, Pickering, which coalesced against that and put enormous pressure on, on the provincial governments of the day, and, and uh, Kathleen Wynne could have stood up to it, that canceled uh, the promise uh, that we could put tolls. And to start, although there would have been a licensing agreement to set up the infrastructure for that, to start at $2 a toll, it was estimated to bring in about $175 million. Back to the casino debate, and we, we were mostly against the downtown mega, mega cas casino, uh, we were offered, the City of Toronto was offered a $40 million hosting fee. And um, when that was announced, uh, a number of the municipalities that had casinos, such as Ottawa, uh, Niagara Falls, Windsor, objected strenuously because they got hosting fees that were more around $10 million. And the government of the day, once in Kathleen Wynne, reneged on the $40 million promise and said that you're only going to get about $10 million. Now, when it comes to downloading, there's another policy aspect that we have to look at. And I've mentioned this one before in this council chamber. When you drive to Fort, from Fort Erie to Toronto on the QEW, you're passing a number of different municipalities such as St. Catharines, Grimsby, Burlington, and Hamilton. And they get a fully funded QEW uh, through their municipalities to service their residents. As soon as that same, that exact same highway hits the city of Toronto at the 427, it becomes a municipal road. Now, that has cost us hundreds of millions of dollars over the year. Now, what kind of log logic is that, that you can drive from Fort Erie to the 427, and it's a provincially funded QEW highway, and then when you hit Toronto, it becomes a municipal road? What kind of government, what kind of logic is that? I think the only way forward is to look both inside uh, our budgetary process as well as send a stronger message to our both provincial and federal counterparts. I support Lily Chang in going up to Ottawa and speaking directly with our Toronto MPs, making sure that they fully understand what we're up against. Look, I was at Queen's Park as a, a guest to, uh, for a question period a couple of weeks ago, and I managed to, to chit-chat with at least one MPP. And they really have no idea of what's going on uh, just down the road from them. Uh, they're, they're not getting the message. They don't understand the seriousness of it, and they don't understand how this is affecting, negatively affecting uh, their own residents. And if you don't think the cuts are happening now, just look at our capital plan and look at the delayed projects that are in there. Look at your streets. Look at the graffiti that's now going on murals. Look at the violence in our subway system. If we continue to do this, when we continue to uh, let the city deteriorate to this degree, we will not recognize Toronto as we have in the past. And we're going to be in bigger trouble than we are now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher to speak. Yes, I did send a motion to uh, the centre table, and I apologize profusely that it was sent late. Um, very quick motion. Well, uh, yeah, so, I mean, you, you have to send it in advance. Do, do we have oh. the... They just received it. Yes. Um, I want to remind members of council, if you're going to move a motion, you need to do that in advance of speaking. Well, it so did. the staff have an opportunity to draft up the motion. Those are the rules. It was not very far in advance, and I apologize. So I'll just speak to what it is. No, you and have to. If pardon me? If you're presenting a motion, then you're going to have to. I'm sorry? can't hear you, Speaker. If you're, if you're presenting a motion, then you have to wait until the motion is okay, ready. Okay, thank you. It's okay. very short, sweet, yeah. to the point. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Crawford. Councillor Crawford, uh, to speak. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank everybody uh, for their, their comments today. Um, this is a good report. This is a very important report that we have before us. It's only half 
uh, part of uh, the long term financial plan that's going to be coming, but it's a good report. What it does, it illustrates the anticipated fiscal pressures of the city of Toronto over the next 10 years. It lays out those fiscal pressures very simply, very succinctly, but also very starkly. And I think that's an important context of, of the decisions we'll have to make as we move forward. Um, it uses the 2020, as the uh, CFO mentioned, it uses the 2023 budget as a base for moving forward. Uh, and it includes operating and capital pressures. We haven't seen that in reports coming to us before, and that's an important distinction. Um, and it outlines the $45.6 billion uh, beyond what we have already planned for and, and what we do today with the operating and capital. Um, in in Cap capital, it's Cap all the below. Hello, Councillor Crawford, do you have a motion? Yes. I apologize. Yes, I have a motion. I didn't get it uh, back okay, from Can the you please move it? And Councillor Peruzza, I could... Okay, please. Okay, I want to move that city councils. Sorry, that city council support the deputy mayor until the mayor of by election honor and advocacy to the federal and provincial governments for revenue tools and a new fiscal framework for the city of Toronto. What this report does, well, what it does, it doesn't do, it doesn't offer solutions and it shouldn't be offering solutions right now as much as we would like to do that. What it will be doing is informing the long-term financial plan that we're expecting in July. And I think that'll be a very pertinent, important discussion for council to be having. <clears throat> what this report does is more importantly, it leverages the discussions with other levels of governments on a new fiscal framework for municipalities to provide predictable long-term funding to address the ongoing fiscal challenges of the city. I think we all agree on that. And I think we have to be united as a council as we move forward on that, because I think that's going to be one of the most important parts of getting out of this challenge we have. Now, the solutions, if it's not focused on solutions um, that aren't clear, but our challenges, it, what we can't fix with the our long-term financial plan is, is property tax increases uh, or find uh, through efficiencies and cutting service. That $46.5 billion is just far too great. The solutions will have to be multifaceted, and I think the uh, CFO was very clear on that. Um, we're going to have to make some difficult decisions. We make dif difficult decisions all the time, but I think when we see everything on the table with the long-term financial plan, we'll get a better sense of what those are. And I said it's not just about raising taxes or reducing service is at all. We need to put our best efforts and resolve these issues ourselves before we can look go to any of the other levels of government. We have been doing that very clearly over the last couple of years, recognizing the challenges that uh, COVID has faced us. Uh, but we have come to the table and we have shown that we can be fiscally prudent. We can look at making the savings that we have to do and the cost recovery that we have to do to move forward. That's going to be a key component, I believe, when we're looking at uh, those conversations with the other two levels of government. They're going to be looking for us to do our part first, and I, I'm confident that we have been doing that. Um, I will be supporting, just wanted to, to finish off with uh, some of the motions that um, are coming up. I will be supporting, of course, uh, Council McKelvey's motion, my motion, um, and uh, Council of Holidays motion supporting 4A, 4B, 4D, but I won't be supporting 4C um, because it opens up uh, the doors to a fulsome audit by the city, and I think it just muddles the waters. It's not important. Um, and I won't be supporting uh, Councillor Cheng's motion. I understand the sentiment in that. I'm not too sure whether or not it's the city manager's purview to be doing this. This is really something that the mayor or deputy mayor's responsibility to. And I, I do have my full confidence in the deputy mayor's office. So as much as I understand the sentiment, I think our best efforts and challenges would be going towards that. So on that, I want to uh, thank everybody and appreciate the time to chat. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, point of order. Yes, thank you, Speaker. May I request a recorded vote on the amendments from Councillor Crawford and Deputy Mayor McKelvey, please. All right. Uh, do we have... Um, Councillor Fletcher, your motion is ready. Go ahead. Just waiting. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Speaker. And my apologies to the centre table for sending that in late. But I really was um, moved by Councillor Cheng 
who right now I don't even know what time it is in the middle of the night. It's very late, so thank you for being here with us, Councillor, for this really critical debate and giving us, as Councillor uh, Peruzza said, wow, there's a fresh look and reminding us how people get their business done. Right now, our chairs are all turned in looking at one another, whereas what Councillor Chang said, turn your chairs out Look at those MPs and MPPs that serve the city of Toronto. They're elected by the same constituents. Do they have our interests? Are they battling for C our Councilor city? Councillor Fletcher, Oh, I'm not. sorry, there's my motion. Hey, there it is right there. I would like the city manager and the CFO to create the appropriate information packages for councillors who wish to discuss city needs, financial needs, with Toronto members of parliament, members of provincial parliament. So just as when we get people coming to our office with an ask, we have those kinds of materials that are polished, professional, easy to understand, and clear, should we wish to do that. And Councillor Cheng, I want to say you're very good at organizing everything. You've got all the food organized here. You've got everything that you put your hands on happens. So I'm happy to help you, and I'm sure others are, to actually go and speak to these members with clear information to say, here are our, here's what happened in COVID. You live in the city of Toronto. You are elected from the city of Toronto. Everything we did during COVID kept you safe, kept your family safe, kept your constituents safe. And here's what it cost to keep your constituents safe. You're not elected from a different planet. You're elected from the same constituencies that we are in. And I think it's very important to understand those numbers. Why we had to rent hotels in order to stop a pandemic from spreading like wildfire in shelters. That was the right thing to do, but it cost a lot of money. And now we are in the hole because of pandemic. And all those employers who needed people to come to work for them, the first line workers during the pandemic, we had to keep them on transit. They had to be able to get to their jobs. Here's what it cost us to run an underfunded transit system, but with very little money in the fare box. These are the facts. We're not asking for the sky. We're asking these folks who represent the same people for whom we did all of this to take that into consideration and advocate for the same people we represent and for the city they represent. I just want to remind you again that in Toronto, we cannot run a deficit. We are not allowed to run a deficit. The province can run a deficit. The federal government can run a deficit. We know the city can't run a deficit. And someone, I think, I can't remember who spoke about the tolls, the City of Toronto Act, which gave us powers to bring money into the city, which we need badly. It was given to us by the McGuinty government. We tried to use it under the Wynn government, and it got taken away from us. Hundreds of millions of dollars removed. And I think it was uh, someone who said, I think it was Councillor Pasternak, you're driving on the Gardner, all of a sudden you're driving on a city road instead of a provincial road. How does that happen? It was downloaded. So we need to be able to pay for it. I really believe that these members that are sitting in the same seats as we are need help. They need help to advocate with their own other members of parliament and MPPs. Because when I went to speak about Bill 23 at the legislature, there were scripted questions. Don't you have a billion dollars? Aren't you sitting on a billion dollars of reserves? Don't you? Well, Unfortunately, the difference between operating and capital, I guess they didn't understand that. Yes, we have savings in order to keep the roads, keep our buildings up in a state of good repair. But those aren't monies that we're just dipping into all the time. The same as none of those people, none of those governments dip in to those kinds of dollars. So let's get at it. Councillor Cheng, I'm with you. Let's get that package and let's get up to educate our members of parliament and provincial parliament that we share constituents with. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so that's it for the speakers, and we'll uh, we'll um, start to vote. Now, Councillor Holiday asked for uh, a separate vote on the items. Okay, we have the motion. Screen. Okay, we have the, the motion by Deputy Mayor McKelvey. It's on the screen. Count, yes, Councillor Holiday is asked for it to be separate and recorded vote. So, so <clears throat> oh, just a whole motion. Okay. So, Councillor Thompson, you've asked for a recorded vote on this? Recorded vote. Councillor Fletcher, you are, it does not appear to us you received the vote, so would you state your vote, please? Thank you. Speaker, motion one carries. The vote is 22 to 1. Okay, our next motion. Okay, next motion is motion two. I Councillor Cheng, we put it on the screen. There it is. Recorded vote. Voting panel is now open, members. Councillor Chris Santa, your vote, please. Thank you. Speaker, the motion carries. The vote is 15 to 8. Motion on the screen.
Speaker, the motion carries. The vote is 13 to 10. Councillor Sachs, please. Motion 3B carries. The vote is 15 to 8. Next motion. Okay, motion 3C by Councillor um, Holliday, recorded vote. Motion 3C does not carry. The vote is 4 to 20. Next motion. Recorded vote. Councillor Bravo, please. Motion 3D does not carry. It loses on a tie, 12 votes aside. Motion by Councillor Crawford, recorded vote. Motion four carries. The vote is 23 to one.
A motion filed by Councillor Fletcher. On favor, show of hands, carry. Recorded. Councillor Thompson, it appears you have not received the vote. Could you state your vote, please? Uh, in, the affirmative. in the affirmative. Thank you, Speaker. Motion five carries unanimously. 24 in favor. Okay, that's it. Yeah, there's two, there's two. You know, Councillor Fletcher, you just keep getting, what is it, point of order or? What would you like to do? Well, I was given some faulty advice earlier and then some very good advice by the clerk at lunchtime in that I misheld CC 5.1, which simply declares the office of mayor vacant. So if you would indulge me, I will release that so the clerk has the time that he and our deputy elections clerk need to prepare everything for the okay, so you're releasing speaker. It. I'm sorry I made that mistake. Yeah, we were all wondering why you held well, it I'm down. Well, I'm just confessing, actually, yeah. that it was a mistake. Yeah. And I would like to release it now as asked by the clerk. Could I please do that quickly? So I am trying. If you will indulge, indulge me. Okay, just give me a minute because we have another item we have to do yes, first. Yes, thank you. You ready to do it? Okay. Okay, so on CC 5.1, Councillor Fletcher is releasing. On favor, show of hands, opposed if any, carried. Okay, it's been released. Okay. Dep Deputy Mayor McKelvey, you have a, a motion that you would like to introduce at this time. Thank you, if it could be displayed. Uh, oh, okay, thank you, sorry. Uh, I'm adding to the agenda without notice, uh, Provincial Municipal Bill 23 audit, it's the terms of reference and uh, they need to be uh, confirmed as soon as possible so this work can get underway. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Carroll, you have two motions that you would like to introduce? Yeah, if I, if I could start with the health care one, I don't think okay. it's controversial to, the, the other one might require a vote on adding to the agenda. The uninsured health care services one first. Okay, we'll get the staff to put it on the screen. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, um, um, this is... Uh, okay, just, hold on. Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Perks, please stop disrupting Council. 
I think they might be happy with this motion, so it's probably well, a good I, idea. I don't know. I have no idea when they're happy. Yes, okay. the Councillor Carroll will be permitted to add to the agenda. Okay, Councillor this Carroll. Is the, the, the motion that we're talking about is protecting access to health care for all Ontarians. And the reason for urgency is that the withholding of health care services for the uninsured within our province has already begun. It is happening in hospitals. It is happening at agencies at the behest of the province. And I think it's very important that we address it in this council today. So I don't think that one's controversial. Okay, on, on the motion to introduce on favor, show of hands, opposed to Penny Carriage. Your other motion, Councillor Carroll? Thank you, yes. Okay, and this is an update on alcohol and parks pilot. Um, and I'll just explain the reason for urgency. I believe there's some controversy about this. This is a, a recommendation, an outstanding report that date back, dates back to the uh, previous term of office. Council made a commitment that they would be willing to address and, and perhaps implement a pilot upon receiving a report in May of this year. And then they would proceed with a pilot this summer. It came to, to my attention through staff that if we wait to do that, and it would come to economic development, that's, that's why I'm the mover here. If we wait to do that, we would not be able to implement it because of the, the amendments to the bylaws regarding use of liquor in whatever spaces. And so um, what I'm putting on the, the table is a, an urgent motion that allows us to at least direct staff whether or not they want to have a pilot and then when the report comes in May, it could come with the bylaw amendments because they would not be wasting their time in drafting them. There will still be two decision points at which council can decide whether or not, in fact, they want to okay. embark upon a pilot Thank and in which wards. Th thank you. So recorded this vote. is a... Yes. Yes, I believe that's yeah. recorded. Recorded vote to introduce the motion. The motion carries, the vote is 19 to 5. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go. Okay, let's just try to get to our second item of business. We've just completed the first one. Let's try to start before we add more items since our next item the motion that we just voted on okay that's fine thank you councillor fletcher we will make sure that someone from board of health is here thank you yeah okay thank you yes right okay thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next item is EX 3.9, uh, Smart Track Stations Program, and it's the second item for the Deputy Mayor. If you have questions, please put your name on the screen. Are there any questions? No questions. Okay. 
Oh, we. Okay, Deputy Mayor McKelvey to speak first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank staff for bringing this update to us on the costs associated with uh, the project. Uh, we all want to see transit built, and we want to see transit built as soon as possible to get people to where they need to go. But we do know that there has been significant inflation, supply chain issues, labor shortages, and those are causing uh, our capital projects to increase everywhere. Uh, Smart Track is no exception, and we have seen in the report from Metrolinx that the project now has a $234 million in additional costs. We are asking the partners, uh, the province to come on side as a partner on this project. That is to join the federal government and the City of Toronto in funding this project. We gave a strong show for this at Executive Committee with it passing unanimously. I'm hoping that Council will now further that call to action to the province to fund Smart Track so that we can keep this project going. Should that funding from the province not come through, a report will be coming back to Council about the severe consequences of that and how we can continue to find a way to move forward. But let's cross our fingers, hope that those conversations we're having with the provincial government, which have been going well, they are at the table. We can continue to keep that going so that we can get uh, transit built faster. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks to speak. Um, Speaker, I submitted a motion to the clerk about 10 minutes ago. I haven't received confirmation yet on this item. Do we have uh, the motion? Nobody asked for any. Just give me a moment, please. Sure. No questions of staff? I went to that Councillor Cole and they, nobody put their name up. We're at speakers now. We're at speakers now. Okay, Councillor Perks, if you can give us a few minutes for the staff and I'll go to the next speaker. I can read it, it's one sentence long. We ask a question. Well, yeah, we'll go to Councillor Cheng and then we'll come back to you, okay, Councillor Perks? How, sure. Councillor Cheng to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and through the chair, I uh, am happy to support uh, this motion, and I, I feel it's very important that we keep expanding transit. I'm currently uh, in the country of Taiwan, in the city of Taipei, for the Smart City Act, and I am amazed. Uh, okay, they they built their just, first just subway. Councillor Cole, what is your point of order? My point of order, Councillor Burnside and I did not hear you say that uh, there's a chance for questions. Well, I did hear, I did say it, I said it three times, and the Deputy Mayor spoke. So I'm sorry, but I did say it three times. So we've got and, this and multi-billion dollar item we I, can't ask I, I a waited, question about. I waited two minutes for looking at the screen, and that's when we went to speakers, and the Deputy Mayor spoke. Multi-billion dollar. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, Councillor Cole. Okay. Okay, Councillor. No, we're at speakers now. This is the rules. Councillor Peruzza. Yeah. We're in the middle of a speaker. No, you have to. You have to follow. You have to follow procedure. Can Count. Councillor Peruzza, no, no, you can't. No. Councillor, let's have Councillor Cheng finish speaking. Councillor Cheng, if you want to continue. 
Sure. Okay. So uh, I'm currently I'm currently speaking from Taipei, Taiwan. I've been part of a, a delegation sent by the City of Toronto to the Smart City Expo, and uh, the MRT station, the MRT system here in Taipei. So they built their first subway in 1996. They now have six lines, 131 stations, world-class stations with bathrooms and nursing rooms and elevators, brightly lit uh, and with safety barriers. And where did this funding come from? Uh, the capital cost for construction came from their central government, so it did not come from the municipality. So any time that we can rally and advocate for our to support our transit, must do so. And every the clock is ticking. We are decades behind in our transit. So. Uh, I fully support approaching our provincial government to make up the gap so that we continue to expand our transit capacity here in the city of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks. We do have your motion. Okay. Uh, speaker, I would like to move that city council direct city staff to stop referring to any go transit project as smart track. I think that's self evident and that's all I had to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Matlow to speak. Wow. Um, well, I'm sorry, I have a question for the motion oh. by Councillor Perks. Councillor Cheng, you have three minutes to uh, ask a question on Councillor Perks's motion. Councillor Cheng? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. So, um, thank you for, great, thank you for this motion, Councillor Perks. Uh, I support it and I'm just wondering uh, if we could uh, make a friendly award that would uh, give a replacement name, or w are you suggesting that we just simply call it Go Transit Stations? Uh, thank you, Councillor Cheng. Uh, you raise an important issue. Uh, the fact of the matter is that these are not City of Toronto transit projects. These are provincial transit projects. Uh, Go stations are not... Uh, the responsibility of the City of Toronto. In fact, uh, when it was originally formed, GO Transit uh, was a branding exercise for Government of Ontario Transit, GO, G-O. So if the province of Ontario wants to build regional transit that benefits people throughout the GTA, they should build it, design it, and pay for it. And uh, we shouldn't get lost in suckering ourselves into paying for something that was just, frankly, a a branding exercise. We might as well call it, you know, the Tooth Fairy track or something like that. I'm happy to leave it as Go Transit. Thank. Okay. okay. So, is it? Can we just clarify that in the motion that it uh, to replace the the name Smart Track, just so that in the future, whenever the city is issuing documents uh, about this, that it there's a clear name and it's a standardized name. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, there, there are specific projects that are out there. There's the electrification of the Lakeshore line. There's the, the 
transits, the improvements to the transit station at Exhibition Place. There's the Lansdowne Station. These are all identifiable as specific locations uh, that the province wants to invest in in order to improve their regional uh, transit network. And if there's a report on one of them or any of them, they can brand them anything they want. They can call them the pink elephant as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I think that the important thing is to stop pretending that this has anything to do with a, a failed idea that was put into the public domain eight years ago. Okay, thank you. So I'm just trying to get, I, I'm just trying to get a uh, clarity for future communication so that we're all talking about the same thing. So could we call it Go Transit uh, Station Expansion? Okay, that was your last question, uh, Councillor Chang. Councillor Chang, I, I understand what you're trying to do, but here's the thing. The, the group of things we now call smart track um, are not grouped in any kind of logical way that has anything to do with delivering public transit to the people of Toronto. Renaming it as something else continues the fiction that somehow there's a group of things that are linked together uh, and when they just simply aren't. The province of Ontario has decisions to make about how best to invest in their GO network, okay. uh, whether electrification of certain lines is the priority, whether kiss and rides are the priority, okay. whether station upgrades are the priority, and continuing to treat them as a group thing when they were only ever uh, a vanity project or, a, or something like that gives credence to the idea that they're linked when they're not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Bravo, clarification of the motion, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Speaker. Sorry, I I'm speaker. I yes. just, I've had got a little gaggle going on to my right Count, here. Councillor Burnside, Councillor Peruzza, and Councillor Cole. Uh, uh, okay. I, in, in, in an effort, uh, thanks, Speaker, in an effort to help my colleague, Councillor Chang, I think that I would ask you if you would be willing to say um, that City Direct, City staff, to stop referring to any GO Transit project as Smart Track and instead call them provincial GO Transit projects. I think that's certainly in, 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 in the spirit of cooperation and, and helping people to get to yes, I'd be happy to uh, amend my motion to add the words uh, at the end uh, and instead refer to them as go transit projects. Provincial. I think provincial transit projects. Thank you. Provincial, go provincial transit, transit projects. projects. Yeah. Thank yep. you for your flexibility. That's me. Thank you. <laughs> that's me. I, I just think of myself as Gumby, right? I was once a little green blob of clay. But you can see what I can do today. Councillor Chang to speak. Councillor Chang? I already spoke. I, I already spoke. Perks, I spoke already. I think we were at Councillor Matlow, correct? Councillor Matlow? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so the exchange that you just saw between Councillor Perks and Councillor Bravo is a refreshing um, uh, example of a very honest um, naming and identifying of what we're discussing. Uh, what, what, is, what has been called Smart Track really uh, was a rebranding exercise of a Gar Go RER expansion project, a completely provincial project. And you know, if we're, if we're going to be very candid, what Smart Track was and is still was a 2014 campaign ploy when every candidate was under pressure to come up with some magical transit plan that would have a station next to everybody's home. The John Tory campaign for mayor came up with Smart Track. Like some advisors got, you know, strategists got, came up with this idea. Uh, let's call it smart, wait, something smart. Smart track, it's on a track. 
And what cities do we really want to emulate? Like New York or Lo London. London-style transit. And it's, wait, they don't like above-ground transit, those, those LRTs, right? Ford didn't like that. So it'll be like the London style, it'll be like a subway, even though it's largely above the ground. This is, uh, this is great. And we gotta come up with the colors and the brand and the name. And you know what, let's put it on lawn signs. Let's put it on lawn signs, that'll look good. And everyone will be convinced that everyone gets a station everywhere. 22 stations built in seven years with no upfront tax dollars to pay for it. Isn't that amazing? You don't even need to pay for it today. What happened, though, is that we do not have 22 stations. It's maybe five. And eight years later, seven years, I mean, we know that wasn't true either. And that whole upfront tax dollar thing, well, um, if you read today's agenda, you know that's not true either. In other words, it wasn't honest, it wasn't real, it didn't happen, it never should have been called Smart Track. It was a $1.4 billion rebranding exercise so that John Tory could win the mayoral election, and we literally are paying for that ploy today. So enough of that stuff. Like, enough of that stuff. Like, let's just stop paying, we're paying more money uh, to get less service for the residents of Scarborough on other transit projects that we didn't have to pay for because it was a provincially funded project to begin with. We're paying more money to bury an LRT on sections of Eglinton just because some people want to do that, even though it doesn't make sense. And now we're, we're possibly having to pay more money for stations. Do you know that we were, actually, um, Mike should know this, Josh Cole, his son, when he was a counselor, led our effort to convince the province to add a station to the Crosstown line at Oakwood, right? We didn't pay for that, the province did. So what are we doing? Like, why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep putting up our hand to be the main revenue tool for provincial transit projects? It doesn't make sense. You know, the, uh, the, the financial outlook debate that we just had was all about how we should be asking the provincial government to fund us for infrastructure projects. Why do we keep paying for theirs when they have more opportunity to bring in revenue and to be able to manifest these infrastructure projects. It doesn't make any sense. So I hope moving forward, and this is certainly what I'd like to see, and I believe what Trondonians want to see, let's make decisions based on evidence. Let's be honest about what it takes to pay for it. If it takes more than the money we have, we need to talk to Trondonians about that fact and ask them if they want to invest in it. And then if it's the right thing to do and if it's going to serve people well, we do it. When it's provincial projects, then we support provincial projects that make sense. And we expect that that level of government pay for it. But these campaign ploys just to get votes cost us money, and we can't keep doing that over and over again. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bravo to speak. So I'm going to support. Uh, Councillor Perk's motion uh, because of the confusion out there. Uh, I have constituents who think that there's a thing that's smart track that's separate from Go Transit expansion, and when they find out that it's the same, they get very disappointed. Uh, as irksome as it is that, as has been said before by Councillor Matlow and others, that we're, we're using municipal tax base dollars to pay for a project that is of provincial interest at a time in which we are cash strapped is it boggles the mind and it it really is um, it really is I think a, a legacy of a very bad decision making. Uh, however, I'm going to support the recommendation before us. Uh, Lansdowne Station uh, is important now because of all the land use planning decisions that have been made in association with a rapid transit uh, uh, zoning designation in my community. The buildings are coming up, the buildings are coming down, uh, thousands and thousands of people are gonna be added in that community, uh, relying on the notion that this is going to proceed. Um, 
I'm going to support it because I think it's important for the city, now that we have put out so much of our own tax dollars to, into a provincial project, are indemnified against the increases in costs. We have to protect the people of Toronto or we're going to be on the hook here. And so as much as it pains me to do it, I have to support this. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher to speak. Yes, thank you. Um, when I was first elected, I had a lot of people come and say, we have a GO station right at Girard and Carla. Why can't we get on that train? Why can't we get on that train? It makes sense. It's a fast train. shouldn't be difficult. Um, and so that's always been a long time yearning for people that live along the GO line to be able to access that to travel across the city and to have more stations. So the notion of using those stations uh, and getting access to get on the train was something that was brought and called Smart Track. We now see that that very ambitious plan for 22 stations is not realized, that we have five stations, and I do agree with you, Councillor Perks, I think that we shouldn't call them Smart Track stations. I think we need to have in those stations, because we can't stop now, there simply needs to be a plaque, like there are many places, that says this station was paid for by the City of Toronto. It's branded as a city station, not a smart track station. But it is the city's commitment that we made to pay for some stations. Now, I don't think we should pay for the overage. And why do I think we can shift the name? Because when we were here, we had something called the Downtown Relief Line. And Michael Thompson, Councillor Thompson is nodding his head. You were here for that. The TTC spent a tremendous amount of time. We had the whole uh, speaker, uh, wherever you are. Is there a speaker? Sorry, hold my time. Do we have one? We have lots of conversation. I'm just trying to uh, hear myself. I'll wait for you, speaker. Do you just stop that for a second? I think, and then there's conversations in the. The conversation. Right here, in front of you. The clerk. Correct. Quite loud with Councillor Burnside. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Fletcher. Okay, can we stop? If I can ask the clerk. Thank you, Speaker, because I think this is actually a very important point. And we do. I appreciate you being in the chair for this, that the downtown relief line was fully backed by this council and by the TTC. It was at 30%. It was, their shovel was ready to go in the ground, as you will remember. And that was from Danforth all the way through to Queen Street. At a certain point, the downtown relief line was no more. We now have the Ontario line. And that's fine. Things can be changed. So I'm urging that we no longer simply call our five little stations smart track stations because it's not the original plan. The original plan was not we're going to build five stations and pay for them. The original plan was called smart track, but it was using all of the GO Transit to piggyback stops for our residents. And that Carla and Girard one, that was a mainstay of the old Smart Track, the old GO Expansion, which by the way is still underway. GO Expansion is actually the correct name. The um, environmental assessment, it is all GO Expansion. The fourth rail is GO Expansion. We were just going to put some stations there. They were smart track stations. Just like we had a downtown relief line, we now have an Ontario line. We don't really have smart track stations. We have stations that we're funding because our residents want to get on a train that the provincial government runs, and we need to put something in the stations that says, we have contributed, we have paid for those stations. 
I think it's really important we name things as they are. Um, so I was disappointed when the downtown relief line, even though we had, that was a bad name, it was still ours, it got changed. This really isn't ours. Go Expansion has never been ours. The other thing that's still outstanding for Go Expansion and these five stations that we're going to contribute to, basically pay to, is the fundamental principle. And I want to remind everybody of this fundamental principle that we said was fundamental, was you could get on with the same fare. You weren't changing from a TTC fare to a provincial fare. Fair, fair, fares needed to be fair. And I don't believe we're at that stage yet. So when you got off at Main Station from the TTC and you got on to the GO system, you weren't paying twice. We have asked for that over and over and over again. So let's be happy to contribute to five stations for our residents because we made that commitment. We are not people who renege, but we're not paying all the escalation. But these are not the stations that were named to start. Let's stop pretending that this is a whole system. It's not. Let's have a sign happily paid for by the people of Toronto so you have access to the GO system. And I didn't make that motion, but I am going to support Councillor Perks, and I hope we will. It's misnamed at the moment doesn't exist like that now. Let's be honest, true. I don't mind paying for those. We made a commitment. But I do mind naming it after a program that actually doesn't really exist, nor did it meet our original requirements, which was fair equalization. So we haven't met all those things. Let's drop the pretense, call it what it is, pay for what we've agreed to, and be done with it. Councillor Prout, so to speak. Ah. He'll talk for your speech. How about that? Um, speaker, speaker, thank you so much. Um, speaker, I know, like, what do you say about this? It, it, uh, Words are hard to come on this uh, on this particular subject. I'll, I'll tell you why. For me, uh, you know, when it first uh, surfaced here uh, some eight plus years ago, uh, this program, I thought about it and I said to myself, "Hmm, Anthony, this this gets us into an area exclusively of provincial control." and provincial jurisdiction. Provincial control how? Well, GO is managed by GO, Government of Ontario, under, uh, you know, their, uh, 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 you know, not directly, but, you know, uh, we're under the Government of Ontario. That's why it's called GO Transit. Let's just say, I'm not going to waste any more time explaining that. I think it's clear enough. So. It was, so if the government of Ontario controls the fares, the government of Ontario controls the frequency, if government of Ontario controls the ridership experience, if the government of Ontario collects all the revenues, hmm, let me see here. Should we, as a city government, say to ourselves, let's go and spend a whole bunch of money on a program that is GO, Government of Ontario. Sat here for about 10 minutes or so, scratched the back of my head a bit, and then I said, no, nah, no, nah, I don't like this one. And quite frankly, I don't know how many votes we've had on this smart track business. Pick a number, 12, 10, 22, 32. I can tell you this, 
that unless I made a mistake on that day, I voted against this program each and every time. Why? It's because when I spent those 10 minutes back eight year plus years ago and scratched the back of my head and said, government of Ontario, mm, this is bad business for us. This is like a really, really bad deal. And in, in fact, it dovetails into the speech I was trying to finish earlier about, you know, our projected shortfalls. Why are we in the situation? Because, you know, the government of Ontario controls everything. And at the end of the day, we get into, and that's why I was speaking about the housing, we get into really, really bad deals with them. We get hosed, right? In fact, in fact, it's not like they even sit back at some point and say, and say, you know what, we should make the city of Toronto or city of Ottawa or whatever other city gets hosed as well. We should make them feel like, well, they're partners. So, you know, when prop them up a bit, right? Like we're getting it all right. We're taking it all. Let them at least feel like they got a little bit, right? So this was one of those deals for me that where we were just simply going into a big, big open pit, dropping a whole bunch of monies that we don't have and didn't have, and basically gave us no control. I know people talked about integration. I listened to the conversations, right? And, you know, uh, all of that. Oh, we got to integrate, we got to, you know, connect, we get to, you know, people get to use, okay, fine. There were some elements that maybe someone could make an argument with, right, uh, in favor. However, the motion today says this, look, there's, there's like this funding shortfall, we need to go to the problem, we need to figure out how it goes. And, and I'm looking at this and I say, you know what, we gotta support this. Even though I voted against this thing each and every time, like this is like, go and explore it because otherwise we get hosed even more, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a no brainer uh, to at least go see if they're gonna backstop some of this uh, e some of this increase or their shortfall, let's call it. Thank, thank you, Councillor um, So I'm going to support this, I think, maybe like for the very first time. Thank you. Uh, probably the last time, but... Um, thank you. Councillor Cole to speak. Yes, I, I wish uh, more people had listened to Councillor Prutz in the past. Uh, but I guess... Uh, there's never a better time than now to start listening to him. But anyways, uh, I, I just think that uh, what the smart track is part of a uh, endemic problem we have in Toronto in that we always have these proposals that come out of nowhere on the back of napkins uh, that the public falls in love with and uh, you could blame meritory or you could blame whatever, but the public buys into these things. And that's why politicians, uh, whether federal, provincial level, uh, municipal level, they, they basically put up these uh, very uh, costly, uh, untenable projects that make no financial sense. And then when you try and tell the public, what about people on the uh, 29? What about people on the 29 bus? Who's taking care of them? Oh, no, no, we're going to build you this Ontario line that's going to go from, uh, you know, I don't know where it starts anymore, way up there in uh, Scarborough somewhere. It's going to go down to Ontario Place. It's going to uh, go through uh, the exhibition, whatever. And uh, how much is it going to cost? Well, we don't know. We don't know. What kind of technology are we going to use? Oh, we don't know. We don't know. So everybody says, yeah, we love this Ontario line. But like Councillor Fletcher said, we had a very cost-effective Toronto solution called the relief line. But the public didn't want that. Oh, no, that's not fancy enough for us. Well, who's paying for it? You are. On your property taxes, on your rent. And that's what this smart track is all part of the same thing. Like. How many billions, and you're talking to a person who was pushing for a subway expansion when I was at the TTC back in the 90s. I thought, we need an Eglinton line. Uh, you know, we need some basic subway expansion. 
And I remember the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star was against that. Oh, it's going to cost too much money in 1990. And then Mike Harris came along and then really fixed it and buried everything after we wasted uh, five years and I don't know how many billion. But anyways, so now I'm saying this has gone overboard, this mania about capital transit infrastructure. Look at Councillor Matlow and I and our residents. Whoop, what we're going through, somebody calling about a sewer. I know that, I get uh, a backup sewer in Councillor Sachs's ward. But anyways, uh, so Councillor Matlow and what our residents have gone through for 12 years. And we asked for council support in bringing Metrolinx and all those people before council to answer some question. The majority of you voted against us bringing Metrolinx here to answer questions. And they're still unable to fix the boondoggle and egg. They don't know how to match the lines. They can't fix the sunken platforms at Young Street. Metrolinx, 12.8 billion. But people love these mega projects. But what about, God, what about these people on the 29? We better get back to basics, back to people who ride the buses every day, jam-packed. And these are not people who have the option of working from home. They got to go work in the factories. They got to go work in the restaurants. What about people riding the Eglinton bus every day? What about people riding the Queen Street streetcar or the King car? Oh, no, well, they're not important. We're going to build the relief line and tear up the middle of the, I mean, not the relief line, the uh, Ontario line tearing up the whole city. That's more important than the people riding the Queen Streetcar. So, you know, there's no way out of this quicksand quagmire that's been created with this so-called smart track, which is a real farce. It's a multi-billion dollar farce. And we have no way of getting out of it because we're going to be sued by, I don't know how many, five million bucks a month or something. That's why you should have listened to Councillor Prutza when he said, don't go for this smart track. Councillor Carroll to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. If I could just sort of bring us back to the report, <laughs> which is about a, a very, very specific thing. And, and we, we just finished a deba debate in which we talked about all of us should be able to advocate on behalf uh, of the city when we're meeting with any government member. So I, I think it's important to remember what the essence of this is. The essence of this report is when you decide to embark on a partnership project with an other order of government, and you're two very different types of governments, you get an agreement together, and by the time you're doing implementation, who knows what happens out there in the commodities market and so on and so forth, and con construction schedules and results of tenders, who should pay a contract overage? Well, I would submit that this is the essence of what we just debated for hours and hours and hours. We have a funding formula that is not built to absorb the unpredictables, the, sh the construction overages. I can only think of one time, one other time, where the province said, nuts to you, the whole thing is yours, we don't care how much over budget it goes. And that was when we as council went out on a ledge between 2010 and 2014, I think people know what was going on then, and, and ripped up a project that was, that was really well and truly on its way and said, we're going to do something else entirely, and we'll just do it all ourselves. So forget it, province. There was no partnership there at all. Uh, we simply walked away and said, we're doing our own thing out there in Scarborough. And they said, fine, you're on the hook for the whole thing, overages included. And that has now got, pardon the pun, once again, back on track. There is a project going on out there. The province is doing it. We, we envy transit systems all over the world, and, and nine times out of ten, we're envying systems where the partnership is clear, and who can pay for what, and the nature of each cost, and who is best suited to pay it, is worked out. And we keep coming back to this one thing on these partnership projects. If you, if you have no ability to take part in the healthy moments of our, our, our economy, 
no ability whatsoever because of your funding model, you are not best placed to cover construction overages on a partnership project. If you are an income tax based government and you may have good times, you may have those moments when you can completely replenish your capital program just because the economy is finally ticking over, you really are the better partner in this equation to look at co uh, construction overages. If that's a problem for you, if you don't want to part with all those income tax that are based on the economy, if there's a private partner in the equation, maybe it comes down to the terms that you were settled. But you don't, in the, in the argument over the project and the setting of the terms of reference, go to the poorest partner at the table and say, and all the unpredictables, you guys. And so here we are at that moment when we start to be able to quantify what those years later unpredictables are. It's 234 million. We're not the best partner to do it. That's all this report is about. Um, I, you know, if Councillor uh, Perks wants to rename it, I, I'm down with that. But let's remember what the report is about, because it really is one of those opportunities to demonstrate what is wrong with our funding model when it comes time to do the things that are essential to running a city that's trying to mobilize three million people every day. We need a partner, and that partner has a better source of revenue. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Thompson to speak. Uh, speaker, thank you. Uh, I wasn't going to speak on this, and um, I've decided to speak on this because I have been here um, for some time, and in fact, uh, Many years ago, uh, when we had a mayor, David Miller at the time, uh, I had moved a motion to advance and bring up the, uh, the requirement to bring SmartTrack up as opposed to having it back buried in the sort of Metrolinx's, uh, um, if you will, library of, of not to do now, but to bring it later. And this council, and there are some members of council here who actually voted against it back in the day, but uh, we know that uh, the DRL obviously is now turned into something else, and we are dealing with smart track. I'm a little concerned with respect to the idea that we're going to change the name of something that we have funded as a city, it's a city project, whether or not you like it or not. I mean, there were concerns from people from day one about whether or not this was in fact smart or this was the thing that we should do or allocating $1.4 billion. But we have what we have now with our five station. We're asking that the provincial government come up with the needed funds, which is the uh, $234 million and so on. And of course, as, as the deputy mayor has indicated that there are discussions and negotiations going on now, we should allow that to continue. So to suggest, uh, and, and I have great respect for my learned friend, um, Councillor Perks, but to suggest now that we throw that all away and call it something else, which is the Gold Provincial Projects, et cetera, that the, it, it, if you will, it diminishes the ability for our city and the dollars that we've already spent, and I know we have not spent 1.4 um, you know, billion dollars, it diminished our investment in this. It, may complicate some of the legal ease. I'm not sure, because you didn't have the chance to actually ask questions per se. I don't think that we should proceed with respect to trying to, you know, uh, call it something else that we have paid for and uh, not getting the benefits associated with that. Yes, there are only five where it should have been some 22. We get that, but they are five, and I think that they're ours. We, we have invested in them, and I think that we should, in fact, continue on and we should not support the motion that has been moved by Councillor per Perks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to vote. If you can ring the bells and we can put the motion on the screen. Yes, recorded vote.
Okay, the motion is on the screen. Pardon? Okay, thank you. So the motion is on the screen, recorded vote. Councillor. Councillor Pasternak, please. Councillor Peruzza, your vote, please. Okay, please, we're in the middle of a vote. Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Peruzza, The motion please. does not carry. The vote is 10 to 15. On the item, on favor, recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. The item carries. The vote is 24 to 1. Okay. Members of Council, if Please try to listen because when members of council don't hear what I say, then they complain that they haven't heard me. Okay, so our next item, so everybody knows what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, before we go to the next time item, we will pass Councillor Fletcher. Yes. This is a question you were asking earlier. Yes. So may I have a motion to introduce Bill 246? Councillor Fletcher, would you like to move it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, it's on the screen. Can you read it, please? Oh, that leave be granted to introduce Bill 246. Shall Lee be granted the, uh, to introduce this bill? All in favor, show of hands, opposed if any carried. Shall this bill be declared as a bylaw and be passed subject to section 226.9 of the City of Toronto Act 2006? All in favor, carried. Speaker, just remind people what that was because they're the, the name of the, the item, please. Th this was the bill for the, uh, for the seat being vacant. Declaring the seat vacant. Right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Our next item, which is a timed item, CC 5.3, the Ombudsman Toronto Report. Um, Councillor Bravo, you held the item down. Are there any questions? Uh, going once. Are there any questions? Did everybody hear me? Okay. Put your name on the list. Okay. Councillor Bravo. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I think my first question is to Deputy uh, City Manager Infrastructure, but I'm not sure she's here. Oh, hi, thanks. Um, so this report outlining um, the problems of violent encampment clearings is of huge uh, concern in my community. Uh, Councillor uh, Bravo, just one sec. We have a point of order. Councillor Thompson. Speaker, yes. Speaker, thank you, and uh, I have apologies to Councillor Bravo. Um, Speaker, I'm just wondering the um, ombudsman's here. Yes. I'm wondering if we could give him an opportunity, maybe, to speak about his report um, and then framing it, and then allow us to be able to ask questions. He is here, and that's normally our practice. Okay. Are you are you okay with that, Councillor Bravo? Yes, of course. Thank you. Speaker. Okay. Thanks. So then we'll just re we'll put your you come back, and I'll read. Reset your time. So if we can have the ombudsman to make a brief uh, presentation, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Is this speaker, is this microphone on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, Toronto's experiencing an increase in homelessness and housing precarity. And this has been exasperated by COVID-19 pandemic and the opioid crisis. As a result, we've seen an increase in encampments over the past few years. In the summer of 2021, the city cleared encampments at Trinity Bellwoods, Alexandra, and Lamport Stadium parks. My office received many complaints from the public in response to these clearings. And we heard from service providers who spoke about the impact of the clearings uh, uh, on people living in encampments, members of the public who were upset about the way the city cleared the encampments, members of the public who lived next to parks and did not want them to be encampments, and members of the public who lived near parks that felt that the city should not clear encampments. It was within this context that I launched my investigation. And it's important to note that my, my investigation is not a referendum on whether encampments should exist or whether they are lawful. This falls outside the, the jurisdiction and is a decision for council. My role is to investigate the city's decisions and actions and to make sure that they are fair. In this case, my investigation found that the city's decisions and actions were not. My investigation looked at how the city planned the clearings, engaged with stakeholders, notably those living in encampments, and communicated about the clearings, including with members of the general public, as well as those living in encampments. As you know, uh, while investigating, I found fairness issues that I believe the city should address as soon as possible. And in July of 2022, I released an interim report with early recommendations so that the city could begin addressing those matters right away. I understand that the city has already begun implementing those recommendations and released an update uh, earlier this month. So my office has completed its final report, which I'm, I'm happy to present to you today. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work that many city staff that care for people experiencing homelessness. Encampments and the underlying issues that cause them are complex and they're not going away. Many city staff that we spoke to who responded to encampments acknowledged that this was very challenging and one of the most uh, difficult issues that they had ever worked on. As I said, encampments are not going away. And the real solutions require support from all levels of governments to address. Regardless, the city still has a duty of fairness to its residents, particularly those who are marginal, marginalized or vulnerable. Overall, we found that there was significant unfair, unfairness in the city's planning, engagement and communications about the clearings. Notably, the city chose to clear the encampments quickly at the expense of taking a people-centered approach. This speed impacted everything that followed. It meant that the city was unable to engage meaningfully with those living in encampments. It also contributed to communications problems affecting people living in encampments and with the general public. I have a few specific findings worth mentioning. One has to do with planning. So the city directed the Office of Emergency Management to lead, to lead or coordinate its encampment response. Yet OEM had no previous experience with the city's encampments or, or, had, or had any social services or human services uh, expertise within the unit. The operational plans that were developed lacked mention of mental health supports for people living in encampments and none were provided on the day of the clearings, even though the city knew that many people living in encampments had mental health issues that would benefit from the support. The city did not engage meaningfully with those in, engage, uh, in encamp encampments. As mentioned, this was due in part to speed. It was also because the city did not have an official definition of engagement. As a result, the engagement efforts were inconsistent and often in, in a, in, insufficient. And while the city reported strong engagement numbers, there was no explanation of what it meant by engagement, nor how the activity was carried out in real terms. One staff that we interviewed and was referenced in the report told us that they recorded every interaction with someone living in encampments, even if that person refused to speak with them. 
That's not meaningful engagement. My investigation found that there was little public information available about the encampment clearing process. When the city did communicate to the pub with the public, the information was unclear and lacking in transparency. There was no consistent and dedicated on-site resource during the clearings for people in encampments. And even though the city knew they had questions, uh, they went unanswered. There was also no formal process for managing or tracking encampment-related complaints for the public. It's important to note that the city has and know there's, knows that there is a different approach. My investigation found that the city's actions taken at the Dufferin Grove encampment following these clearings was significantly more fair. It happened over a matter of months as opposed to a couple of days. The city provided crucial supports to those living in encampments, including mental health supports. And it created a consistent and dedicated on-site resource for people in encampments to engage with and have their questions answered, which was much more different than, that, than its previous approach. In response to my findings, I've made 23 recommendations to improve the fairness of the city's response to encampments, including that the city should establish an interdivisional encampment working group to lead the city's encampment response. The city has taken a similar approach to address complex health and safety risks involving vulnerable citizens successfully. The city should prioritize the needs of those living in encampments if it is to determine it is necessary to move them out. The city should create a dedicated, a detailed plan outlining, outlining how it will support access to health and mental health services for those living in encampments. Create a strategy for engaging with people living in encampments, including specific strategies for indigenous communities, as well as racialized and equity deserving groups. And finally, formalize the Dufferin Grove initiative and apply the key learnings to its encampment response moving forward. While my investigation focused on these three clearings, the impact of my recommendations will have a much wider reach, improving the fairness of the city's response to all future encampments. Before I close, I would like to remind the city, <clears throat> I, would, I would like to remind the city that it also ha it has a responsibility to ensure that it is serving and treating all people fairly. The measure of how strong a city is depends on how well it treats its most vulnerable. I commend the city for agreeing to implement my recommendations in this report, and my team and I will are committed to helping the city in any way we can. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Addo. Uh, first questions are from Councillor Bravo. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, Thank you to the Ombudsman for this report and for this presentation. Uh, the issues raised here are of extreme importance and interest to my constituents. Um, so I would like to ask my questions first to the uh, Deputy City Manager Infrastructure. And, um, and in the summer of 2021, we hear in this report there was a directive to act with wartime speed response. Um, the, the Pathways Inside program was discontinued. And the report tells us there was an absence of clear policies uh, to staff around encampment response policies, notice before people's uh, residence, before people's belongings were seized, what enforcement should look like, and how to respond if somebody was already working with a housing worker. Um, those questions from staff went unanswered. I just would like an explanation about why this picture that we're learning uh, in this final report by the Ombudsman. Uh, so through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I'm not sure, Councillor Bravo, that uh, that wholly tells the tale. Uh, in summer of 2021, when the direction was given to clear the final uh, individuals who were encamped in those various parks, was after a year of work in those parks to move people to safer indoor space. Uh, there was clear guidance given in respect to our lawful requirement to provide notice, trespass notice. Those were done. Uh, you know, I think, and uh, with all the respect to the Ombudsman Office, and uh, Mr. Otto knows how much I do respect the work they do, uh, this is one of the most complex situations that city staff have to deal with. Uh, no matter which way it goes, it's, it's, somebody's not going to be content with it. Uh, the staff went through a lot for the last year plus, prior to this, as a result of the pandemic and what that did. 
So depending on who you speak to, I could completely appreciate that there may have been different responses from city staff about their level of understanding of some of these, these particular items. I don't know that that paints the, the full picture of the efforts that were taken to do this in the safest and, and most respectful way. So, but do you agree that the wartime kind of response created the situation that we're here to uh, learn about in terms of the findings of the ombudsman that the, of these violent clearings? So through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, just to be clear, Councillor Bravo, the encampments as they became uh, in the summer, May, spring, late spring of 2020 were significant. So we spent, city staff spent over a year in these various parks, plus many, many other places, during which time we moved over 1,400 people into safer indoor space through shelter and the other hotel programs. Uh, the reference to wartime speed was likely an ill-worded uh, response. There was, however, a direction given that the remaining encampments, some, one of which Alexandra Park caused a closure of programming, uh, there was concern that they would grow again and wanted them directly thank, thank you. addressed. Thank out of time. I'm sorry. sorry. To the city manager, um, in response to the uh, report, just very quickly, um, will the city's encampment response uh, be located uh, away from the Office of Emergency Management with public servants that have the mandate and the expertise um, and, the, and are able to provide the supports to people who are homeless? Uh, through the speaker, yes, the long-term goal of that will be a place where it can be sustained well, and we will use OEM's talent around that table, but it will be located somewhere else in the organization. Thank you, and I just uh, and I'd love an idea of when and and if we'll if the steps will contemplate um, a mandate for that effort, policies and procedures that are in line with um, the housing charter that the city has adopted, and which that therefore. Uh, a, progressively advance uh, or the realization of housing as a human right. Thank you, Councillor. Um, through the chair, the short answer is yes. Uh, the city has accepted all of the recommendations from the report. We will be formalizing an interdivisional encampment working group that consists of representatives from all divisions that touch this work. And of course, a division head will lead this work and it'll be grounded in uh, those approaches with a deep understanding of people uh, experiencing homelessness. Thank you. And my last question is to the city solicitor. Um, after the court ru ruled that um, the Kitchener Waterloo could no longer proceed with an encampment clearing as to do so would violate charter rights, understandably in, in a different set of facts because of the kinds of lands that were being occupied. Um, I assume there's an impact on our policies here at the City of Toronto in relation to encampments. Uh, will you be bringing forward uh, an opinion and, and advice to this council about how that court decision might impact our deliberations? Through you, Madam Speaker, my staff, or ooh, through you, uh, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, uh, my staff and I have reviewed that decision very carefully. We have provided advice to the appropriate city officials. And uh, I will reiterate uh, what, what you had said, actually, that the facts are quite different. But that being said, we have taken it very seriously and we have provided some advice. And I know that it is being taken into consideration with respect to the city's operations. Thank you. Thank you. Next questions are from Councillor Malik. Um, thank you very much. My questions are for the city manager. Um, since 2020, how much has the city of Toronto uh, spent on enforcement activities related to encampments? And that's including, but not limited to uh, what we know, the 2.1 million spent on violent encampment clearance in the summer of 2021 in Lamport, Bellwoods and Alexandra Park, 1 million allocated in 2022 for private security 24-7 patrols of four downtown parks, ongoing eviction orders and enforcement, including recent enforcement actions at Allen Gardens, 2023 budget for the Office of Emergency Management for security and enforcement contracts. So just to recap my question, how much has the City of Toronto spent on enforcement activities related to encampments, um, including but not limited to what I listed? So through the speaker, I, I don't have that, uh, we don't have that, uh, that total. We would have to work offline and provide that uh, after the fact. 
Is that something that can be done or do we need to move a motion on that? Uh, no, uh, we don't need a motion through the speaker. We'll take that away. Uh, we just don't have it to hand at the moment. I can understand. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question um, is in December 2022, uh, the Office of Emergency Management Director told us that the city's current approach to encampments at Allen Gardens and the Church of St. Uh, Stephen in Fields was based on the Dufferin Grove approach. Can you explain exactly how this has been operationalized and what the results have been? Um, is it now the sole model for encampment response being used by city staff? Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it was a little difficult to hear you, Councillor Malik, but I believe what you're asking is, is the approach that was taken with Dufferin Grove, currently the approach that's being it's taken. It's okay. I can, re I, can repeat, I can repeat my question. Is it can in respect to Allen exactly? Gardens and St. Stephen's in the field? Um, can you explain exactly how the Dufferin Grove approach has been operationalized and what the results have been? And is it now the sole model for encampment response being used by the city staff? Uh, so through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, certainly the elements of Dufferin Grove, which have been the elements of all the work done for years by especially our streets to homes teams, uh, engaging with individuals and looking for acceptable and suitable indoor space, uh, as well as what was done in Dufferin Grove, working to prevent the growth of encampments is the process that's currently ongoing and how that's been operationalized. I don't know if there's anything more, Gord. So that is the model that we are, that we are continuing to follow, Councillor Malik. So it is the sole model or is there another model that you're using? Uh, so through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the model has always been about engaging with individuals experiencing homelessness, try to meet their needs with the access to services and shelter that we have available to us. Uh, that has always been the way and will continue to be the way. Okay, so I'm specifically asking about the Dufferin Grove model and I guess to that uh, in the response that I'm hearing is that there is a little bit of uncertainty about whether that is the sole model being used. So my question is what additional resources and staffing would be required to ensure that what we've understood as the Dufferin Grove support model is uh, implemented at all encampments across the city and how quickly could this be done with the appropriate resources? Uh, thanks for the question and through the speaker to you, Councillor Malik. The, uh, you know, the approach at Dufferin Grove really, really centered on, on having available housing and, and shelter resources available in hand and that continues to be the focus of our work at Allen Gardens and, and um, St. Stephen's in the field. Uh, Access to housing, again, is, is one of the, the biggest challenges that we face uh, in, in meeting people's needs who may not uh, want to go into shelter but want to go directly into housing. Our work at, at Allen Gardens has moved 26 people directly into housing. Uh, that number would, be, would likely be higher if we had more access to deeply affordable and supportive housing. And in terms of, of staffing to ensure that this support model was implemented, um, what are the resources that, that um, uh, you might need in order to, to ensure that, um, that, that it's used as quickly as possible in those circumstances? Yes, and through the speaker to you, Councillor Malik, I think as part of the recommendations from the Ombudsman's report, we'll be looking at the staffing resources associated with uh, the services to, to more broadly implement the Dufferin Grove model and, and, and to look at that. So that will be something that uh, we'll take under consideration as one of the recommendations in the report. Th thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, questions? Uh, thank you, yes. Um, I, I think my question is for the, the Ombudsman because I, I, I'm I'm trying to get at the, uh, your observations, perhaps. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the recommendation that talks about, um, it's uh, towards the end of the recommendations, I've flipped pages now so I can't find it, but the one about finding new ways of communicating and flagging for, for an encampment community that you are now organizing to, to clear an encampment, but that they had to find a better strategy and more sort of on the ground way of communicating that. That's one of your recommendations. I'm sure, I'm, I'm wondering how we partner with, with some of the on the ground community to do that. Because I'm sure you noticed in your investigation, the problem that we have 
coming out of the earlier clearings is we now have a, a great deal of tension with some of the, uh, the on the ground uh, community groups that, that might be best placed to help us meet your recommendation, but we don't have that relationship now. Um, did you observe that? And is there, is there a way we can improve on that using the new practices that you, that you, you mentioned at Dufferin Grove and other places? Uh, through, through the speaker. Um, yes, uh, Councillor, um, the, the actions of the, the city um, have harmed the relationships between uh, community organizations. But one of the things that we did um, identify and recommend with our interim report was that when the city was um, updating its uh, encampment protocol, that they initiate consultations with individuals with lived experience in encampments, uh, community organizations to hear their feedback and incorporate that feedback in an updated um, protocol. Um, I'm happy to, s to hear that the city has uh, started this work. Um, they updated uh, the city about the implementation of that specific recommendation. They are holding or will be holding uh, consultations with these groups. And I think it's that type of, of work that will allow um, the, the city and the community organizations to work uh, better and um, have better outcomes for, for individuals that are affected. Right, right. Okay, and then if I could switch to, uh, uh, to staff, I guess what I'm asking is, or those steps, uh, having, a, having a consultation, trying to repair that relationship, are we talking about a couple of exercises, or is repairing that relationship with the on-the-ground advocacy network, is that like an overarching, that's a lens, we're trying to repair that relationship day by day by day by day? so that we can, we, we can, we can then employ them in, in our communication strategy. Uh, through the speaker to you, Councillor, um, you know, th those conversations and exercises continue. So certainly the work on consultation with respect to uh, the future of the interdepartmental protocol and the, the home of the encampment office and the work uh, is at its early stages and, and will unfold over the next several months. Uh, this council has also directed us to establish a variety of different um, working groups uh, related to housing and homelessness that will also uh, be undertaken over the next while and and also we just recently established a shelter and housing um, steering committee with members of the Toronto Alliance to end homelessness in the Toronto right. shelter network so there are there are conversations happening on multiple fronts um, and that work will continue okay I want to thank you for that work Thank you. Councillor Moyes, uh, questions? Thank you, through you, Madam Speaker. Um, I want to preface by saying this is a very complex issue. And I have the largest encampment in the city, in my ward, in Allen Gardens. And I can say to you that, um, I know that is a question period, not, not, <laughs> not speaking, but anyways, I can say to you that, you know, I, we, my office spends more time on this than anything else right now. And I meet with Mr. Tanner and, and, and others uh, regularly. My question to staff, Mr. Tanner, um, the report talks a lot about the encampment people, and it talks about um, some of the um, residents and, and, and their comments around the encampments itself and how they're impacted. But I want to know how is your staff impacted? What is their well-being? How are they coping? Uh, through the speaker to you, Councillor, thank you for the question. Um, I, I believe that it's been mentioned that this is very complex work. Uh, it's done in, in the public sphere. Uh, and it's done, um, you know, with, with, as mentioned, some of the city's most vulnerable individuals. Um, and it's also done in a very political environment where there is a, a spectrum of views with respect to encampments and, and whether um, we should be sanctioning them to whether we should be clearing them. And so the staff that participate in that space uh, receive a lot of firsthand critique, criticism, abuse, and uh, 
and challenging situations. Uh, and, you know, I'm super proud of the work that they do every day uh, and, uh, and their support and focus on, on serving the people that they connect with. Thank you. You know, I, three weeks ago, walked through Allen Gardens with your staff and saw firsthand some of the challenges that uh, they face. Um, and so my question is to the um, ombudsman. Before you wrote your report, did you have the opportunity to go through an encampment to see some of the experiences staff experienced? Uh, through, through you, Madam Speaker, yes, our, our investigators uh, visited a number of encampments. Uh, we spoke to um, over 40 individuals living in encampments to fully understand the situation. Um, but yes, we, we have uh, spent time in encampments. Okay. And I saw that uh, in your report you talked about um, different strategies that the city um, looked at, some successful, some not. But currently, I think they're using the Duffin Grove model. Um, that seemed to have worked best uh, to, to staff. <laughs> I'm trying to gather my thoughts. It's been a long day. Um, how, how is that working for you right now? How is the Duffin Grove model working in Allen Gardens? Have you had success in your strategies going forward? Uh, through the speaker to you, Councillor, um, you know, the staff are, are there every day and they've, they've had some great success in moving to date 26 individuals directly into housing uh, and, you know, number around 83 other individuals into, into shelter directly from that, from that site. So what the report hasn't addressed, because I, I read it on Saturday, it doesn't talk about... Um, the encampment occupant, occupiers who choose not to receive service from you. So what strategies are in place going forward if, if all else fails? You know, it is an ongoing uh, a piece of uh, work to, con to continually connect with people and uh, offer them a range of services. And, and over time, we've seen the um, you know, people change their minds when they see maybe some of their peers start to move into housing and, and leave um, a park, uh, and they may then uh, initiate more engagement with staff and, and, and work to develop a housing plan. That's what we saw at Dufferin Grove. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, questions? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff, um, during this period that the report covers, was there capacity in our shelter system at the City of Toronto? Did we have extra vets? Yes, through the uh, speaker to yourself um, to support what was the Pathways Inside project, uh, we leased um, a hotel on the Esplanade specifically uh, to, um, and in response to some of the feedback that we were getting from uh, community partners around the need for a downtown located extra capacity in our shelter system. So when you engaged uh, people in the parks, uh, was, there, was there an offer or an encouragement for them to go into a shelter? Uh, through the speaker to you, yes. There was. Uh, there's references to mental health treatments, uh, maybe this is to the ombudsman, was the treatment on site in the parks or was this a long-term option for mental health supports? Through you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Councillor, you're talking about uh, the mental health supports at uh, the Dufferin Grove encampment? Uh, yeah, so there's, there's several references to mental health supports. Now, I'd like to know whether that's on site or whether you refer someone to uh, a mental health support network. So through the speaker, my understanding with those particular supports were brought to directly to the encampment residents and worked with uh, individuals on, on site. So if we, bring, uh, if we bring services to the parks, is it more likely or less likely that they're gonna stay if we support them in the park? So the, through, through you, Madam Speaker, the evaluation that was completed on the Dufferin Grove initiative um, highlighted a number of things that made that 
um, approach successful. One was the, the provision of support, health and mental health supports, directly to individuals who are living in encampments. Two, um, staff were given time to uh, build trust and relationships with those individuals, and staff have indicated that that is a key contributor to arriving at better, better outcomes. Three, there was information available on site, which uh, individuals are there to answer questions. So collectively, these, these initiatives uh, help, to, um, uh, help to, to arrive at better outcomes. And these type of um, services weren't specifically um, available at the, the sites that happened, the cleans that happened in the summer. Okay, I, I think I got the gist of it. So my next question is for the city manager. I, I'm, I'm sort of sitting in the, standing in the middle here. I've got one, one group, our, our city staff, who are encouraging people to, to leave the encampments and go into our shelters because there's capacity. And, and I hear about an initiative to provide uh, mental health and other supports on site, which means you have to stay on site uh, to, to get them. Do you see a contradiction here? So through the speaker, uh, no, I don't. And, and just for context, I do have a bit of experience in my past working in this. The reality is that on-site services, it's always about moving to a more permanent location. Uh, there's not a practitioner that would be involved in this, both from our own staff or from agencies that I've ever come across that would say that the right approach is to keep people there. However, sometimes the pathway to that involves a discussion that happens on-site so it, it is about timing and, and speed, and I understand that that's sometimes tough for the public to, uh, to recognize and understand, but I don't see a conflict in this. It's about providing the right supports there so we can start the building and the conversation towards what's next. So I don't know if we have anyone from Parks here. Maybe, no? Uh, well then, um, maybe Ms. Cook can answer. Uh, is it legal to camp in our parks? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, no. The, the parks bylaw prohibits camping in our parks. What's, what are, what's the downside to <laughs> camping in our parks? Uh, they're, they're beautiful parks. I've been to many campgrounds. Some of our, some of our parks are, are nicer than the campgrounds I've been to. What, uh, what's the problem? Through you, Madam Speaker, we'll get you a list of campgrounds, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, <laughs> Uh, city enacted bylaws regarding appropriate conduct and what is permitted or not permitted in parks is in our parks bylaw, and that is the, the one of the mechanisms that we use. It's park camping is prohibited. Is it a safety issue? It's council. I don't. I wasn't here when council enacted that particular provision, but I think the park. The intention of the parks is it's there for everyone's use, uh, not for the purpose of of camping or setting up residence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley, questions? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my questions are for the Ombudsman. Um, my first question I wanted to ask about, um, so your report comes with uh, a number of recommendations, thank you very much, um, that has a deadline of June 2023. Uh, and it does mention that there'll be quarterly uh, follow-ups from you. I'm just, I'm trying to, it's unclear to me the process that exists to meet the deadlines. How do you ensure that the deadlines are met beyond the, the quarterly follow-ups? So through you, Madam Speaker, uh, Councillor, the, uh, the June deadline was to have the city provide us with um, a roadmap of sorts to, to show us how they uh, plan to, to meet our recommendations. And uh, the quarterly updates uh, provided by the city will ensure us that we're um, keeping on track. Once we, re once we finalize our report, that's only part of our job. Um, our role is to make sure that the city has uh, implemented the recommendations that they've agreed to implement, and that's what we'll be doing. We'll be working with the city and providing assistance in any way we can to ensure that those recommendations are implemented. And so that's what we've done with um, all of our investigations and we'll continue to do that uh, in this particular report. Okay, and then, um, so when I read your report and I got to the end of, when I got through it, 
So it see, it looks at the process of evictions and it seems it has a number of recommendations around um, timeliness and transparency of evictions. Um, but it seems to be looking at reforming the process of evictions. Um, there was no evaluation of why the evictions were needed at all. And I was just wondering, was that outside of the year context or parameters or how did that get established? It's through the speaker. Um, as I said in my remarks, Councillor, um, the question of whether or not the city should clear the encampments or whether or not in um, the, the city had the legal right to clear encampments was not part of our, the scope of our investigation. We, we looked at uh, how the city planned the uh, encampments, how they engaged with stakeholders and how they communicated information about the clearings. That, those, that was the, the confines uh, or the scope of our investigation. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and then I guess, uh, is it Mr. Tanner? Um, Mr. Tanner, I'm just trying to understand. So it's been about 20 months, I think, since the Lamport Stadium was cleared. Uh, I think eight months since the Ombudsman's interim report came out with the recs. Uh, we had an Ontario Supreme Court decision uh, that said we couldn't evict people from encampments unless shelter space was available. Um, but I'm still reading about, you know, we're clearing encampments. So is that done based on all of that in these recommendations that when they're an encampment is cleared that there's shelter space available for them? Uh, through the speaker to you, uh, Councillor Ainsley, um, you know, currently uh, our Streets to Homes team hits the road each day with a number of shelter uh, beds in their in their portfolio that they are making and available to people they meet at encampments who want to come indoors um, and and some of the cleanup that's happening is is taking down uh, tents and and other debris left in the park that has been um, you know left there um, I can't speak to whether there are uh, other uh, trespass notices currently in effect maybe we could pass that to Joanna or or Tracy. Okay, and then, sorry, Mr. Tenner, could you also uh, comment on, so I've seen in the media there's been reports um, where encampments or people living in tents in our, wherever, in the public space, that they're being visited by a streets to home worker on, for example, Monday um, to look at their needs, and then the next day, they're being evicted by from somebody from the Office of Emergency Management. There seems to be a bit of a disconnect there. Could you comment on that? Uh, through the speaker to you, Councillor, I mean, the teams are working very closely together in the encampment office and, and the Streets to Homes team uh, to best coordinate the work on the ground. Uh, it can sometimes be, be challenging if there's been a tent or debris left for multiple days. Uh, um, and, and, and might be declared uh, abandoned or discarded. Um, the teams do clean that up uh, fairly uh, regularly just to keep the amount of, of debris and abandoned tents in, in the public space to a minimum. Thank you. That was okay. your last and question. Thank you. Councillor Matlow, questions? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, to, the, uh, to the Deputy City Manager, um, the city, uh, during the encampment clearings, were justifying the, the violent clearings by saying that uh, it was an effort to ensure that people would go to safe indoor uh, spaces. And that was reiterated several times, safe indoor spaces. Um, would you define what a safe indoor space is to you? Through you, Madam Speaker, it was reference to our shelter system run by the excellent staff at SSHA, as well as the hotel programs that we had offered and where, a po where possible housing options that were available. Are, are you convinced that your and the city's definition of a safe indoor space is the same as the very people who you were hoping to enter those spaces? Um, like, for example, are you aware that there are 3 a.m. bed checks where people feel like they're treated like prisoners? So through you, Madam Speaker, uh, 
our Shelter Support Housing Administration Division runs a program that's compl complex and large, but have always done it with people-centered. So do I have faith in the system that our staff run? Yes, I do. Uh, so that's my definition of safe indoor space. Individuals absolutely have their own feeling of their own personal safety and situations will dictate. So it's not for me to tell them what they think. I simply share what I believe we offer, which is safe indoor space and a far cry from some of the conditions that we encountered in uh, the encampments we experienced in the last couple of years. Are you aware that 500 people died in our shelters over the past three years? Through you, Madam Speaker, I don't think I'm best suited to answer that question, Councillor Matlow. Any death is a tragic death, irrespective of whether it occurs in a park, in a home, or in a shelter. Do you believe that the city's definition or opinion of what a safe indoor space is is the same as the advocates for the unhoused, along with people with lived experience? So through you, Madam Speaker, again, I don't think it's appropriate for me to decide what somebody else's definition of something is. All I can do is speak for us and in our respect, the safe indoor space that we offer. Those individuals who feel otherwise are more than entitled to feel otherwise. That's unfortunate, but that's their choice. I don't understand that. How is it that if we declare that they are safe indoor spaces and the city's objective is to uh, convince or in the cases of the encampment clearings, force uh, people out of those spaces to go to so-called safe indoor spaces, would it not be helpful if those people themselves were convinced that, they, that these were in fact safe so that they didn't simply get cleared violently out of our parks and then go to another park or ravine or a laneway or a sidewalk? So to you, Madam Speaker, I would appreciate no characterization about the violence, Councillor Matlow, if you don't mind. Um, what I am speaking to is the program of shelter that this city offers and it is a safe indoor space. It is overseen by council direction and policy and by excellent city staff who dedicate their lives to supporting the most vulnerable. So I will stand and defend my opinion about the shelter system that this city of Toronto operates and makes available. I do also respect people have their personal opinions about how they feel about those places or wherever place they're asked to go and they're totally entitled to that to that feeling. I, I do not believe this city council would abide operating an unsafe operation. Madam Speaker, with all due respect, so I hear an objection to the word violence. I use the word violence to describe the forceful and violent and inhumane encampment clearance. That's uh, my, my uh, the, certainly what I, what I saw. Uh, I believe the ombudsman would concur. I believe that the people in the parks would concur along with their advocates. So are you, are you suggesting on behalf of the city that the city's position is those encampment clearings were not violent? So through you, Madam Speaker, uh, Councillor Matlow, you're totally entitled to your opinion. Uh, I do not connote or denote violence whatsoever. I spent 39 years in public service, protecting and serving the public. People were beaten. Through you, Madam Speaker, we're getting yeah. off track. Counselor, no, that is exactly what the ombudsman no, reported. No, Councillor Matlow, please. And through you, Madam Speaker, city staff have also been assaulted, Councillor Matlow. The whole situation is unfortunate, to object to that and we all, not... we all need to stay okay, focused on you. trying to help those who need the help I'm the done. most. I'm done. Good. Okay. Um... Councillor Perks, questions. Thank you. First to the city solicitor. Earlier you answered some questions from Councillor Bravo about uh, the decision relative to Waterloo. Would you be willing to provide, say, to the next council meeting uh, a legal summary of the issues there and any advice you might have? Certainly. If I'm directed to do so by council, I will do that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure who should answer this question. In response to an earlier question, I... Uh, Ms. Cook said that when the direction came to clear the encampments, I'm trying to understand who gave that direction. Was it the city manager, the senior leadership team? Yes, through you, Madam Speaker, the direction came from our former city manager, Mr. Chris Murray. Okay. Uh, is that direction uh, minuted anywhere? Is it written down? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, no, I don't believe it is, sir. So it was a verbal direction to do it. Were there parameters around it? Through you, Madam Speaker, it was simply that we needed to finish dealing with the encampments that were in the parks. I don't recall if it was specifically minuted. It was a discussion that uh, Mr. Murray had with me. 
Um, is there a way to, to check if there was some written direction laying out go now and clear the encampments uh, and here are the parameters for that. Is there uh, a way so to through find you, it? Sorry, through you, Madam Speaker, the closest to that, to Councillor Perks, would be the operational plan that was developed uh, to, over, to conduct the clearings of the parks, and that was co-signed by myself and the former city manager. And, and is that document publicly available? Uh, the operational plans are not publicly available, Councillor Perks, just for confidentiality purposes. Could they be made available to Council on a confidential basis? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I'd have to discuss that with the City Solicitor, if you don't okay, mind. Okay, thank you. Um, in the Ombudsman's report, and again, I don't know who should answer this, uh, it talks about the decision to bring OEM in uh, and says uh, that he found no evidence uh, to suggest that this level of urgency was needed. Was there evidence provided to the Ombudsman that that level of urgency was needed? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I think unfortunately the reference to the Office of Emergency Management denoted urgency. Uh, the City Manager asked uh, the Office of Emergency Management in their role to coordinate the response of multiple City Divisions on a significant operational plan, uh, and that's why they were brought in for this. Were, were you given evidence that the urgent didn't need to send it there? Uh, or is th paragraph 280 correct? Through, through the speaker. Um, the information that my investigation found uh, is similar to what uh, the DCM has uh, alluded to, was that um, there were several reasons why OEM was brought in. One, um, OEM had experience coordinating multi uh, interdivisional responses to, to city emergencies. Um, the, um, the city manager believed that uh, the response to encampments needed more structure and they believed that uh, drawing down on the incident management experience of uh, OEM would be helpful in this particular situation. And then finally, um, because of the pandemic and the rise in the number of encampments, um, the city manager believed that um, a high level response was uh, required and that uh, the city ma uh, that OEM was the appropriate uh, body to, to deal with it. But you stand by the statement in paragraph 280 that there was no evidence that this level of urgency was needed. Through the speaker, um, most, I would, I would hazard a guess to say that most people's um, relationship with OEM is with major emergencies such as the, uh, the um, I lost my train of thought. That's the, okay. The, the I ice can storm, move on to the ice storm, question. or um, major happenings like the Queen Street fire or Sunrise propane um, incident. Obviously, this was a very serious uh, issue, but I think that's the, the point we were trying okay. to make. Okay, thank you. In paragraph 253, and this would be to Ms. Cook, uh, there's discussion of the Dufferin Grove initiative, which was led by uh, Shelter Support and Housing. Um, my memory is that a number of members of council, including councillors who represented the uh, areas that included the camp, the encampments that were cleared, had asked for uh, a model that put human rights first and uh, didn't involve uh, forceful clearing and publishing of notices and so on. How was the decision made that Dufferin Grove would get this path and that the other encampments would not, even though I know councillors were asking you to use an approach like this in the other encampments. That was your last question. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, yes, Councillor Perks, you absolutely did. Uh, and that's what, in uh, late 2020 and early 2021, when we created the Pathways Inside program, which was about bringing resources into the park, was what we ultimately then did with Dufferin Grove. Uh, as I've indicated previously, with the three parks that are the subject of the Ombudsman's review, we had been working in those parks for a year. Uh, the summer was coming, the direction was given that the parks needed to be returned to the communities, and that's when these clearings occurred. Uh, when we had the opportunity, we saw Dufferin Grove starting to evolve. Uh, it was at four and then 12 tents and started to grow. We had an opportunity to go back and, and to, the, to the roots of how we have been dealing with encampments all these years is bringing resource to individuals and trying to help them into, into better living conditions. So 
Uh, that was the evolution. And yes, you did ask for that. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher, questions? Uh, this is a question to the Ombudsman. Could you just describe for us again what the uh, Dufferin, so-called, you know, we're calling it the Dufferin Grove model, and I know that the then Deputy Mayor was very involved in that, but the actual elements um, comprised that model from start to finish that when you did your investigation, what that was, please. Through the speaker. Um, there were several elements to that, uh, to that approach. One was uh, staff were given significant time to clear the encampment. So months instead of days. So I believe the, the clearings took place from August 2021 to December 2021. Two, um, the staff were given an opportunity with that time to uh, engage meaningfully with uh, individuals living in the encampment. So allowed them time to develop trust and uh, build relationships with those individuals. As I said earlier, staff have indicated that, the, that allowing uh, time to do this is, is really relies in, uh, realizes and in, in better outcomes. Um, the other important thing was that the supports that uh, individuals required, health and mental health supports, were brought directly to the encampment site. And so uh, the city had engaged with uh, a number of uh, service providers to, to provide that service. And um, I think that I can't. I think that's. I okay. think that's about it. Yeah. And I, th I think you referenced that it was um, SSHA that worked alongside this direction. Would you say they were the lead in this? Uh, who was the lead? Uh, through the speaker, my understanding was that this initiative was led uh, by SSHA uh, with the assistance of OEM. So I'll just clarify, uh, do you have, uh, just clarify that with Mr. Tanner or Ms. Cook, that indeed that model was the lead, was SSHA, and folded under that was the OEM, or was it the OEM assisting SSHA? I think that's very important to understand. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, and I know Councillor Fletcher, you always ask, who is the lead? Yes, I do. Uh, truly, in the respect to Dufferin Grove, uh, it was a team. It absolutely was SSHA with the individuals from the encampment office that be, has been created that spent every day on the ground there together. Uh, I went out and spent time with them as well and uh, met a number of, of the uh, encamped individuals. So, I mean, I think it was the best example of a solid team. Uh, Mr. Tanner with SSHA certainly uh, from the community engagement standpoint, uh, I think was, was the lead there and ensuring the housing support. So uh, they so carried I, a lot. I am to... going to go back to sure. that and I'm going to ask the Ombudsman because we've heard it. There's no lead. Was there a lead or not? Through Is the speaker. SSHA the lead there along with the councillor at the time? Through the speaker, um, the, inv the information that we uncovered during the report indicated that SSHA was to use the term the lead, but as I said in my earlier response, with assistance from OEM, yes, uh, the, DC, the DCM has indicated that there were other um, divisions involved and, and that, that's the case. I'm sure Parks was also involved. They had Parks ambassadors, but the lead was those who were dealing with um, SSHA that deal with people who are homeless within shelters. That, I think you're confirming that for me. Through the speaker, our investigation found that Correct. SSHA was the lead. That was the information that was conveyed to us during the investigation. And as well, were there other um, agencies that have a lot of credibility in the community alongside SSHA and the other city partners? Through the speaker, for example, as I mentioned before, um, the men mental health and health support uh, that was services that were provided were provided by um, other organizations that uh, uh, were involved at the, the encampment, and uh, yeah. So I'll just ask Mr. Tanner, who were the on-the-ground organizations that were involved that weren't city staff at Dufferin Grove, please? Uh, through the speaker to you, Councillor, a, a variety of local community and health organizations, Parkdale, Queen West, 
Dixon, Who, sorry, Parkdale. Parkdale, Queen West to Dixon Hall. We had membership from the Toronto Alliance Tent Homelessness. Um, I, I can get you the full list, I'm sorry. So but there were a list of, I'll call them NGOs for another name that weren't city directed, but city partners. Were, uh, were those partners involved, and I want what the Ombudsman has said, that there was sufficient time to develop this model, um, which I would say in the clearance clearings or clearances were those same organizations involved or were they only brought in for the duck and grove model that was your last question uh through the speaker to you councillor and i can give you the full list here afterwards but you know you know i think it's important to understand that the, the work at the three parks in question and in the ombudsman's report work had been underway there for about a year and many community partners were on the ground supporting that work, including the inner city health associates, mental health supports, some of our indigenous outreach agencies. Um, what we did at Dufferin Grove, as we, as we do as city staff, is trying to continuously improve this work. We struck a, a, a committee that oversaw some of the, the work that was happening there with some of those nonprofit organizations that guided the work over the, the many months that we were at Dufferin Grove. Th thank you. Uh, that, that, that steering that, committee that, group was new. That, that was your last question, Councillor Clarkson. Councillor Sachs, questions. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, a question, please, for Mr. Tanner. Uh, I know you were asked about this earlier, but I didn't hear a clear answer. How long will it take for you to know how much more resources you will need to be able to implement these recommendations. We know that the city's finances are in terrible straits. We heard from you at budget that you're stretched um, for time and money and, and staff already. So how much more will it take for you to be able to implement these recommendations and when will you be able to give us a number? Uh, through the speaker to you, Councillor, uh, you know, as city staff, we will be reviewing all of the recommendations from the Ombudsman to, to understand. Um, you know, what the new structure of, of the uh, city staff model will be to support people living in encampments. Um, I think some of the, the more significant costs are with respect to the housing that people require who are currently homeless. And, and you know, those costs fall in line with our asks to other orders of, of, of government to provide the capital and operating costs to build more supportive housing in the city. Right, and exactly given the complete um, zero that we've got from both levels of government to that cost, uh, to that request for funds. So if we are going to accept these recommendations, that means we're accepting obligation to implement these recommendations. And my question is, what would it cost? What, el what more money would you need to be able to do all these things? And when can you give us that number? I know you don't have it today. But how long will it be until you could tell us to implement these recommendations will cost one million or five million or 20 million or 100 million, we don't know. Uh, through the speaker to you, Councillor, I mean, certainly as we undertake our review of the recommendations, uh, we will do a cost analysis of some of the staff structures and that will be part of our report back to the Ombudsman, but also to the 2024 budget process. Um, part of these costs will be driven by the demand of people that we see who experience homelessness in the city, which currently um, you know, I do not have a forecast for you on. Right, so we have no control on the demand, and therefore we have no control on the cost. Is that right? Uh, I, I, I can't tell you what the, the future housing costs or the, the level of homelessness will um, be within the City of Toronto to, uh, to give you a sense of that cost. Okay, so you'll give us the costs in the, in the 2024 budget, is that what I heard? We uh, will through the, through the speaker. Maybe I can uh, support Mr. Tanner here. Thank you. So we're going to do a full review. We've we've accepted the recommendations from the ombudsman. We're going to have um, individuals right across the entire organization look at this piece of work. We're going to be reporting back to the ombudsman, uh, but also preparing a report for the fourth quarter, the fall of 2023, that would inform the, those budget asks for 2024. Okay, thank you very much. Um, question for the city manager, please. 
of do these recommendations in any way adversely affect your ability to keep parks and other public spaces available for general public use? Uh, through the speaker, uh, no. Uh, what this report does is lay out uh, uh, recommendations for us to follow in how uh, we manage uh, the use of our parks uh, for all those involved and how we treat those uh, in encampments uh, with respect as we, uh, as, as we move forward with this. So uh, no, it does not mean that parks will be free of encampments um, you know, immediately or it doesn't mean that we will never see encampments, but it doesn't limit our ability uh, by this report uh, to, to try and make sure that there's a balance of use within our open spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more. Councillor Burnside, questions? Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. Just a couple questions, because I'm a little bit confused by aspect, certain aspects of the report. Um, through you to um, the Deputy City Manager, I believe. Uh, in terms of the parks, uh, in terms of Trinity Bellwoods, and uh, Alexandra Park, and I guess we could say Lamport Stadium. Did you mention that staff uh, outreach and with the encamped folks from staff was from April 2020 to June 2021? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, yes. Once the pandemic struck and many beds were closed, that's when we started seeing the creation of larger scale encampments taking over larger and larger spaces. Uh, I got involved in this file in May of 2020 and we were engaging in the parks from then. With encamped individuals in those parks for, if my math is correct, about 14 months? That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Um, through the speaker to the ombudsman, uh, point, page 62, point 281. Conversely, the more gradual approach employed at the Dufferin Grove Park allowed city staff to take the necessary time to build trust with people. Um, and I believe in one of your answers, you referred to um, that more, the uh, following the Dufferin Grove approach of a more gradual um, build up, if you will. Um, but I believe you said Dufferin Grove went from August of 2021 to December, which is five months. Whereas the other parks, um, Alexandra, uh, Trinity, Bellwoods and Lamport were 14 months. So I'm not sure, I just need some clarification on that. Um, time period because it would seem like it's the opposite. Uh, through the speaker, um, councillor, I was speaking about the actual clearings. So the clearings that took place at uh, Trinity Bellwoods, uh, Lamport Stadium, and uh, Alexander Park took place over a period of one to two days. Um, the clearing at Dufferin Grove took place between August and uh, December of 2021. I'm talking about the actual clearings. I wasn't talking about uh, the engagements. Okay, thank you. Just because when I read this, it says uh, the more gradual approach employed at Dufferin Grove Park allowed city staff to take the necessary time to build trust with people. I'm not sure that two days is building trust with people. So that's why I'm confused about the timing aspect. Through the speaker, that reference to two days is in reference to the clearings that took place at the three major parks. The Dufferin Grove clearings, uh, as we noted on our report, took place over a longer period of time, and that's the reference that I was making. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my only other question, actually, uh, point one, 176 on page 40, uh, and I, I believe uh, I'm quoting an email. Streets to Homes are often asked to, and this is an email from a Streets to Homes uh, staff member. Uh, streets to homes are often asked to blur their mandate and need to be removed from all encampment clearing activity, activity as it hurts our relationship building with clients. And then it went on to talk about data collection as being part of that and uh, being very detrimental. So that's the one quote. And then page 41.178. Uh, we heard from one senior SSHA staff member that for streets to homes and other staff, it is key that the city, quote, separate the enforcement aspect of this work from the social service component of this work, as it is very difficult to be seen as a social worker and enforcer at the same time. Mm -hmm. right, that makes sense to me. Um, but then recommendation five, your recommendation number five, I'm 
page 64, as part of its encampment clearing planning, the city needs to ensure that it works collaboratively with its divisional partners. So given integrity, uh, uh, freedom of uh, access to inter information, I'm not, I'm just confused by that recommendation, how you work collaboratively with one of your main partners uh, in terms of clearing act, clearing planning and clearing activity when they think it's not good for their reputation and the relationship to actually work um, collaboratively on that aspect of the plow. Yeah, that was your last question. Through the speaker, I, I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm clear about your question. Are you saying that asking uh, the city to um, ensure that staff work collaboratively, collaboratively um, contradicts some of the, the, the statements that were in the, uh, the body of the report? Okay, so yeah, maybe so. I'll try to uh, articulate it differently. It seems to me from a couple of different key points senior SSHA staff, as well as on the ground personnel, that there needs to be a clear separation between enforcement activities and work with encamped individuals. Yet recommendation four says the city needs to ensure that it works collaboratively with its divisional partners in terms of clearing planning. I don't see how SSHA from what senior staff and on the ground staff are saying want anything to do with that. That's what I'm trying to I'm trying Okay, to that was your last question. Well, I know, I was just trying to clarify. Yeah, yeah okay. I know. Uh, through the speaker, um, we, we make no finding about um, enforcement action um, or enforcement activity that uh, staff may, may have been involved in. Okay. But what we we're trying to get at by this, this uh, recommendation is really to make sure that the roles and functions of all staff that are responding to encampments is clear. And I think that um, the point that I was making in the report earlier about um, having meaningful and uh, ongoing engagement is meant to lessen role confusion. If, if staff are interacting with encamped individuals on a regular basis, there'll be less opportunity for them to misunderstand or misperceive what their, their, their role should be. And I think that's what I meant by, by that uh, particular uh, comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carroll, before we recess, you wanted to um, release an item uh, that uh, you indicated that it has to be dealt with tonight, a settlement offer. Uh, Councillor Carroll? A, a motion to go with it. It's a, it's a confidential motion. Um, uh, which is adding some terms to the settlement. I'm assuming if, if no one has an interest in, in continuing to hold the, the main item, uh, that they might be uh, uh, willing to adopt the motion tonight. So does the staff have your motion? This is, uh, it's uh, CC 3.29, 3377 Bayview Avenue. CC 5.29, yes, 3577 oh, Bay, uh, Bayview Avenue. So does the staff have that motion? Okay, so can we just put that on the screen, please? Okay, there it is. By Councillor Carroll. Uh, thank you. That, that City Council will amend the recommendations in the confidential attachment one to the report from the City Solicitor in accordance with the confidential attachment to this motion. So it's simply amending, uh, negotiations continued on today. So this is simply amending the settlement offer, but. But uh, if we adopt the item tonight, it uh, locks in and then, and then hopefully as soon as possible makes it possible for the developer to proceed to share details with an, uh, another registered party to the hearing. Okay, thank you. So the, um, the amendments on the screen all in favor, show of hands, opposed if any carried, item as amended all in favor, carried. Uh, before we recess, does anybody have any quick items to release? Okay, Councillor Sachs. Uh Yes, thank you. So, um, a number uh, EX 3.3, I have a very minor amendment to the agreement between the city and the CNE um, to add a reference to our net zero objectives and transform TO. If we could move that now, I understand that there's no objections to it. Um, okay. okay, let me see if the staff has your motion. Does the staff? 
Okay, if we can put the motion on the screen. All right, well, we'll see if it's quick or not. Yeah, it's, well, are you just releasing it, Councillor Sachs? Yeah, she's got a motion there. Okay, because. Okay, it was, okay, there, if it needs discussion, it can wait to tomorrow. If it, okay, so the okay. motion is on the screen. Do, on favor, hold. So it's not a quick item. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, it's Councillor Malik. I'm willing to release my item as well if um, if there's no discussion on it. Which which item is that, Councillor Malik? Um, it's the um, update on Metrolinx's Ontario line construction uh, within the Toronto and East York um, district. Uh, we moved this item to City Council as it gives City staff additional time to work on these reports. And I want to thank staff for all their help moving these items forward before. Um, construction starts in the summer and um, yeah oh, that's, so, that's the urgency of it. Okay so is this TM 1.2 Councillor Malik? That's right yeah. Oh okay uh, Deputy Mayor McKelvey would like to uh, continue holding that item so we'll continue holding the item. Okay, okay then, I'll, then I'll hold the item that's fine I'll continue okay. my hold I was trying to okay, make thank, space. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay that's it for quick that's items. It. So, may, may, I, may I have a motion to introduce the confirmatory bills moved, moved by Councillor Morley. We'll put it on the screen. There it is. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay, there you go. Thank you, Madam Speaker, um, and congratulations on your acknowledgement today. Uh, I move that leave be granted to introduce bills to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion the proceedings of City Council meeting 5 on March 29th, 2023. Thank you. Shall leave be granted to introduce these bills? On favor, show of hands, opposed if any carried. Shall these bills be declared as bylaws and be passed subject to section 226.9 of the City of Toronto Act 2006? On favor, show of hands, opposed if any carried. Thank you. We'll recess to 9.30 tomorrow morning.